Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to How to Train Your Gavin. In today's video, I'm going to be challenging myself to read I can't even lift them up. I, I can't. I can't do it. I will be challenging myself to read every horror story by Junji Ito. This is the first video in my 2023 Vlogs of Halloween event that I do on my channel. I did it last year and it went really well. Essentially, it is just a series of videos that I put out on my channel to get you hyped for the spooky season in the run up to Halloween. Now before I get into reading the Master of Horror for the very first time, you may also notice that I am wearing glasses. You're probably thinking, Gavin, I've never seen you wear glasses before. Well, when I was younger, I had really bad eyesight and about 10 years ago, I had laser eye surgery. So ever since then, taking care of my eyes has been so important to me. And that's where today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com comes in. GlassesUSA.com is one of the biggest eyewear retailers in the United States, but don't worry, they do also ship internationally too. And they have an extensive range of eyewear from Ray-Ban to Gucci to so much more. You will find so many good deals on their website with so many glasses up to 70% off their retail price. Down the description box, you will find an exclusive offer just for you and I will talk more about that in a minute. Looking after my eyes after laser eye surgery has been a huge priority for me for the past decade and looking at computer screens all day because I'm a full-time content creator has not done my eyes any favors. I'm sure you can relate. I'm sure we've all been glued to our computers at some point, our laptop screens, our phones, televisions, you name it, we've been glued to it. When GlassesUSA.com reached out to me, they told me about their extensive range of blue light blocking lenses, which has honestly been such a game changer for me. GlassesUSA.com has also made it so easy for you to be able to pick your glasses from the comfort of your own home. Their website includes an AR virtual try-on, which makes picking from their vast selection so much fun, eliminating the stress of being unsure what to pick because you can see in real time exactly how they will look on you. I was bullied at school for wearing glasses and it made me never want to wear glasses again but then I saw myself in these little bad boys and I thought <laughs> who's laughing now? It has been a couple of weeks now since I have had my blue light blocking glasses and it has helped my eyes dramatically. Working on my computer for as long as I do with my glasses has reduced the headaches I've had and the dryness of my eyes and I feel like I've been able to take less time napping to get rid of the headaches and more time doing my work. I mean naps are still good though now I can take them for fun and not because I'm in pain. So I actually got three frames and I don't need any prescriptions in mine but if you do need a prescription then glassesusa.com have you covered also. So I'm going to show you what I got and the ones I've been wearing the most of, the ones that I never ever take off now, are these Rebel Olsen Black. I just love how sleek they look and they're not distracting at all in fact half the time I forget they're on my face. So these ones are my personal go-to. I also picked the Ototo also in shiny black. Actually I don't know which ones I look better in. <laughs> Let me know down below which ones you prefer. But I do love these two and of course you have so many more variants of frames and colours to pick from. Everything is at your fingertips. And finally I did get some sunglasses too. Honestly I just can't get over how cool I look. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to look away from the viewfinder. I find myself distracting. These are the Rebel Slater Blue and honestly I don't want to take them off now. They're staying on. They are staying on. SunglassesUSA.com are offering an incredible deal for my subscribers with an exclusive discount on top of any coupon code that they have on their website. You can find out Way more about the offer by clicking the link in the description box. It's only available for 24 hours so make sure that you click fast. And a huge thank you again to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring this video. Now back to the Junji Ito reading vlog. I am so excited because yes I have never read Junji Ito before. This will be my very first time and I thought what better to do that than to just read everything that he has to offer in English. And also I'm not including the Cat Diaries or No Longer Human. I do own No Longer Human but I was recommended not to read this as part of this vlog because it's not quite like any of his others plus the original novel is by somebody else so it probably doesn't really fit in with this because I do just want to focus on his horror stories and then potentially rate and rank them all at the end of this video. I've even counted as well because I wanted to check every single short story out in every single collection just to get an idea of what I'm reading. And I do believe there are 111 stories that I will be reading in this. So I might not do a ranking of all the stories at the end of this. I might do that in a separate video, but I will be rating and ranking every single collection. All the ratings will be out of 10 and that will give me a good average. And I think it'll be really fun. I'm probably alone in thinking that. So the Junji Ito books that I'm reading in this video are Black Paradox, Deserter, Dissolving Classroom, Fragments of Horror, Frankenstein, Gio, The Liminal Zone, Love Sickness, Remina, Sensor, Shiver, Smashed, Soichi, Tombs, Tomie, Uzumaki, and Venus in the Blind Spot. Now these are all of the available English published volumes that are out as of August 
14th, 2023. <laughs> there are two more Junji Ito books coming out later this year, which I'm very excited for, but won't be featuring in this video. Now, I had no idea what to start with, and I was researching online, a lot of people were saying, oh, I can start in any order, there is certain ones that are his earlier works, so it might be good to start there, blah, blah, blah. I just wasn't sure. <laughs> so I've done a spin the wheel, and I've included all of the names of the books that I wanna read, on that. So I'm just going to spin the wheel. We're going to pick randomly so that I don't have to pressure myself into just selecting something like that. And I did a similar thing with my 30 Margaret 30 Days video, which was so much fun. So I thought I would just do that again. At least that takes away the stress of having to pick myself. We're going to get into all of the readings. So before we do, actually, please leave this video a like if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't already. Now let's see what this Junji Ito guy is all about. Okay, I have my spin the wheel up. So I'm going to spin the wheel, see what I'm going to read first. I'm hoping that I don't get Uzumaki or Tomie first. I mean, I think Tomie was the first that Junji Ito ever did, so maybe it would be good to start there, but it's huge. It's the biggest one out of all of them. And Uzumaki has been said to be, like, his best work. So I don't really want to start off with his best. I kind of want to start off maybe a bit mid, so that we don't start with Uzumaki and have every other book pale in comparison. I just don't want to read the best one first, essentially. So uh, let's spin the wheel. You know what, I'll shuffle it as well. There we go, and let's spin. Come on, be a good one. Ooh, are oh, you kidding me? Smashed. Yeah, Smashed is what I'm starting with. I do actually have a funny story about Smashed. So I used to work in a bookstore and it was before I ever read manga and I just didn't really think I would be interested and now I'm obsessed with manga. So back then I remember that this was my first ever experience with Junji Ido. Never read it. I was never going to plan on reading Junji Ido. But this book, one of my co-workers put it facing out in the manga section. And I swear, this cover freaked the life out of me. I could not work in the manga section if this was facing out. It was just her face. It was the way she was looking. The thing that's on her head, I have no idea what was going on here. But every single time I saw this book facing out, I would sneakily put its spine on. I wouldn't have it face out. It scared me too much. And every now and then I go back in the manga section, it would be facing out again. And I would just be like, nope, it's it's going spine on. I'm not looking at that face while I'm working a nine hour shift. So it's really funny that this is actually going to be the first Junji Ito story that I will ever read because it was actually my first ever experience seeing a Junji Ito book. So that is actually kind of perfect. It was fate, it was destiny. And now I'm not as scared of the cover anymore. <laughs> Okay, I've read my first ever Junji Ito stories. So mark the occasion, the first ever Junji Ito story I read was Blood Sucking Darkness. My first ever, okay? And it was good. I think the entire collection itself was pretty good too. It didn't blow me away and honestly I wasn't expecting it to. I'm reserving that kind of judgement for other Junji Ito stories. So fortunately, I feel like it's actually been a success to start off with this one. Ash, Ash, hiya, hiya. <laughs> Are you 16 mine? Do you wanna be on the camera? You wanna be on the camera, yes, yes. <laughs> hiya, I know I love you, I love you. Yes, I know I'm gonna film and then we'll play. So there were 13 horror stories in this, and there were a few that I liked. Blood Sucking Darkness, it was good. It was about a girl who had her heart broken and she develops an eating disorder. She meets a guy, well, he's in her class, but she doesn't really know him. And turns out that he has been given his blood to bats or something, and has been given his blood to her while she's been sleeping. And there were some like very scary things that happened in that story itself. Oh, I know, I know. I'm gonna, it'll not take as long, okay? One thing I really love about Junji Ito that actually is quite apparent in this story, once I finished the collection, I realized that it's one of the things I love about his artwork are his faces. I feel like he can make faces so terrifying and probably the most terrifying aspect of this story oh ash you're so distracting oh, 
you see what I've got to put up with. So for instance, when she's looking for the guy's head, oh, I'm actually, I think I'm gonna have nightmares about this tonight, not gonna lie. Did I mention mild spoilers? But this, oh no, that's like so, oh, oh no, oh, that's awful. But I gave this story a six out of 10. I thought it was good, but it didn't exactly blow me away, but it was a good introduction. I gave Ghost of Prime Time a four out of 10. It had a good concept, but I just wasn't really that scared by it or anything. It's about a couple of comedians who, well, whenever they give a performance, their souls kind of tickle the audience until they like laugh so much that it hurts them. And our main character, the story, he doesn't laugh at them because he can see the spirits, he can see the, the souls around him and he always has been able to do that. So these two comedians, I mean, yeah, they do also look pretty scary. I'm not gonna lie, it's like eyes. Like Ginger Ito has a really great way of depicting eyes. So they can be quite freaky, but I just didn't really find it that scary. Even though there were some like really good moments in the story, I just, I wasn't blown away by this one. And then we have Raw, which I think also had a pretty good concept, but I only gave it five out of 10. It follows these two guys who are walking through the woods and out of nowhere, this like flash flood happens. And as they're like trying to like get stuff to help, when they turn around, the flash flood isn't there. And it doesn't even look like one actually happened because the floor isn't wet or anything. So, you know, they are a little bit lost in the woods. They come across this house with a man in it who tells them, yes, there was a flash flood, but this was years and years and years ago. And his wife was among the people who uh, lost their lives in this flash flood and he's been spending 30 years trying to get her to come because this like illusion of this uh, flash flood happens uh, pretty much every day. But there was like this whole forced uh, kind of storyline at the end that ties into family with the main character. And I don't know, I felt like it was unnecessary because it just, I don't think it added anything to it. In fact, it made it more unbelievable, which, you know, I'm suspending my disbelief at the best of times, you know, I have to, because a lot of these stories are so wacky and crazy. So I, I suspend my disbelief, but I think it just, it, it took a little bit away from it. And it wasn't really that scary either, even though it's a bit of a scary concept, I didn't find it that scary. But I gave it five out of 10 because I really liked the whole flash blood aspect of it. So some really strong visuals. And honestly, Junji Ito is a fantastic artist. The lines of this, the, the way it looks like it's actually in motion, just so beautiful. I already feel, even though this book didn't blow me away in general, I feel like Junji Ito is gonna be someone I'm really gonna enjoy. But then Earthbound, oof. So I gave this one 7.5 because I don't think it really scared me, but I love the concept. So essentially there are people who just randomly get frozen in these positions. Like they can still talk, they can still kind of move, but for some reason, just in random spots, these people just kind of stop and they do like a, a random position where it's like do either doing that or, you know, they've got their arms outstretched and you can't really budge them. And if you do budge them, they end up going back to that point. So it was like really bizarre. And I liked the idea of it because we follow this young girl who works for a, a place that tries to help these people. They're called the Earthbound. And there is like this young boy who was like frozen in place at this random sort of spot. And she wants to try and help him, but she can't really. She talks to this guy at work. He's kind of like her boss. I think, I think she calls him chief. He ends up getting frozen in her apartment, even though he wasn't invited and like, she just saw him at her workplace. He's just randomly in her apartment and he's standing like this. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of terrifying. So, you know, time goes on. And as she's talking to this boy who's frozen at the side of a road, it's actually near where his dog was buried, but he confesses that he's the one who killed his dog. So it seems like the people who are earthbound are there because they have a guilty conscience and they're frozen in that spot because of that. So her boss, the chief, why is he in her apartment? She reveals that she was assaulted months and months and months ago and they never caught who did it. It was not a different apartment apparently. A little bit of it's left to your imagination because there also seems to have been potentially a murder that happened around here too. They didn't catch who did it. So it could have been her boss. But yeah, that's kind of scary. So I really enjoyed that one. Then we have Death Row Doorbell, and this one did creep me out. Like, it felt a little bit repetitive by the end of it that 
I, I wasn't exactly bored by it, but I mean, I still gave it a 7 out of 10. I still thought it was great. So this one follows a brother and a sister, and they were part of an accident. I think it was about a year before or something like that, where they lost their dad and their younger brother, and their mother is still alive, but she has been bedbound since. And they keep getting a phone call off the person who committed the crime. And even though he's in jail, he seems to be appearing at their house and oh it's again like, it's the faces i got chills oh my god i just got shivers like now i'm looking around my house right now the kitchen door is open and i can see the back door and i can just picture one of junji ito's people there like, i can i can picture him there i can picture him like he, he's freaking me out he, mm, the fact that he's just standing there i'm just uh but he's in jail like he's not even supposed to be there so like how is he there you know what i mean so i did find that really really creepy and he keeps saying please forgive me please forgive me and every time they're like no no and they're like trying to get him away but it just keeps happening and happening and happening it just doesn't stop coming and it is very unnerving i mean there is a little bit of a nice end to this short story too so yeah, it was, it was good, but I think there was probably a lot better Junji Ito stories out there, so I think a 7 is pretty good. And then I think one of my favourite ones from this collection is the next one, which is The Mystery of the Haunted House. I gave this one an 8 out of 10. I love the idea of haunted houses, and I love Junji Ito's take on it in this. So there is this weird guy, again, who has come to town, and he has brought with him a haunted house. And these two young boys here, they want to also experience this haunted house so they try and break in at night but the guy who owns it he is there and he lets them he lets them go inside and oh god and it's very gnarly even though i think at this point i was just like all right it's just a haunted house like it's not too bad even though there are like real people who seemingly don't want to do what they're being forced to do it's actually when we see the main guy the one who owns the haunted house we see him with like nails but also when we meet his son Oh my god, it's face again, it's the eyes, it's the eyes, it's this, oh, this ugly little bastard. God, I shouldn't have said that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be so paranoid, I don't think I'm gonna get to sleep tonight to be honest. Oh no, I'm gonna be dreaming of this little shit, oh no. But you know what, actually, I don't even think he's the scariest part of this, I actually think it's the woman at the end. She's like so tall and having these monsters or people who are elongated or are just like too humanly tall, that really creeps me out. But also like her face is again like terrifying, like just talking about, mm -hmm. I'm scared Ash, can you come back? Can you come back please? Oh I've got both my babies. Do you want to see Tobu as well? Tobu's lying on, where are you Tobu? Hey Tobu, hey Tobu you're so beautiful. And then Ash is just lying there. Oh, me babies, they're so good. I'm gonna sit down here with them tonight, I think. The next one is The Mystery of the Haunted House, Soichi's version. So it's about the same haunted house, the same person, not the same main character boy, but the same main character guy, who I think is Soichi, if I'm looking at it correctly. I think these two do connect, as well as the following one after that. But this one follows a girl who has been looking for the Suji family for about 10 years. And she actually used to be friends with the family who well, half of them seem trapped in the haunted house and the other one is running it. So this one wasn't actually as interesting, so I gave this one a 6 out of 10. Even though it had, again, great visuals, this was predominantly about her trying to find the haunted house. She comes across it. Again, we have the disgusting child. But then, oh god, that woman comes back, I swear. I think she's the thing that freaks me out the most. I think out of everything, she scares me the most. Like, look at her. <laughs> Look at her, look how tall she is. <laughs> I could just, I could just imagine her walking in through that bloody door and being like too tall so she has to like crouch down. And then, have you ever seen, what's it called again? It follows when it's just like a random moment, but there's like this really tall guy who's like walking through a door frame or something. Oh God, that just freaks me out. No, oh, now I'm scaring myself. Incredible visuals again. And it goes to Soichi, the um the guy who owns the Haunted Mansion as a kid at the very end, which is a really nice segue into the next story, which is Soichi's beloved pet. Kind of goes through his like, well, a moment in time of his childhood where his sister finds a cat and it's a beautiful cat as well. And Soichi wants to curse his family. He's a rotten little thing. He is evil. And who puts nails in their mouth? 
Like seriously, that is so unhygienic. But yeah, he kind of terrorizes this cat until it becomes evil like him. It's a fine story. I didn't think I was that taken with it, to be honest. Parts of it were a little bit gross and it actually like made me chuckle a little bit more than actually had me feeling scared, especially at the end with how Switchy turns out and this whole thing gets wrapped up. It's kind of a little bit funny. And then we get into In Mirror Valley, which I, again, wasn't really that taken by. I gave this one a four out of 10. It was very Romeo and Juliet, actually. I like the concept of it being about two rival villages. And I mean, we firstly have a, I think just three guys. They come across the abandoned village. There are two that are opposite each other and there's a, a valley between them. And these three guys, they come across this place and nobody knows where they went, but there are mirrors everywhere. So one of them gets a mirror and shines it. And yeah, it's just, it, you kind of get like transported into the past a little bit. It's a bit like a flashback about a guy and a girl, both on opposing villages falling in love. And they do become this like weird, massive, almost fornicating spirits between these two villages that hate each other and the power of hate that each other has and staring at one another. It's like a lot of like staring and it, it was a little bit harder for me to really fall into because it, it just, it, it was a little bit odd. Eyes full of hatred, it, it just didn't really scare me. It didn't, but I still cannot fault how absolutely stunning Junji Ito has designed it. And then we have I Don't Want To Be A Ghost, which I think is maybe a little bit more tragic than it is scary. I mean, we have this guy, it's almost a little bit like The Vanishing Hitchhiker, a little bit like that urban legend, where we have a guy, he discovers this random woman in the middle of the road, in what appears to be the middle of the forest, and he takes her to a hospital. She ends up coming back into his life, even though he is married and he has a child on the way, but he starts to have an affair with her. She's a lot weirder than uh, he anticipated. Oh God, it's the craziness that's in her face. The eyes again, the openness of the eyes, they look like they don't even have eyelids in the teeth. I mean, she just looks like a normal person there, really. But with the shadows and the, the lines, Junji Ido has just made her look absolutely demonic. And yeah, she eats souls and spirits. I gave I Don't Want to Be a Ghost a five out of 10. I thought it was a bit better than the previous story. It's it's a goodish story. Okay, no, it's, a, it's an okay story. And then we get into Library Vision, which for the majority of it, I thought I would give it a better rating than I did, but I ended up giving this one five out of 10. I mean, I love the idea of a library. And I mean, the library in this is huge, massive, amazing. And it does play on that. Um, well, almost like what I've realized with Junji Ito is sometimes he takes a sort of mundane fear, like a fear in something that you might've thought of once, and you just didn't really re-explore that idea because it's kind of unfathomable for it to happen. But this guy here who owns this library, it's in his home by the way, and he lives with his wife and he just wants to consume absolutely everything, all of the books, and he becomes crazy with it. Random things happen with his mum, his dad, which was quite frightening, but he does have this obsession of memorizing every single book in this library, which kind of is a nightmare I've had before. I'm pretty sure I've had a nightmare where I wasn't allowed to live unless I read every single book that I owned in my library. And that is a really scary thought because I have too many books in my library. I totally understand consumerism, it's bad. I have a large DBR, but you know, that thought has crossed my mind before. So this did play into one of my fears and there are some, again, scary visuals. But I think overall, it just wasn't a one for me. But I still gave it a five out of 10 because I do appreciate the library. <laughs> Then we have Splendid Shadow Song, which was another one that played into another mundane fear of mine, where, you know when you get a song stuck in your head and you are worried that'll be stuck in your head forever? Like, I get that. Even to this day, actually, there are certain specific things that I do, and if I do it, a song will just automatically play in my head. And this really plays on that fear to a T. So there is this young woman, she passes another woman who is singing in the streets and she's singing this I hate you I hate you damn you you're so stubborn hanging on like she's singing this well, god awful song really 
Um, but this young girl, she goes home and the song starts playing in her head and she can't get it out of her head. It's all she can think about. It keeps her up at night. She can't do anything. And that does, again, terrify me actually because it's very easy for a song to get stuck in your head. But like when you think about it, it, it doesn't sound scary in general, but it is when you think about like what that would do to your brain, what that would do to your psyche. If you can't get rid of it, like what do you do? So that's kind of essentially what this story is about. She tries to seek help for it. And also actually the cover image too is the girl who was singing the song in the first place. She is the one who has been scaring me since I laid eyes on this book for the very first time. It was a really good flashback. There was a really good ending to it too. It almost feels quite poignant because it almost feels like a circle in the idea of repetition, which is, you know, a huge theme of that story. So this story, I ended up giving a 6.5 out of 10. So then finally we get to Smashed, which is the last story in here. And that's what the entire collection is named after. I give this one an eight out of 10. I think it's joined top for me. I don't know if I prefer this one or the Haunted House one, but I think both of them were pretty excellent. So we have this guy who brings this nectar back from his travels to South America. And it came with some instructions too. The, the tribe that gave him it said, you have to try not to be noticed when you eat this nectar. So the guy at the store, he shows his friend and his friend tastes this nectar. But whenever you have it, everything else that you eat afterwards just doesn't taste as good. Like it never tastes good. Nothing will ever taste good to you again. This nectar will pretty much be the only thing that you can consume and enjoy. But then the guy who brought the nectar home gets smashed and they have no idea like what the hell happened. He's just like up against the wall, there's blood everywhere. He's being flattened. And the other people in this group have already tasted the nectar too. And I mean, they're confused at first and they continue to have the nectar and yeah, they just kind of start to, well, pretty much die one by one. I think it's such a good story. Very terrifying and gruesome. Probably the goriest one of this story, would I say? It? Yeah, I think maybe the goriest one of this collection. It was just so interesting. Loved the idea of it. Really enjoyed the ending too. We have this almost like a, a Lovecraftian sci-fi kind of looking tree. So I, I just really enjoyed it. I thought it was so good. So I'm really happy to have given it an 8 out of 10. So with all of those short stories averaged up, it does give the Smashed Collection a 5.85 out of 10. And I think 5.85, nearly a 6 out of 10, is a really good start for this vlog. I think it's a really good starting point. And it's given me just a little taste of what Ginger Edo can actually deliver. And it makes me so excited to read some more. And overall, it was a good collection. It didn't blow me away, but I still enjoyed it. So I do have the spinner on my phone. I'm going to spin it and find out what the next Ginger Edo book I will be reading is. Ooh, 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 that was so close. So close to being Uzumaki, but it is actually Gaio. I'm really glad it was Gaio and not Uzumaki because I just think it would be too early to read it. And I believe Gaio is not a short story collection, but one full length manga. So really excited to read. So I actually did get quite a bit of Gyo read last night, but I had to stop. Even though I feel like I could have finished it, I had to stop, not, uh, let me explain everything. And actually, firstly, there are two more bonus stories in this. One called The Sad Tale of the Principal Post and the other is The Enigma of Omegara Fault. And I didn't read those because both of them are also included in the Venus in the Blind Spot collection. So I'm just gonna count them towards Venus in the Blind Spot. So when I get to that one, that's when I'll read those stories. Honestly, I do apologize for any mispronunciations. I think it's Gil. Someone online, the Omnibus Collector is saying Gil. That's how I'll pronounce it. So after reading this one, I feel like I am definitely starting to understand the Junji Ito horror sense. So I wasn't wholly scared by this, but it did get under my skin a few times. And I do feel like a lot of it is quite gross and disgusting. And I don't think any of these characters have really stood out, but I feel like they've been so, well, especially the main character in this, he is like, almost like a blank slate that I can project myself into as a main character. And I felt myself being the one who was experiencing all of this. In fact, the characters felt like tools for me as a reader to experience the story itself. So we do follow Tadashi and he is the male main character. 
and Kiori, I think, uh, is how you pronounce the main female character. And I loved, 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 loved the start of this story with it being set underwater because it just added this really submersive and very isolating atmosphere. And I'm kind of scared of the deep ocean. You're going to find so many of my fears throughout this vlog. <laughs> I'm kind of scared of the deep ocean and also the fact that Jaws is one of my most scariest films ever. And when I was a kid, I watched it too young and I was up for months with nightmares. So I had this profound fear of sharks and it definitely comes back to haunt me in this. But yeah, we do have that start of this and I just loved how this story first unfolded. So Kiori, she annoyed the hell out of me, I'm not gonna lie. Every other thing she muttered in this or shouted was, I can smell it, I can smell it, it smells bad, get rid of it. It smells, it smells, I'm just, I know she has a sensitive nose and I know that sometimes her ability to be able to smell comes in handy a couple of times, but oh my God, oh my God. Like she just wouldn't shut the fuck up. <laughs> for half of this, she wouldn't shut the fuck up. So I did find her really annoying, but I was kind of rooting for the main guy character, I thought, he, I, I guess I felt bad for him mostly than actually found any likability in him. Just because I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but so far with Junji Ito's stories, it has mainly been the plot or the horror that kind of propels the story forward and not so much the characters, which isn't a bad thing at all because it allows me to really get a sense of the horror that's unfolding. And while I didn't think I was wholly terrified by this, I will say though the shark stuff definitely did. It was still very unsettling because of Junji Ito's art style. So the main story of this is the fact that we have these fish or any kind of sea life creature coming out from the ocean and they have these mechanical legs and they can scurry around like they can actually walk on land and I love the idea of that because I have thought in the past when I was scared of Jaws and I was up all night scared of Jaws I would be like oh but Jaws can't reach me here because I'm on land but this story kind of just blows that out of the water essentially because the shark can come out of the water yeah there is like this really scary part where there is actually a shark just in the distance and everyone gets out of the water and they're like, oh, we made it, we made it. But then the shark just comes full force towards the, the beach and you see the massive legs and it just comes onto the beach. And I feel like this might, no, actually this wasn't when I stopped. I stopped when the shark actually started chasing our main characters. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I have to finish it off this morning. But the idea of all of these fish with the mechanical legs coming out on land, it was very weird. It was just a very, very weird book. And I think I would probably give it a higher rating than I'm going to give it now. If it wasn't really for like some of the later stuff that happens in this, I think it kind of lost me a little bit with the circus part. I think that was when I started to be like, maybe we could have ended it a little bit earlier than this. I just wasn't taken by the circus part. And there is a whole lot of ways of trying to explain what happened. We meet the main character's uncle and there are some things about how there is this gas that is making the legs move. So even though the fish are dead and they are rotting and the smell is awful, the gas that's within them or within these legs too is what's like propelling them forward. But there's a whole lot more to it than that. And it does get so freaking odd a bit later on too, when it kind of starts to take people you know, like these mechanical leg things, they can sort of latch on and these tube things go into the mouth and the anus, which is just so, oh, it's so bizarre, it really is. But I found myself really enjoying my time reading it. The intrigue was extremely high. I wanna see if I can get, oh God. Uh, I wanna see if I can get a good image up of what I kind of mean, like sort of like this, like this is so, messed up. This is why I feel like this is such a bizarre concept that you can't help but feel like it's just all messed up. And like, who thinks of this? <laughs> who thinks of this? I mean, even though I said, oh, I once had like nightmares about Jaws getting me on land. So I'm sure people have also had the kind of fear of something that shouldn't be able to walk being able to walk and they can actually get you. It's almost like, you know, being in the bathtub and thinking that a shark is somehow gonna be in the bathtub with you. That's happened to me a few times before. 
I mean, not the shock, but me thinking of that. So I was just so enthralled and intrigued by it all. I really love this spread too. I think every now and then I will show you like my favorite spreads from these books because I don't think I have too much else to say about this other than I just freaking really enjoyed it. I'm just like, how in the world did Junji Ito even draw this? You know, I'm looking at how intricate it looks and it just, it, it blows me away, honestly. So I'm gonna give this one an eight out of 10. I think had it been a little bit shorter and it didn't go into the whole like circus aspect of it in the latter half of this book, then it probably would have been like an 8.5 or a nine, but I think it did lose me a little bit by the end of it, but it was still so super freaking enjoyable nonetheless. So I wanna shuffle now, I wanna say what the next Junji Ito story is gonna be. I'm so freaking excited. I do kind of fancy another collection now, maybe one of the more sci-fi looking ones like Remina or even, uh, I don't know if it's sci-fi exactly, but Black Paradox looks a little bit sci-fi-esque just from the look of it, so I don't know if that's the thing. So yeah, I think either Remina or Black Paradox is kind of what I'm looking forward to right now. I'll probably get neither of them, so let's just see. Oh! Oh my god, Venus of the Blind Spot! I literally just mentioned this because the two stories from the end of Gio are in this, so I will end up reading them straight away anyway. Yeah, the Enigma of Amagara Fault and the Sad Tale of the Principal Post are both in this, so I'm gonna end up just reading them anyway now, so... <laughs> Let's do it. I feel like I've uh, found myself a couple of new favourite stories. I will also say though that I think this was, you know, hit on this. And there were a few of my least favourite stories in here. But I will say this started off so strong. And there was another fantastic story. And it turns out to be the one that was also featured in Gyo. But after averaging out all of the ratings I gave the short stories, Venus in the Blind Spot got a 5.55 out of 10. Again, like not exactly incredible. But there were definitely two in here that I think are probably my favourites now. And there was another one that I think is up there too. So let's go through the stories. The first one, Billions Alone. I mean, firstly, I love the fact that we started off in colour. This one, it kind of gave me a little bit of Jeepers Creepers vibes. If you've seen the film, it's like one of those films that really terrified me when I first watched it. But yeah, this guy is walking his dog and he comes across these bodies in the river and they've been stitched together. And it's so horrific. So, so horrific. And nobody knows how the bodies got there or anything. And then our main character, I think he's called Michio. But I probably said that so wrong. Again, I apologize for any mispronunciations. But he is a bit of a recluse. He's a bit of a loner. And he ends up getting invited to a little gathering with some past high school friends. Where again, there are more bodies found. And this, again, it's just like, what is going on? Because these are so disgusting. And just traumatizing as well. If you saw this just like out and about. And there are also these like flyer things that fall down from the sky too. They like, come together, everyone come together. I think it is based off of a song. Come together right now. But I might be totally making that up. <laughs> I don't know the rest of the words of that. But yeah, these stitched up bodies just keep appearing. And it seems like anyone who's out in groups just like, or even if there's only two people too, they just seemingly disappear and vanish without a trace and then turn up stitched together. It's so odd. Like this one too, where there are like Christmas trees and this entire square is littered with stitched together bodies. It's honestly horrifying. One thing I will say is that the main character is a little bit dumb. <laughs> so like he's seeing all of this happen and he's scared about it. And you know, it's even on the news too about the whole group thing. And even he on the phone to his friend, he says, there's a rumor that whoever's behind all these disappearances and murders lately is targeted groups. So it might be dangerous to have a reunion. I mean, that's a fair point. If people are mysteriously vanishing and dying, after, you know, forming a group or like meeting with a group, then that's understandable. But his friend says, look, I really want to have this reunion also as a memorial for such and such now that he's gone. I want you to come too. And he says, all right, I guess makes sense. Just like, are you actually serious? So anyway, yeah, there is a, a big reunion, a big party, even after all of this whole thing happens and all the people disappear. And again, they come back 
stitched together. It's so odd. It's disgusting. I don't think I quite get the ending of it. I don't I don't know if I fully understand. It seems like whoever is doing the whole flyers thing and they're all falling down, they seem to be kind of brainwashing or manipulating or having the ability to be able to manipulate the people on the ground that anybody can just like stitch somebody up. But I still don't understand like how, like say the massive group of people at the reunion, how did they just randomly disappear if it is just them being brainwashed into stitching the other stuff? I just don't understand how they can just like disappear like that if it wasn't like some other supernatural thing. But you know, it is what it is. I like the ending, I thought that was pretty good. And I gave this one an 8.5. I definitely think like until a, a later story, this was my favorite one so far just because of how absolutely creeped out I was by the stitching up of the bodies. So then we get into The Human Chair, original story by Itagawa Rampo. And this one, I actually gave a little bit of a lower rating to begin with. And then when I finished the collection, I went back and I thought, you know what, actually, I'll give that a bit higher. So I've given it a seven out of 10. There is a, a young girl, she's a writer, and she goes to this like furniture store place where it seems like this guy, like just this one guy works. And she felt the need to ask about getting the chair because you know, she's gonna be sitting in all the time. She's a writer, she needs to. So he ends up showing her this, this chair here and tells her a story about a writer years and years and years ago who had a chair just like it. And the story was of a furniture maker who was carried away by a violent passion. He hid himself inside a chair he had built and gave himself over to the pleasures of his perversion. So here you can see that this guy has like been able to fit himself into a chair. And honestly, it just creeped me out a little bit because I mean, I'm sitting on a chair right now. Maybe there is somebody in this right now. I mean, look, if there is, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little bit desperate right now, so we might as well make yourself known. I'm kidding. But yeah, the flashback shows, like, the writer, and she is paranoid about this chair, and her husband doesn't quite believe her until one night he sits in it and he gets stabbed from the inside of the chair. And when the police check it out, there is literally a kind of man-made place where um, a man can sit inside it. Like, there's even little compartments here too with like food and drink and a knife and like that is uh, you know what the more i talk about it the more i kind of want to bump the rating up but at the same time as well like the concept and everything amazing and very scary i feel like a lot of it wasn't as impactful so i think seven is a pretty decent rating but then the ending of it as well when we go back to the writer in the present day and the young guy who tells her the story who is making the chairs and he shows her that what is inside the chair that's in the store actually does have the dead bodies of the writer from the first story and the man who hid in the chair. And that is honestly so messed up. But also the fact that that guy as well, he's like, well, I kind of have a thing for you. I'd love to make you a chair. So I really, really enjoy that story. So yeah, seven out of 10. And then we get to An Unearthly Love, which I gave a five out of 10, I think mid. So we have this man here and he is a little bit spacey and he has a wife and he, you know, he tells her that he loves her and he calls her darling and stuff. But a lot of the times, yeah, he just like kind of loses focus almost. He just like gazes off for no apparent reason, which I found so odd. And he ends up going into the storehouse that is at the house and he doesn't let his wife go up into the attic and he doesn't tell her why. And he's usually in there quite a lot and she can hear him talking to someone, she just doesn't know who it is. And she ends up thinking that he is having an affair because she hears voices saying, we keep meeting like this, I feel bad for your wife, I feel the same myself. I keep trying to love Kyoko, but it's just hopeless. So the wife, when he's not there, goes into the upstairs part of this storeroom, but there's like nobody there, she can't see anyone. Even when she goes in right after he's been inside and he leaves, on his own, she goes in and there's like no one there. And then she does discover this doll thing that's in a chest. So she opens it up and she realizes that maybe he has been having a bit of a relationship with this lifeless doll. <laughs> and it's a bit creepy when she watches him and what he does to this doll thing. It is really, really weird. One day when he goes back inside, the doll is, torn apart. It's not exactly specifically stated that the wife did it, but I mean, I'm assuming that it was. And when the guy says that, he ends up taking his own life. And it is 
an odd story yet again. Like, it is odd. I did like it. It didn't really make me go, wow, wow. And then we get into Venus in the Blind Spot. Now, I didn't like this one. I gave this one a 3 out of 10. I just thought this one didn't do anything, really. You have this idea that there are these, like, UFOs, potentially, and maybe alien abductions, and we follow this uh, young girl. She's called Mariko, Mariko. And she has, like, this, like, little UFO club thing. But when she approaches the guys in this club, she disappears when she gets close enough to them. But then she does reappear when she moves away. And she doesn't realise that's happening. Whereas they do. And they're like, wait, what's going on? Like, why is she disappearing when she comes close to us? But it really just turns out to be her dad is implanting things in their brain. That makes it when Mariko approaches any of the guys, they won't be able to see her. As a sort of overprotectiveness thing, he doesn't want any guy to get close to his daughter. Like, that's what it turns out to be. And that just, it didn't scare me. It didn't really do anything for me. I thought maybe we would have some kind of like UFO alien thing, especially when one of them thinks that he was abducted by aliens, but it just turns out to all be her dad. I mean, I love the infusion of color randomly. I just think that was so beautiful. <sighs> yeah, and even just going through the end bit as well, it seems a little bit random. Not my least favorite of this collection. I thought we were on like a really good start with Venus in the Blind Spot, the collection itself, but then Venus in the Blind Spot itself kind of dragged it right down. I don't know if that's controversial or not. I don't know if this is like a well-loved story, so I apologize. It just wasn't for me. And then we get into The Licking Woman. And again, this is like another really bizarre one when you think about the concept. I ended up giving this one a four out of 10. It wasn't bad by any means. And again, I love the fact that it started off in color. But yeah, there is this random woman who licks people. And when that happens, they do get infected if they don't wash it off straight away and die. So yeah, I mean, that is a really terrifying visual. To be fair, like, if that approached me in the alley, I would be absolutely scared. I, I don't know, like, I do like when Junji Ito has a really random, weird idea. I feel like a lot of Gyo was random and strange, but I think this was, like, this story itself was maybe just too farcical for me to really feel the fear. It ended up coming across as maybe a little bit sillier than I would have liked. I don't think I have too much more to say about it. It just, I kind of like the ending with the main girl in this kind of coming across her. She almost herself becomes the licking woman with this absolutely disgusting visual. It didn't put me off my food though, fortunately. <laughs> I did order in, but yeah, it was just disgusting. Like a lot of it was disgusting, but not really my cup of tea. Then we get to Master Umez and Me, which I think is more autobiographical. And it just goes through Junji Ito and his adoration for a mangaka called Kazu Umez. You know what, a lot of this I did appreciate because there were references to like The Drifting Classroom, which I haven't read yet, but also Orochi, which I have read the first volume of actually. And I liked it, I liked it a lot. And I can't wait to read more of it. So I love the fact that it was even mentioned. But yeah, this was just about Junji Ito. Just, I guess, praising his favourite mangaka. I would be surprised if Kazu Umez was not Junji Ito's main source of inspiration. Just because of like how fangirly this whole story came across as. So it feels almost unfair to rate this with the other ones because of its really different kind of nature. Because it really just isn't supposed to be scary. It's a novel that I don't think I could include with his other horror stories, but if I was, it would be a two out of 10. So because of that, yeah, I will be giving it a two. It is still part of this collection. So unfortunately it's going down. It is my least favorite story. And then we get into How Love Came to Professor Karida. Based on the story, How Love Come to Professor Goldia by Robert Hitchens. So this one was pretty all right. Again, I love the visuals. I love the idea of Christianity being a part of this. I gave this one a five out of 10. Essentially there is this professor or like a scholar of Japanese literature and there is a young woman who looks up to him. She absolutely adores him. And every time she gives him her work, he kind of just brushes it aside. He doesn't seem to like her at all. 
and she gets very upset about that. There is another guy here, Father Murchison, who I believe is a Christian priest, and he tells this young woman to love him from the bottom of her heart, and he might see the beauty of your work. And after the father tells her to do that, she seemingly tries to take her own life. She's in a coma, so she's not dead. Uh, but this volume has been very heavy on that kind of subject matter. And when that happens, he, the professor, is seemingly haunted by someone and he can't seem to shake whatever or whoever it is. And we find out that the priest person also rejected a young woman, which reminds him of what's happening right now with the professor. And there is a, this whole spirit that is terrorizing him. The eyes are drawn so well. Her face is so scary looking too. The way she's screaming. But I did like how the end of the uh, the story kind of tied back into the father, the, the priest. But that one was really like neither here nor there. The one that actually I ended up loving is called The Enigma of Amagora Fault. I ended up giving a 9.5 out of 10. I feel like I could end up giving this a 10 once I've read all of Junji Ito and I know exactly what my favourite ones are. But this one just scared me. It did. It, even though nothing too outwardly terrifying happens, there is this sort of earthquake that happens and a lot of like rock falls from these mountains. And in these mountains, there are these human shaped holes. And these human shaped holes kind of belong to someone, as in they are specifically designed for specific people. So there are some people who come to this place and they're like, that hole is mine, like I need to go inside it. It's almost like this hole has been calling to them. And I was honestly mortified by it because I get really bad claustrophobia at the best of times. And that's another fear to take off the fear bingo board that's coming out in this video. But yeah, people just start to walk into it and they do fit perfectly into this hole. But then you read on, like I, I don't know if maybe why I'm not giving it a 10 right now is because I think it would have been a lot more impactful had we just never discovered what happens to them at the end or like where it leads. Because, you know, more people go in, it is absolutely terrifying and claustrophobic. It gets to the point where they can't actually move. And in fact, the holes change shape too, so that your body then ends up getting contorted and pretty much mutilated through this. I do love the random colour panel too. I love when this volume does that. It just brings it to life even more. But yeah, you do see at the very end, like, oh, there's the other side kind of thing. And there are these like sort of weirdly shaped cracks that don't look human shaped. However, when you look inside, there's the person. I, I see something, it's slowly coming this way. So like that is just absolutely disgusting and awful. And it really did play into my claustrophobia. So I've seen YouTube videos before of people who explore caves. And there was like this one story about a guy who got stuck in a cave and they had to leave him there. And he was upside down and they could not get him out. And he ended up dying there and his body is still there to this day. That genuinely terrifies the fuck out of me. Why people do that, I do not know. You know, it's like people willingly go into caves, like I guess for the thrill of the adventure, which is great. I love that people can do that and be great with that. You know, people have their hobbies, but like people actually willingly put their lives in danger to do that. And I guess that's kind of what this story has done too. There are these perfectly sized human shaped holes that fit a specific person and then that specific person goes inside and you know it just it almost feels like they were robbed of their control going into it which terrifies me because I'm like well what if this actually happens what if these random human shaped holes appeared one day and I'm compelled to go into it and I have no control over my body that scares me so badly it was so genuinely unsettling and upsetting And then we get into the sad tale of the principal post, which honestly was only like four pages. It's so short. So again, I almost feel unfair given this a rating, but I did give it a five out of 10. Nothing too bad about it or anything. I love the fact that it was all in color, but yeah, this family are eating dinner and then they hear a shout from the father and he's in the crawl space down below. And the, the foundation or like the, the principal post that keeps the house together 
is on top of him somehow. Like it couldn't have moved up and he couldn't have gotten under it that way because then the house would have, you know, fallen down. And they can't move it now. They have to leave him. If they move it to rescue him, the entire house might fall over. So they do that. They they just leave him. To this day, he is a, a skeleton. He's dead under it now. And no one will ever know how he ended up getting underneath it. And again, that kind of plays to my fear as well. Like, what if something happened to me and it was so unexplainable? Nobody could ever explain it. And there are genuinely things in this world that there are no explanations for. You just have to accept it. I want the answers to everything. So the fact that we had this extremely short story, four pages, four pages, and I don't have the answer to it, it annoys me in a way that I feel like was the point of the story. So I really appreciate it, even though it was like the shortest thing ever. And then the last one, Keepsake. Oh my gosh, it was bizarre and trigger warnings for necrophilia. But this one I gave a 6.5. I might end up bumping it up again at the end of it. But essentially, there is a baby crying from inside a grave of a woman who died nine months before. A woman who could never get pregnant. And her husband and everyone, well, ex-husband, they all come to it, dig it up, and they say a baby has been born from the body of this woman. And it was definitely born from this woman and not just placed there because it has the, the umbilical cord. And it's just so bizarre, like how did that even happen? So the widow takes the child back to his current wife who also has a baby and she was his mistress before his wife died. So if the story was predictable, I did think that the mistress and the husband would be behind the deceased wife's death. And that is exactly how it turns out. But what I didn't expect is one, like how a couple of years later we'd have the freaky looking child who is honestly so scary looking. He reminds me a little bit of the child in the haunted house one that I think is Soichi's son, I think. And we end up finding out exactly how this baby was born. And that was because, and I'll not show it. I mean, not that you can really say anything really, but the widow, the husband, he had sex with, his dead wife and that was because she said to him as a dead corpse please i want you i want a baby and that's exactly what's happened again the child oh, freaking hell <laughs> the child it oh, huh? i mean the poor child to be born from a corpse oh but it just scares me it does so i enjoyed how dark the story was and i thought it was a good end to this volume so venus in the blind spot the volume itself Again, it was up and down. I really loved the first story. Some hits and misses after that, some low points after that, and then like the highest point after that. And then we kind of ended on, yeah, pretty, pretty good. But I'm so glad I read it because the Enigma of Amigara Fold definitely made me go, okay, I need to consume more Junji Ito, like right now. I'm not even gonna like rest for the rest of the day. I mean, even though it's nighttime now, it's like 11 p.m. I feel like I need to read another one, like ASAP. It's so addicting. <laughs> Maybe that's a horror story in itself, like consuming Junji Ito stories and you just can't stop consuming them until you're dead. I have the spinny wheel up on my phone again, so let's uh, spin the wheel. I'm just hoping it's not like a really long one. Oh, it was so close to being Remina. It's Shiver. That is so odd as well. Like, I don't know why this keeps happening, but it seems like random coincidences are happening because I'm currently watching my friend Gabby on Sprints, right? And she recommended Shiver. Like, I think it's one of her favourite ones. And I've been watching her as I've been reading Venus in the Blind Spot. You know, reading sprints, you read for like an hour, you chat for 10 minutes, read for an hour, chat for 10 minutes. So it took me two sprints to read this. When I said I'm reading Junji Ito, my friend Gabby said, and I'm going to Japan at the end of this month with Gabby too, by the way. But she said her favourite ones are Shiver and Uzumaki. So the fact that I have just pulled Shiver which is apparently Gabby's favourite one, along with Uzumaki. Why does this keep happening? Something fishy is going on, and I'm not talking about Gyo. Got a new cut, which I hate. Don't even talk about it. I hate my hair too short, and the bobber went way too short. Another thing as well is my cats have, like, ruined one of my favourite 
hoodies. So just ignore that too. And my cats are literally taking the piss because they uncovered this fish toy and after reading Gyo, what the hell? This seriously like terrified me. It just came out of nowhere. I was like, did somebody put mechanical legs on this and make it walk? But no, it's just my cats having fun with me apparently. I did finish Shiver and I do think this is the best collection so far that I've read. I think the majority of the stories in this, I gave pretty high ratings because it just felt like at least, it, you know, actually, every single story in this scared me in some way. There were so many things that Junji Ito played up on that I think just made this collection stand out. With all of the one-shot story ratings averaged out, this one gets a 7.20, which is so good. The previous two have gotten, like, under a 6, and this one is just like, oh. And I feel like I have found a new favourite story in this one, too, and I'm just excited to talk about this one. So the first story is called Used Record, and I feel like this is probably one of the not as great stories from this collection. I gave this one a 6.5, which is still great, but it did take some like horrifying turns. So essentially we have these two characters and one of them, like I, I'm terrible with names. There are so many one shots and so many different character names and a lot of the characters do look quite similar, I'm not gonna lie. Like the way that Junji Ito draws like young boys, for example, they just all pretty much look the same to me. They mainly all look pretty much the same. I mean, there are two female main characters in this one. One of them shows their friend this record that they found and they listen to it and it's like really beautiful and amazing and the friend who she shows it to wants to listen to it all the time every time so the friend asks oh can I borrow it and she says no you can't so the friend ends up like stealing it and the person who steals it accidentally kills her friend when she tries to get it back. What is it about this record that draws her in? At least to the point where she ends up covering her friend in a sheet and she's just like oh don't hate me okay and just like walks away from that. Like imagine a record that does that to you where you would literally kill one of your friends in order to take it and think that's okay. Like honestly the human psyche that Junji Ito explores sometimes is just so like abnormal and strange to me. I'm just like this is not normal behavior but she looks like a normal person which I think is something that really unsettled me more about this story and other stories where people seem and it happens quite a few times now actually where people have this unnatural obsession with something and yet they look human they look normal they look fine but they're not and they do these really odd bizarre things so this was just like another one of those things where i was like okay not a whole else more happens in this one just other than we find out that the record is a song that a singer sang after they died and like they had finally got their big break they got into the record studio well they were going to the record studio to sing and record their debut but they got killed on the way while they're dying they die in the record studio before they can sing and it's only after they're dead that they start singing so like that was really creepy that's essentially what this record is and the character who steals the record from a friend ends up running into other people who want the record for themselves. It leads to awful things where other people start to get obsessed with it too. It's a little bit like that story, a splendid song something, where a song gets stuck in uh, the main character's head. But one thing I really love about this collection in particular actually is the author commentary at the end of the stories. This is the first time I've come across it and I love hearing more about Junji Ito's process of coming up with these stories and just explaining the stories a little bit more. So I really appreciated that. So yeah, 6.5 out of 10 for used record. It was a decent start to the collection. So the next story is called Shiver, which is what the collection is actually named after. And this one, like, oh God, like the holes in this, like the holes that are in the human body, oh, it's just so, upsetting. Has anyone seen, I think it's like a pomegranate that's on the cover of one of Stephanie Meyer's books, which is like the Twilight books, and the holes and that kind of freaks me out a little bit, which is why I, like, I hate that cover. And this story, it, oh god, it just, the whole, the whole holes that are in the, the, the bodies, oh, it just, Oh, I, I, mm. Probably an irrational fear, but I gave this one an 8 out of 10. While I love the idea of the holes and things, like, and honestly, like, skip ahead if you do not like this kind of 
thing. While I love that whole idea of it, I'm not sure I really connected with the story overall. So there is a young boy who has a neighbour and his neighbour is a young girl. She always seems to be in the house and there is a regular doctor who visits her. And when he sees the girl, she has like these holes in her arm and she's pointing somewhere. And it's just a little bit strange. Oh, oh God, I don't know if I should actually show you the thing. Like it is gross. It is very gross. Her arm is covered in countless holes. Oh, it's just, oh. oh. But it reminds the main character of his grandpa who died with all of these holes in his body. And it creeps me out, honestly. The body horror that Junji Ito does, there is quite a bit of it. And it always seems to be in a way that feels like it could happen a lot of the times. I mean, sometimes it is a little bit extraordinary, you know? Like, maybe it's a bit too much. But potentially, and I'm sure there have been cases where people have had holes in their body and in their skin. And it Oh, I, I just, I, I hate it. I hate it. So yeah, the main boy character, his friend ends up visiting. They go through the grandpa's journals. They find out about him being in the war, as well as like this little creature thingamabobby. And this creature thingamabobby ends up being the thing that the young girl points to. And out of nowhere at the end of this, a little bit of time has passed. The girl seems to be healed, which is odd. But then the main character, his friend, who also read the journal, his body is riddled with holes. It is so vile, like his eye has like come down and it's looking through one of the other holes that isn't his eye socket. Like that is fucked up Junji Ito. How dare you? How dare you even draw this? It is disgusting. But he did find that beetle thing that was in the journal and the doctor is going after him. And I just feel like the whole story itself, like it could have been higher, but I wasn't really invested in the friend getting the whole treatment. I think it would have been more impactful if the main character had of. So I feel like maybe the concept was a little bit more than the actual story that was told. But I think eight out of 10 is still fantastic for it. Oh, okay, and then we get to Fashion Model, which is uh, another one that I was unsure how to rate. The person in it is extremely bizarre and does genuinely terrify me too. I ended up giving this one a rating of 8 out of 10 also. But again, at the end, I might bump ratings up if I feel like the story has stayed with me. I feel like that's also a big factor in Junji Ito stories. Like me just binging them all in one go essentially means that I don't really get to sit with them. So I think at the end of the video, I might revisit these uh, stories and the ratings of them. But I think this one will most likely end up staying with me for a little bit. So essentially, we follow a guy who just randomly finds this magazine. In this magazine is this fashion model and she doesn't look like a typical model. She's surrounded by like these beautiful girls and things, but she has this really odd look about her. She has these really piercing eyes. Her face is almost elongated and these very hollow cheekbones that just don't fit in with anybody else in the magazine. It's like she stands out even more because of that. And whenever she looks, she looks like she's looking at you. Even me just looking at this, not just the character. The character is also weirded out by it, but me actually looking at this, it looks like she's looking at me. And I'm sorry, but that is genuinely terrifying. And just panels like this, even though it's just in his imagination, it really does stick with you. So some time has passed again, the main character and his friends are doing like this open call for like this little indie film that they're making. And so they have like this little casting call, they're trying to get people for it. Lo and behold, somebody who applied for it is the woman from the magazine, which again, it's just like odd, isn't it? Like the fact that he saw her in the magazine and she's applying for this little project. It's Okay, and I just thought maybe the story would just be about changing the beauty stereotypes or like what we consider or deem beautiful. Maybe it would flip that on its head and maybe make us feel uncomfortable by our own judgments. And I feel like partly that is what the story is doing. And then we end up getting that model coming. And again, like she is just, she's not really saying anything. She's just looking. And I didn't want to cast too much judgment because I thought, oh, maybe she'll turn out to be a normal person and the actual monster will be the beautiful girl that they ended up hiring, the person they overlooked because she didn't look like her. But essentially they go on location to film and she does actually end up turning out to be a, a genuine monster. She has these razor sharp teeth 
and they don't even think she's human. And she does start to kill the people and she says that she's the protagonist. So like she is a monster. I don't think it flipped that stereotype on its head at all, but I feel like that's what, maybe what the point of the story was to begin with. But it did end up going into this whole, like I'm gonna pretty much kill everyone. <laughs> it doesn't show you that or anything. And I do feel like this fashion model is gonna stick with me because I just feel like her design itself, even though she looks a little bit like from The Mystery of the Haunted House, she kind of looks a little bit like her and she is tall like her too. I feel like Junji Ido also has a thing for really tall, scary looking women. I don't know. <laughs> but that, yeah, that was a really good story. And then we get to Hanging Blimp or Hanging Balloons, I believe it's also called. Now this story I already knew existed because when I was talking to a friend about Junji Ito a little while back, they mentioned like the Hanging Balloons story as one of their favorites. And they didn't quite fully explain exactly everything, but I just remember being a little bit creeped out by the summary of it, just from what they told me about it. So I was really excited to read this and it did not disappoint. I think this is definitely one of my favorites so far and I gave it a 9.5 out of 10. Could potentially be a 10 out of 10 when I finish my reading vlog. But essentially in this story, there are these big, huge, faces that come down from the sky and they have a noose attached to them and the faces they look like the people in this town and it seems like that huge balloon is trying to hang you it's like specifically coming after you and it can talk like you too it can sound like you so it all starts with the death of a girl who was found hanging outside of her apartment and then people start seeing like her face huge in the sky yeah like this this, it's just, it's floating around. Like, I'm just imagining a huge face just floating in the air. And that, that is genuinely upsetting. <laughs> Even the main character of the story, this young girl, she sees it too. And she tries to stop one of her friends, and she tries to stop one of her friends from approaching it. But then it, it has the balloon face of him and he's now being hanged and she watches it all happen and it's like it, nothing is explained nothing is explained which i think is so brilliant because where did these balloons come from how are they talking how are they moving how do they function you know what i mean like you just don't get told these things and i just it's genuinely terrifying and then you see his body just hanging from that huge face it just flying in the sky like can you imagine just people hanging from the sky. It just, that is upsetting. The next day, some of her friends get taken and that's when she realizes the danger she's in. And again, like, what do you do? What do you do in that situation? <laughs> the faces are genuinely scary. I feel like Junji Ito has a great way of showing faces. You also can't even really fight back either because one of them gets shot in the face and her friend, her face just deflates. So like, it kills her. So it's like, what? How? How do you? How do you survive? I mean, yes, kind of staying inside and locking the doors and not allowing anything to get near your neck, definitely. But one thing I found like so dumb were character decisions in this. Like the dad, like watching all of this unfold on the TV, right? So she's home with her family. They're seeing like the flying objects attacking the whole country, and people are getting hanged by the corresponding face and they have no idea what to do. And then the dad is just like, at any rate, I'm going to the office. I have some work to take care of that has to be done today. I, after watching this news report of people dying, like you can even see it on the TV. They're actually showing all of these hanging bodies from the sky and the dad's just like, oh, I've got some work to do in the office, I've got to go. He literally dies straight away. He gets taken straight away. Like, why are you so dumb? He deserved to die, not gonna lie. But yeah, then the brother goes, the mum goes. So it's just like the main character left now at the end. Not only does it end with a feeling of loneliness, but also the feeling of helplessness. Again, like, how is she supposed to survive? Like, what's she gonna do for food? She can't just stay in the house, like, forever without food, you know? So it ends so brilliantly, I think. So I really enjoyed it. 9.5 out of 10 for that one. I just think it was just such a great concept and a really good execution too, even though some character decisions really annoyed me. So then we get into Marionette Mansion, which if you have a, a fear of puppets and marionettes, then this is the one for you. I don't personally really have that much of a fear of puppets. I mean, if a puppet is creepy looking, then I will be scared of it. But yeah, there is one 
creepy looking one that looks a little bit like some of the elongated face villains that we've had so far in Junji Ito. So it does kind of look like even a little bit like the fashion model a little bit. But yeah, there is a family, they use marionettes, that's their thing, that's their job. A few years pass, the main character, his brother has his own house, wife and child. And when he and his sister go and visit, that creepy puppet thing is, you know, there letting them in. And his brother, his wife and child are on strings. And they're actually being used like puppets from people in the, like, in the ceiling. So I just found that a brilliantly bizarre story. And I was like, okay, we're flipping on its head. The whole idea that uh, people are controlling puppets, but what about when the puppets control the people? And there are some, like, instances in the story where that is brought up. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Just truly a bizarre thing that I never would have <laughs> thought of even coming up with myself. And while it's not outwardly scary for the majority of it, there is, like, this undercurrent of fear of, like, why and what? You know, like, why are they doing this? The main character, he has a, well, kind of girlfriend who we met when he was younger. And she comes to the house because she thinks that he's having an affair, but it's that's just a, a puppet. And when she comes, everyone in their ceiling, we do actually see who's in the ceiling. It's just like, they look like normal people-ish, kind of, it, but I'm still like, why? like. What what was their purpose? Like, they just randomly start to, well, it seems like kill the people on the strings. They're hanging from the ceiling and they're just like, they can't do anything and they're screaming for help. And then he finds his girlfriend dead, stabbed to death by the elongated faced marionette puppet thing. And it's genuinely disturbing, that poor girl. But yeah, now all of his family have been turned into like these puppet things. And all the people in the ceiling are now dead too. It's just like, how? How the fact that there is like an absence of explanation a lot of the time, it does creep me out more than if it was explained. I'm just left bewildered. And it was so good. So I gave this one an 8 out of 10. Like it's again so high. I feel like this definitely was like the strongest collection. It's just like, oh, let's put some of Junji Ito's best stuff in one book. And they got themselves a winner. And then we get into Painter. And this is where I meet Tomie. And I was wondering, oh, well, I don't know if I've shot myself in the foot by reading this first over Tomie, or if this was like a good introduction to the character. Because, I mean, I don't know who or what she is, essentially. But again, it goes into that whole obsession plotline that we've had a few times of people irrationally getting obsessed with her. And, you know, we have a rising artist, he's our main character, he randomly meets Tomie, and she seems to be rather rude and abrupt, but she ends up getting him to paint her a little bit like Dorian Gray in a way. And she wants somebody to capture her beauty. And he doesn't seem to do a very good job, apparently. So she goes to someone else who makes statues of her. But this man, he gets like creepily obsessed with Tomie. Like he can't stop thinking about her and he can't seem to get the inspiration back for creating artwork like before. There is also like this really creepy picture of Tomie that is like, kind of a little bit blurred, but it looks like she has like another face, which really creepy. Like I do love the fact that Junji Ito, even though this story was a little bit more subtle in terms of horror, he will still be able to put in a horrific image. And that is horrific to me. But yeah, there is another sculptor who has been sculpting Tomie. And the painter gets, you know, really possessive, kills him by accident. There are all these Tomie statues. And Tomie herself, even though he, again, tried so hard to capture her beauty in a painting, she is still absolutely rude and awful to him. It's horrible. It's the worst. You're the worst painter in the world. So he ends up killing her. Like, how do I even explain the ending? There's just, like... Uh, it just seems like her body... And I guess the statues or her body parts are like multiplying a little bit. Like maybe after four days, like all of this happened. Faces growing out of limbs and heads. Each piece of her body began to grow. Her flesh multiplies before me. Was this Tomie's introduction? And then we get into the main book, Tomie. I mean, Junji Do himself says, I drew the Tomie series intermittently after her initial appearance. Then my editor asked me if I wouldn't try focusing on it. Painter is the first chapter of that series. I gave this one a 7.5 out of 10. And then we get into the long dream. This one, 
again has a really unique concept of like what would happen if you were in your dreams but your dream even though like the same amount of time passes in the real world but your dream lasts a month or a month and a half or years like what happens if it lasts years and years and years and years what happens if your dream lasts 10 years but like it's still just like a day in real time it's a really hard one to explain but it was super crazy super weird and i ended up giving this one a 7 out of 10 because we have this guy who is saying that his dreams are lasting so long and we have these scientists or like doctors who are trying to find out what's going on but they never have the answers and again like I feel like that's a huge thing for Jinji Ito to not explain himself. This guy like 10 years, 10 years in his dream and then his body changes so awfully like this is his body, this is him. What does it do to your body? Like I'm so like creeped out like what if this happened to me what if I was in a dream for 10 years would this happen to me would I look like that it's genuinely creepy it's unsettling I don't think a whole lot more to say about this one other than it has a really sick ending of the fact that the doctor is so unaware of what's going on that he's gonna end up using these crystal things that were found in this guy's head and give it to another patient so that he can study it more. And this patient is totally unaware of what's happening. The idea of being tested on without your knowledge is another thing that really freaks me out. Then we get into Honored Ancestors. I think this is when the stories start to lose their steam a little bit. I feel like they didn't have the best story saved for the rest of the, the book. I mean, the stories are still good. I gave this one a six out of 10. I feel like these ones are more based on, like there is a specific image that stands out, but the story overall doesn't in a way. Like in this one, we follow a guy who was trying to get this girl to become his wife, even though he looks so bloody young, like he's still in school essentially. At least that, I think that's a school uniform. And he's trying to get his friend to, be with him because his dad is dying like this is like really creepy his dad is dying this was such an odd exchange like he just crawls in not revealing the rest of his head but he just crawls into the room and starts talking about her to her it seems like she's lost her memory from some past trauma and it is indicated that she lost her memory from actually seeing what is about to happen so this disgusting image here is the guy's dad and there is the top of the skull of all of the ancestors kind of making this huge caterpillar looking thing and it's like it's preserving the brains and the minds of the ancestors that they have and the heads just keep growing and growing right above my dad's head is my aunt's above that's my grandma's and my great uncle's head that is, uh, <laughs> I've got no words. Like the story itself, I didn't care that much for, but this, this was genuinely creepy. That is a great image. I don't know why, but like, this is like human centipede, but if like, it was just people's brains, <laughs> people's heads that were attached. The main guy, he is trying to get his friend, his girlfriend, potential girlfriend, to give him an heir because he is the last person in this long line of ancestors and descendants. So he needs to carry on the line. And that is kind of what caused her to lose her memory. It was, it was fine, it was interesting, especially since at the end we do have the boy himself have the heads of, as part of his head. I would not want to be part of this family. Seriously, like if I was that boy, I would want to try and get as far away as possible from this. Like why would you suffer yourself to be weighed down by all of these heads? You wouldn't be able to leave the house or do anything. Then we get into Greased Oil or just Greased. I'm not 100% sure what the title of this one is. This one is another one where I didn't really care too much about the story. So I gave it five out of 10. There is definitely a scene that really stands out though. And if you read this, you'll know exactly what scene it is. But yeah, there is a girl, she lives with her brother and father. They live in a restaurant and the restaurant itself is covered in grease. Like it's in the air, everything is covered in it. It's like this really vile and unhygienic place. And her brother is randomly drinking salad oil like no tomorrow. That's like his favorite thing. He grows these pimples on his face, like really bad acne. And he gets picked on, so he picks on his sister. Uh, and his face ends up getting that much worse. And I feel like as a teenager, when you're, you know, breaking out and you're getting spots and pimples or acne, anything like that, 
And like this is so relatable that he looks like this. He's got all of these awful things on his face, but it's the, oh, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. It's, oh my God, it makes me want to be sick. I'm so glad I haven't eaten yet because it would just come straight back up. Oh, and so oh, he does this to his sister. He squeezes all of the pus from his spots until it rains down on his sister's face. Oh God, it's vile. It is absolutely vile. I feel like this scene will definitely stick out to me. I still didn't enjoy the whole overall story as much, but that has to be one of the most horrific scenes I've read yet. And you know, there is like this other storyline about her dad trying to get her to drink salad oil and uh, potentially the dad is feeding the restaurant customers his son. And we end it as well that the dad has cut off his leg and it's just dripping oil. Like he is literally made of oil essentially. So is our main character also made of oil? I don't know. It's just, it's so strange. So strange. There is a bonus story to this one too. Like that was the final full story. There is a bonus story, which I actually still enjoyed. I gave it a 6.5 out of 10. And it's kind of a continuation of Fashion Model. And this one's called Fashion Model Cursed Frame. So we have this young girl. She wants to be a model, but she hates photos where her limbs are sort of like cut off from the frame of the picture. So like she has to always do like full body shots. And you know, she's applied for this place. They said, oh yes, we will do a full body shot. That's fine. And she meets the fashion model from before who again still is very intimidating very scary I think it's just the fact that she is a lot taller and she can just descend on you at any minute because she's that tall it's so intimidating and again the teeth is very upsetting but anyway some time passes the model sees her images in a magazine but they have cut off like parts of her body in the frame and she is mortified by it. That's not what they said they would do. And then she also, I, I don't want to show you this image yet because it's, it's one of the most upsetting, but it's hard, I don't know how to cover it. But yeah, she flicks through and she sees that model again, the really odd one, and she's like, this girl, I wonder why she's modeling with looks like this. And then suddenly in her apartment, there's the fashion model with looks like what? And then she's just standing there over her. Like, do you mind? She's just like literally broken in. That's terrifying. When did you, and then it goes to the next page, which is the end of the story, and she's like dead. The young girl's dead, you didn't even get to see her die. Okay, yeah, sorry, my camera died, just as the main character in this story died. The fashion model, she's put like this frame around her body, she's taken off her limbs, so she only fits in that frame. And when I first started the story, I kind of assumed that's what would happen because of her, you know, emphasizing the fact that she needs to have her full body in, in frame. Like she can't have any of her limbs cut off from it. And I just kind of automatically thought, oh, she's gonna get her limbs taken off at the end of this story. And I was proved right. But still, it didn't take away from the enjoyment of this, even though it was so short, it's only about like six pages or something like that. But again, it's just like this whole fashion model person. She is just really freaking me out. And the fact that she just broke into her apartment without her realizing and does this? She's a psychopath. <laughs> but she's also just like a fashion model too. It's, it's so bizarre. I can't explain any of it. Really enjoyed this. I don't even know what is gonna live up to this after this, unless it's like Uzumaki. Again, we don't wanna read that one just yet. We wanna save that one for a rainy day, which, you know, today is raining a little bit again. I wouldn't mind reading a really short one. So like Dissolving Classroom looks pretty short. Fragments of Horror looks short. Remina, Sense, uh, you know, those ones. I wouldn't mind a really short one next. Let's see if the wheel permits it. Let me spin it first. I'll shuffle it just to change it up a bit. And let's uh, spin the wheel. Oh, Black Paradox is short. No, Black Paradox. Not Tombs, not Tombs, not Tombs, not Tombs. Ah! Oh, fuck. Oh man, Tombs is a big one. Black Paradox would have been perfect. <laughs> it's like it heard me say, oh, I want a short one. I was like, ha. Let's make it as close as possible so you think you're getting it, bitch. So next I'm reading Tombs, which actually doesn't feel as big as previous ones. It's not as big as Shiver, I guess, but still, I wanted a really short one. I've been having a bit of a nightmare the past five days. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm reading Junji Ito, so it makes sense. But just a lot of stress and stuff that's been happening with 
ah, just personal life stuff. So it's unfortunately meant that I've read a couple more Junji Ito stories or collections and haven't been able to come and talk to you guys about them. I mean, I do still feel like I can talk about the books that I read, but yeah, I am a little bit worried that there might be some things that I've forgotten. But I will actually say that the time between reading the stories and now has probably helped the stories because I've actually just changed some of my ratings for some of the short stories right now in the first collection that I read. And I've actually bumped them up. And I, I mean, I'll talk about it now as well, but just as a whole, I feel like certain stories from Tombs have stayed with me the past few days since reading the, the book. And I read this during some reading sprints for my patrons. We did a Geek End Readathon, which I did have to cut short because of stress in my life. But it did mean that I managed to read Tombs and one other Junji Ito book. So I don't wanna talk about them. I'm a little bit worried that I might have forgotten some initial thoughts and feelings on the stories. So I might not be talking as much about them, but I do want to say though that some of them have stood out and have, as I said, stayed with me. So the first story is the titular Tombs. And I really enjoyed the story. This one, I thought when I first read it was my favorite of the entire collection. So I gave it an eight out of 10. So I don't actually know if this is my favorite one from the actual collection because there are two other ones that have the same rate now. It's just like there's definitely three that I think really stand out in this. In Tombs is definitely one of them. I just genuinely love the atmosphere of the setting. So we have a brother and sister. They are in the car the brother is driving. They're on their way to see the um, sister's friend. So he's so happy to get there. I will say as well though, again, like the main guy character just looks like every other main guy character in a Junji Ito story. Is there some kind of Junji Ito cinematic universe I'm unaware of? Is this the same person? Because it genuinely looks like it. But anyway, on the way there, they accidentally run a young girl over and she dies and they put her in the car intending to go to the hospital. But when they say that she's actually dead, he decides to hide the body in the boot of his car and pretend like it didn't happen just yet. So they get to the small town where his sister's friend lives and there's a random tombstone thing in the middle of the road. And he tries to back out. There is another one in the road. And there seems to be so many different random tombs all over the place. And I just found that so intriguing and odd. Like why would they just be randomly anywhere? So as it turns out that anybody who dies in this town Wherever they die, eventually, as they're deteriorating, a tomb is sort of erected in that exact position from their body. But it only happens if the body isn't touched or moved. So essentially, if they die in a place, they have to stay there. Otherwise, the body gets disturbed and they become restless. There is a well. Again, I love the sort of urban legend aspect of it because the entire town seems to be like, oh, this is normal. This is normal behavior. And I'm just like, is it though? Is it? But yeah, even the hospital, whenever a patient is dying, they can't have the tombs erecting in the hospital itself. So they have to carry like dying patients outside and put them on the ground so that their tomb can be erected outside of the hospital. It's so strange, but I love the thought process behind that. And all the while as well, there is this tension of the fact that the sister's friend is saying, oh, my sister is missing and we don't know where she is. And as it turns out, the sister who was missing is the one that the main characters ran over and killed at the start. <laughs> so they're literally like trying to hide what they've done. But there is again, like a sense of guilt but also ooh, at any minute they could be caught out. And there's the well that a lot of the bodies are thrown down if they have been moved, if they have been tampered with and they can't find peace. Why? I don't really fully know. I love that we don't know though. There is just so much gray area where you can put your own interpretation into it. It really does make the entire experience of reading Junji Ito so interactive because I feel like nobody can really give you a concrete answer on what's going on. You can kind of just put your thoughts and feelings into it and be able to present a good argument for it because there isn't really that many things to say that you are wrong. Oh, honestly, the, the story does take a bit of a turn, but there is a really gross scene of the main characters putting the dead body of the friend's sister down the well and the body looks like this now. It looks like all crystallized and extremely disgusting and gross like you wouldn't even be able to tell that it's her you have to carry it into 
the well. And it's just so uncomfortable. And there's a really scary part where the body sort of comes out the well, but it does turn out to be just an illusion that the main boy character has seen. Because that is genuinely terrifying. And I'm just thinking, what happens to all of these bodies when they're in the well? Do they come to life? Like, is there a sort of restlessness there? Is it haunted? Like, what happens? And this is just in the boy's imagination. But I wouldn't be surprised if they did come back and fuck shit up. It is honestly such a tragic story, especially when we get to the end. I'll not mention what the ending is. Well, actually, this is all spoilers anyway. So the girl who got killed by the main characters... Her sister, who has been looking for her and her parents, end up taking their own lives by the end of it when the main girl character goes to apologise and admit to what they've done. And she comes across that there are three tombs, a letter addressed to relatives, bottles of sleeping pills. It's like, this is what they've caused. It is so tragic. So that melancholy is what makes me really love that story. The next story is called Clubhouse. And this was a pretty decent one. I gave it a 5.5 out of 10. It felt very standard for the majority of it, but I love the fact that it kind of ends on a cliffhanger. So there are these three friends, three best friends. There is a haunted house. Two of them go in, but when they come out, they seem really, uh, well, a bit different. Not exactly at first, but over time, they do kind of split off from one another. Like they don't really talk to one another anymore and it's really weird for the main character who didn't go inside the haunted house and she's left confused and then when she talks to her friends about it um, there are two sort of levels to this haunted house one of them went downstairs the other one upstairs and they're sort of almost closed off from one another and each of the friends ended up befriending seemingly the ghosts of the people who I think died there. And it's like two rival kind of gangs, almost again like Romeo and Juliet, like two rival families. And each of the best friends are trying to get the main character to be part of their sort of gang. And it is a little bit more than that, but that's just like the, the bare bones of it. But when the main character tries to escape, she gets caught between both of the upstairs and the downstairs. And like her head is sticking out through the wood that separates the upstairs and the downstairs. And both sides are like pulling on her. And I'm just like getting, I mean, it ends there. And I'm just getting like really awful feelings of what could happen next. Like would one of them accidentally pull her head off? And that kind of open-endedness does make your imagination run wild. I mean, there probably is more of a commentary on feeling torn between two worlds in a way. And probably the pressures of trying to befriend two totally separate groups. Of people. I would love to dive deeper into these stories at some point, maybe take it volume by volume, story by story, really do a deep dive into the themes and the stories themselves. But like right now, just initial impression, I think 5.5 out of 10 is a pretty good reading. The next one is Slug Girl. And while I feel like some of the imagery in this is quite iconic and it is extremely gross, I just don't think I'm into the not a whole lot of plot, but a lot of grossness stories from Junji Ito. So I gave this one a three out of 10. It didn't really do anything for me again. It essentially follows a girl who used to be so chatty and talkative at school and in class. But then one day she seems to just like stop talking and she barely interacts with people and then she stops going to school. So we have another character who comes to check on her and she has a face mask on, she won't talk, she won't do anything. And that's when we get some backstory of the girl who stays home from school, that there used to be slugs in her garden and she would be really scared of them. And a bunch of people from school grabbed a slug to scare Yuko, the, the girl who won't talk anymore. And this is kind of like the repercussions of a terrible prank. And now her tongue seems to be replaced with a slug. And that is honestly vile. Like, that is disgusting. I can only imagine how that tastes. And again, it does make me feel uncomfortable. I think the story did that very well. Especially when it, like, slowly comes out of her mouth there, too. Like, you see it starting to come out. Ugh. It does make me feel sick. It makes me feel nauseous. Which I think the story did its job well. And it just, like, slaps onto her face. Ugh. It's just awful. It's absolutely awful. Even when she cuts it off with a pair of scissors, 
it just grows back. And like, what do you do in that situation? I, I mean, surely the parents should have taken her to a hospital, surely. But instead they fill a bath with salt and put her daughter in it. And she doesn't come back up and all they pull out is her head. Her head, that's all they pull out. And she is now a sort of shell for a slug. Like her head is a shell for a slug. It's so, like, I don't even know how to explain this story. It's just so bonkers. But that is a great visual too. Like I really do enjoy that kind of imagery. But again, I just, I at the end of the day, I mean, I would hate that to happen to me, but I just think she should have just went to a hospital. Why, why did her parents put her in a bathtub of salt? Come on. The next one is The Window Next Door. I initially had this at a lower rating, but ever since reading it, it just reminded me of when I was younger and I would look out of my bedroom window at night and look at the window of the neighbours, like opposite the house. And, you know, it would always be dark. I would never say anything, but just my imagination would sometimes run wild with me. But like my mind would go to places like, oh, imagine if there was like a killer there. What if somebody was getting murdered? Or what if there's like a really scary monster there? And this one kind of shows that in a really great way. So I did give it six out of 10. I initially gave it five. So this one definitely improved in hindsight because of how unsettled it made me even to this day, just thinking about it every now and then. So essentially we have this young boy who again looks like the character from Tombs. He and his family move to a house and opposite them is a house with just one window. And that window is directly opposite the boy's bedroom window. And it's a little bit odd, it is a little bit strange, but nothing out of the ordinary just yet. But then, oh god. Then, on a night time, he'll hear, young man, young man, Young man, are you asleep this evening? I hope you're well. Young man, young man, young man, young man, how do you like your new house? Young man, how are you tonight? That face, no. No. Young man, you should come over sometime. I'll be waiting with the door unlocked. What an, oh God, disgusting. Disgusting and awful, just horrible, nasty, oh. I feel like even if this was just a normal adult too, like they don't have to look like a monster for that to be creepy. Seriously, I'll be waiting with the door unlocked. If an adult said that to a boy who's sleeping in the house opposite, jail. Jail. I mean, jail for this bitch and all. Like, oh my God, like she's even putting like a pipe over to, oh my God, you know what? I might bump this one up. Cause like the more I think about it, I, I think I'll give it a seven instead actually. I'll give it a seven. And she just keeps doing it. And he even tries to swap rooms with his parents at one point and she doesn't show up. So he goes back to his room. Oh, yeah, she even like tries to get to his room and stuff like, young man, I'll be there soon. My hands can almost reach you. I'll be able to come over soon, okay? I can almost knock. When I knock, please open the window. Ah, it's still too far, I can't reach. But please wait for me, I'll be there soon. <sighs> leave me alone. <laughs> and then when he wakes up in the morning, and this is how it ends, like the actual window itself is just, it, it, it was sticking out. Like the window is literally just right opposite his window. Like even closer than it was before. Like way close, too close. We're talking about moving somewhere else right now. Move now. Honestly, do not wait. Pack your things before nightfall and leave. That is honestly so terrifying to me. Just imagine looking out the window and there's somebody else's window right outside it. Somebody who's been saying that they're gonna come over and they look like that bitch. Oh no, absolutely not. So yeah, I'm giving this one a seven out of 10 instead. The next one is called Washed Ashore. I mean, doesn't really have a whole lot happening in it because it's mainly just about the fact that a massive carcass just washes up on the beach and people have just come to look at it including our main character and it's a disgusting creature and there are different things in fact it reminds me a little bit of Gyo you have like the fish and them looking really bizarre like deep sea creatures do scare me because they do look rather peculiar but you know what's really upsetting about it and why I'm giving it a 6 out of 10 and not lower is that inside this carcass there are people that you can pretty much see. Like a lot of the skin is transparent and there are bodies inside it and they cut it open to get the people out, which again, like, oh, I don't know how Jinji Ito drove this, but it just looks fantastic how he managed to cram so much detail in so much blackness 
and darkness is so good. And like just these bodies just pour out. There's even people who come out of it. My fiance, the one shipwrecked in Aizu seven years ago, there are literal people inside that seem to be moving. Like they're kind of alive still. And it's like the people are the parasites. The main character says they're like parasites. Maybe they were able to survive and it's good by absorbing nutrients the creature took in. And it's reversing the idea of humans being parasites instead of the, the parasites themselves, you know? I mean, to be fair, we are parasites to the earth, let's be honest. But this is a more like literal sense of being like actual parasites in this creature. Oh, the imagery of that was just so brilliant. But again, like not thing really happened in this, which is why it's not like higher or anything. It's literally just looking at this carcass, getting the bodies out of it and the more of the implications of it than anything else. But I do still think that was pretty, pretty good. The next one is called The Strange Tale of the Tunnel. Now this I originally gave a 7 out of 10, but I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10 because I think this is one of my joint favourites of this collection. And again, like the more I think about it, the more it stayed with me. So essentially there is a sort of train tunnel. It's not used now. It's been disused. There is a story of a woman walking along the tracks, going into the tunnel and just disappearing. And our main character, it was his mother. It was his mother who did that. And for some reason, his horrible friends decide that they're going to go to this tunnel after it's been like, you know, disused, the tracks have been removed and they decide to go into it to explore and they take the character in with them. And we hear about a story of a train that got derailed. And now they like mention like a ghost train coming through. I will say this story is not about a ghost train, even though I think that would be epic too, because I absolutely love this. I love the idea of a train just continuously going on a journey with all of the ghosts that died on the train, like screaming and, you know, hanging out the windows. And like, that is itself really scary. So there were so many different things in this story alone that could have worked as a story on its own. So the main character is called Goro and his sister is called Mari. And his sister is randomly in this tunnel and she was like, oh, I was drawn here. And it kind of reminds me of the Enigma of the Origami Fault or something like that, where, you know, people were drawn to the human shaped holes in the mountain. This young girl, she's been like drawn to the place where their mother died. So his dad ends up going in too and disappearing. And he ends up coming across a door, the main character, Goro. And this door leads to some kind of like laboratory where people are just like trying to figure things out which I think is Junji Ito's way of being like, oh, this is like a rational thing. Whatever's happening in this tunnel can be rationally explained, right? You would think that with the appearance of these like scientists, and I didn't know what to expect, honestly, because I didn't know whether to trust them or not. They are struggling to find out what's happening in this tunnel. And there is this weird picture of the scientists where there are these like ghosts or spirits or something just zooming across the tunnel and these ghosts look terrifying. Nobody can see them. And it's just like, what's going on? Like, why are people just magically disappearing in this tunnel? There is an end to the tunnel and there's no other doors or anything to leave the tunnel. Like when you go in, you either come out the other side or, or what, you know, it's just like odd. So the climax of it is actually great. A lot of times actually Junji Ito's stories do end pretty well or they end so abruptly, it just feels so unresolved, which is the point sometimes. But this one, yeah, like his sister goes through the floor like she is sinking into the tunnel itself. And that's exactly what happens to people. They get actually sucked into the tunnel itself and they become these really terrifying, awful ghosts. Ah, oh, gosh, I'm just looking at it and it's strange. Like, yeah, it's just the way that they go into the ground too. Like they're screaming, they, they look over like the, the lady scientist, hair going through the floor. That is upsetting me. <laughs> it's so upsetting. And I love the end panel too, just so good. So yeah, I think joint favorite of this story, and there's one more as well, one more story coming up that has the same rating too. So like the more I think about tombs, the more I really do enjoy the overall story collection. So the next one is Bronze Statue. This one I gave a 6.5 out of 10. There were certain things about it. Like I think overall the story was 
good. The story was good, but there were certain things about it that really creeped me out. So essentially in this park, there are a couple of statues. One's of the former mayor and the other one is of his wife. And the former mayor was killed at the start of the story. And his wife, that's, his wife is still alive, but she doesn't look like that. She might have looked like that when she was younger, but she's definitely more beautiful in the statue form. So that's what the statue looks like. And this is what the woman looks like. And she has this creepy man who makes like these statues for her. And she's gonna unveil the newest one to her friends at a party. Although, would I call them friends? I don't think so. I don't think they really like her. But yeah, they go to her house and it's unveiled. They give the statue a lot of praise, but as soon as she's left the room, they really make their feelings known. The statue doesn't look a thing like her and the food is awful. How can it look that way when she's so ugly? You have to laugh though, ha ha ha. She can hear everything. Like the actual woman who is alive can hear everything. Maybe it's like got some kind of hearing system in it or something, but she's able to hear them. So she ends up tying the women up. This is like probably one of my worst nightmares, honestly. The guy who makes her statue, like she has an idea of burying them in plaster. So she tells him the way you cover your wax models in plaster and make your castings. So yeah, they put all of this, I guess it must be plaster or wax or something. They pour it on them as they're screaming. And like, that is just like the, uh, the worst way to go if you ask me. Like I can only imagine how awful that is to experience. What would happen if we baked this in the kiln? If we find it at a high temperature, I suppose it would make a cavity in the shape of the people inside. I, I, I can't fathom someone doing that. That is just so wrong. And they're gonna pour the concrete in. Like firstly she says bronze, but she says, oh, is there anything cheaper we could use? And he says concrete. So they, they pour concrete in and this is what comes out. Like this is their death immortalized in a statue form. Like, could you imagine being trapped like that? Like it's so trapping, which makes sense with the title of this short story collection, Tombs. It is sort of like entrapment. And it's probably like the overall theme of this short story collection in general is entrapment. This story does take a little bit of a, a strange turn, which is why I didn't give it higher. Is that the wife uncovers the body of the mayor who she dumped. And somehow like when taking off the sort of death flesh or whatever, there is this gorgeous Adonis underneath. And this Adonis statue thing seems to talk and falls in love with her statue of when she looks totally different, like that's not her. And she gets jealous of these statues that are falling in love, essentially. And she has the idea of being killed the same way as her husband, becoming a corpse wax. And in a few years, she wants the person to make the statue to dig her out and make her into a gold statue so that she can also be immortalized as a beautiful statue. Um, so he does that. However, he dies during the process of it. So she will actually forever be trapped in a, a massive hard plaster forever. And that's it. Like, like that was a bit of a, a strange turn from what happened before. I'm glad it happened. It, it did feel a little bit odd, but I'm glad it happened because I think the ending of the story with her being trapped in this case forever is another unsettling future of it. I mean, this might end up getting a higher rating later on because I do think it was very effective. The next story is called Floaters. Unfortunately, I don't think I like this one, to be honest. I gave it a 2.5 out of 10. All this really is is about like, these floating hairballs that when you touch it, it reveals like secrets of the people these hairballs have come out of. Yeah, you touch it, love you, love you, love you, I love you, Kyoko. So if you stimulate it, it talks. These are like four things that just come from people and escape. And like, obviously in the wrong hands, that could be really bad. Like if you don't want anyone to know your secrets. And we have this guy who was extremely annoying, but he was trying to collect everyone's secrets. Commentary wise, I feel like that's effective too, of somebody just trying to uncover so many other people's secrets while also having their own. And there's also like that kind of hypocritical side of things, especially when you think of this day and age on the internet, people judging others for things, but like hiding their own thing. I'm only saying that because I've been watching Swoop do a Colleen Ballinger situation documentary series. And recently there was one about Johnny Silvestri that was really messed up. And I feel like maybe there is some commentary on people who try and hide their own 
personal secrets while exposing other people for theirs, you know what I mean? But at the same time, I'm just like, it's just floating thought hairballs. And I just didn't really care for it all that much. You know, it's, yeah, there's just nothing I really took from the story that I enjoyed. The guy who's collecting all the secrets is crazy. His own thoughts end up escaping. He leaves the window open. After all this, he, he leaves the window open. I didn't close it. And he ends up killing his mother, which is obviously the secret that you, you don't want. Yeah, I just, I didn't care for it. The next one is called The Bloody Story of Shirasuna. And yeah, this is another one of my favorites from this collection. I think we had a great one at the start, a great one in like smack bang in the middle, I think as well. And then a great one to end with. I feel like this was very well paced out, this collection, because sometimes I think, was it smashed? Where I feel like, yeah, we started off strong, really dipped in the middle and then ended strong. But having like one in the middle there really helped with this collection. But yeah, the, the last story in this was so unique and again, took a direction I didn't expect. We have this doctor who goes to this random town in the middle of nowhere and he's been hired as the brand new doctor. And every person who lives in this place looks like they are on death's door. Like their faces are all sunken in and honestly, they look dead. I'm not gonna lie, they look dead. There are even children who seem to have a whole lot of blood running down them and it just all seems to them to be quite normal and I thought that either this was a village full of vampires or a village full of zombies or something like that. I, I never expected what actually came from this which is a testament to how good this story was. But yeah the doctor's trying to figure out what's happening. He thinks they're all anemic because they don't seem to have a whole lot of blood. But then as he's exploring the town, like there is a tree that's been uprooted and where the roots were, there's a large amount of blood already congealing where the tree had been ripped up. So it's like, why is there so much blood there? Like that's a bit strange. Randomly too, the people in the town look normal out of nowhere too. It's like they've kind of slowly regained their blood and gotten healthier because of that. And say the, the, the girl character from this, this story, she goes to the shrine and she invites the doctor along with her. She's like, let's pray together, come pray with me. And when she's there, she actually cuts her wrist and allows the blood to just fall into the floor. And when that happens, just like blood from her paws start to come out. Even though she didn't cut any of those places, like the blood is just sort of coming out of her. And it's so, uh, it, it, I hate blood. I, I do, I hate blood. I faint whenever I see it. <laughs> well, I guess like, if it's fake blood, I don't mind. But say when I try to do like home tests or anything like that, I'll feel faint and I'll need to lie down. And I once did faint while getting blood taken. So this makes me feel physically sick. Like I could pass out reading this story. The blood that just comes out of her seeps into the ground. So now you might know where it's going. And she again goes back to looking rather anemic, rather dead. And she just walks away. She just walks away. And the roots that are under the ground, whenever you cut them, they're like blood vessels. They bleed. So this entire town is filled with human blood. This visual here itself, where you can actually see where it looks like the ground has veins. The ground has like actual veins. And ugh, like, and you can see the people of the village, their blood is being taken. It's their sacrifice. The town takes their blood. And by the end of it as well, the doctor himself, I don't know if maybe it's because he spent enough time there. If like being in this town for a certain amount of time means that you also have to give up your blood in order to stay alive there or something. Like, ugh, it's just, ugh, I couldn't imagine. I genuinely couldn't imagine. I would pass out. I probably wouldn't wake up if I was ever in this village. And we end the story with him really fitting in with the town now. <laughs> so I guess it plays into the idea of coming to a town and being the outsider and finally fitting in. <laughs> but also giving up that blood to the actual ground itself. Oh my God, it's absolutely disgusting. So uh, yeah, eight out of 10 for that one. So I think tombs, the strange tale of the tunnel and the bloody story and one. They are my favorites from this collection. So it's great to have like three from it out of, I think there were only nine stories. I think it's great overall and that gives it a 6.06 .06 out 
out of 10. It puts it above Smashed and Venus in the Blind Spot for collections. It is still below Shiver. I think Shiver is still my favorite Junji Ito short story collection. But this one was still really, really good. And after finishing Tombs, I finished them on live reading sprints with my patrons for the Geek End Readathon that I do for my Patreon. And I ended up spinning the wheel. I'll shuffle it a couple of times just to make sure. I want to get you the Mackie because I want to see what you think of it before I do it. <laughs> Oh, oh, it's not going to smack, but it was close. Oh. No, and that's good because it's short. Ramina. Yeah, this, one, this one's short, so okay. I'm kind of glad about that. So Ramina is the next story that I read, and let me tell you, again, like, I am scared of deep space. I am scared of what could possibly happen, and Ramina Ramina. I feel like the actual title of this is Hellstar Remina. I think that's actually what it's called. But this one, oh my god, it's so good. However, I don't think it kept that goodness all the way through, so unfortunately it did affect the overall enjoyment of this, because I thought this would have been near perfection until I think maybe about three quarters of the way through when I was starting to be like, hmm, mm, it's a little bit ridiculous now, but it does make up for it with the ending. So in this one there is Dr. Oguro, and he discovers a very distant planet, which he names after his daughter, Remina, Remina, Remina. And because he's discovered this planet, he's instantly become famous, his daughter is now famous, and she is catapulted into being a star herself. I feel like there are some great themes on stardom, and the way that people can turn on anyone at any given moment. Even if someone has been idolized and made into a star, people can tear you down so easily too. So like this one, it just start off with Remina almost like being burned at the stake. Well, not burned at the stake, but like crucified. It started off so intriguing. It was like, kill Remina. And there is the this huge eye above her too. And by starting this way, this is so intriguing, like what's happened here? And then we flash back to how we got to that point. It is a great storytelling tactic by Junji Ito, especially with like the creepiness and the impending dread that you feel throughout the story. But what they start to notice is, just over time, over a little period of time, is that Remina, the planet, is eating up other planets in its path. So these stars and these planets are just blinking out because Remina is eating them. And what's even more terrifying is the Remina on the monitor is 16 light years away. The place it's at in this view would take 16 light years to reach. In other words, we're seeing where the planet was years ago. It started moving towards the solar system 16 years ago. The fact that it's approaching at nearly the speed of light means that as we're looking at this light, Remina is already in our solar system. I'm sorry, but that is terrifying. Uh... I feel like if this story didn't go on as long as it did, and I do really want like longer form stories from Junji Ito, I just think there was a period in this story that made it less enjoyable for me and like took away some of that fear that I had. And I was like, okay, that's like a bit too ridiculous. I'll explain why. But the idea of something coming our way that we have no way of stopping, it takes the control away from humans, doesn't it? And it's like, we're sitting here and we can't do anything to save ourselves. And the idea that a planet is on its way, like one of my worst fears is the earth being sucked into the sun. I'm not gonna lie, like that's one of my worst fears. And one day I know that everything will end, you know, the earth will end. I've had many a night where I've been awake until five, six, seven o'clock in the morning watching YouTube videos of people explaining the end of the world or the solar system, even like how the world formed. You know, I'm very interested in, you know, deep space and the history of the planet and the future of the planet. I'm very interested, but genuinely terrified by it at the same time. And so the idea of the Earth ending, honestly, it fills me with existential dread. It really does. I know I don't have to worry about it myself because it won't happen in my lifetime, but knowing that it will happen in a lifetime, in someone's lifetime, and even if we're all gone by then, it will still happen eventually, you know? It's like, ah, uh, uh, I don't even want to talk about it because I'll end up going down a rabbit hole. And this is why I don't read sci-fi that much because it does make me feel insignificant in the world. And it makes me feel like 
it just makes me feel awful, okay? And this moment was just like such a heart-dropping moment. The idea that Remina is on its way to Earth. So all of the people who bolstered Remina the human up, who the planet was named after, they all think that by sacrificing Remina, it will stop the planet from coming towards them. And that mob mentality, that panic of self-preservation, again, like speaks volumes on what happens online a lot of the time, you know? It's like our society itself, when we kind of catapult someone into stardom, like they did with Remina, just to tear her down out of self-preservation, you know? It's, there's a lot of stuff to explore on this. I would love to do a dedicated video on Remina because I, I wanted to give this like a 10 out of 10 at one point, I really did. I was like, this is my worst fear come to life. So they're gonna sacrifice the doctor, her dad and Remina together to stop Remina and then, oh my God, like it's, it's Remina. It's like, it's it's almost there. I'm just looking outside at the sky now and I'm just like, if, if a huge planet just suddenly appeared ready to destroy the earth, oh, what do you do? So I love the hopelessness that this portrayed, but the desperation that humans go to, like the lengths that humans go to, to preserve themselves, to save themselves. Oh my God, look at that. It's just like this huge monster planet has this massive eye. It has a tongue that comes out and devours planets, which again, like it sounds strange, but who knows, maybe there is a planet out there that has a massive eye and a massive tongue, you know? It's like there's so much out there that we don't know. Was it even confirmed recently that there are definitely aliens? I believe in aliens. I believe there is definitely life out there. We're not the only ones in this solar system or the universe. Come on, we can't be that full of ourselves. But yeah, there is this desperate race of Remina and some of her fans to get her away from them. There is also like a tragic love story involved in that too. That was good, but not really my favorite thing on it. This is what Remina's planet looks like. It looks uninhabitable, but they do say this and they think that they are beings and that they're waving at them. So they think that they could potentially land on Remina. But it's honestly so dumb. I don't think any scientist in the real world would even suggest that when you see the hellish landscape of it, like the atmosphere is a breathable, but the desperate escape was like so incredible. Oh, like, oh, oh my God. I would hate it. Honestly, absolutely hate it. It destroys the moon with its tongue. Charlie the earth would feel the effects of the moon getting destroyed, right? So I don't think we really explored that at all. It's only when Remina comes down to the earth and is like so close that it's affecting our gravity, that it affects the Earth. So by destroying the moon, nothing happened, which I don't think would actually be true in, in real life. But I'm not trying to make this believable at all. Like the whole thing is of course unbelievable, but at the same time, it could probably happen. You just never know, never say never. There are some like rich people who are, who well, they kick Remina out of their home. Their son takes her there because they're like, get her away from us, she is cursed and they're trying to kill her, like get her away from us. And the boy who helped her is in love with her, but she doesn't love him. So he is like a man scorned essentially. And even at one point he tries to SA her and it's just absolutely disgusting. And he's a disgusting person, but him and his parents are mega rich and they do get a, well, I'll talk about them now before I get back to Remina herself. The family get a flight, a spaceship to Remina, which you just know, like if the world was ending, all the people in power, all the rich people would definitely be like, fuck you guys, we're out. You know what I mean? I, I don't think they would even care about the civilians. And this is kind of like what that's exploring a little bit. One of their sons is an astronaut. That's another reason why they are able to do this, but they do land on Remina. I would love a story set in Remina. Honestly, like the entire thing set on Remina. But they find somebody who was on the planet before to scope the place out earlier in the story, who was injured. They take off his helmet and obviously the atmosphere is not breathable. So he just dies awfully. It almost looks like he gets liquefied. So now this horrible, awful family are trapped on Remina without being able to breathe. So that happened like a little bit later. So that was when it was like starting to get good again. But however, it was sandwiched in between stuff that I wasn't really loving. So I liked that Remina managed to escape and ran into a homeless guy who ends up helping her. Oh, like this is so weird. Like I wish this wasn't included because it really did affect my rating on it. But essentially Remina the planet has spun the earth so that everyone is like 
flying through the air around the, the whole planet of Earth? Because the Earth's spinning, right? Everyone's just flying. And this is because Remina's gravity has mashed in with Earth's gravity to make this really weird non-gravity situation on Earth. But like, they're just all flying in the air, going after Remina as well, like all the people who were trying to kill her. And they're just all like flying and just like, some of them are screaming, they're like, wait, what's going on? Just around the Earth. I, I just, I can't take that seriously. It looks stupid, honestly. Like, I think it looks absolutely ridiculous. That just wouldn't even happen, would it? Like, even if we lost gravity, like, in the Earth was spinning, would we really be, like, flying so perfectly around the globe? Like, to the fact that they end up getting back to the original place where they were at the start of the story. Like, they just made a full trip around the Earth in the air. And that just... It took away so much of the scariness of this story and just made it absolutely ridiculous. And there is, like, that masked guy who is trying to kill Remina himself who has been after her for a while now. I loved when we did go back to Remina the planet and they end up coming across another guy who came to the planet earlier to scope it out. And this was so weird and scary. One of my favorite parts of the story when they say that, like, what's he turned into? Like, what is that? It comes out of the actual astronaut suit. What was it? And like, obviously they're terrified by it. And just what do you do then? It's like the people on Earth are trapped, the people on Remina are trapped. So Remina the human, the homeless guy, and some children they saw, end up finding a safe place to go. Oh, and the masked man turns out to be one of the people from her fan club who she didn't reciprocate his feelings for. Again, I, I just didn't really care a whole lot about that side of it. But yeah, they find a safe place and Earth gets eaten in the end. Remina manages to eat Earth. And it's gone. Remina the human, the homeless guy, and some children did manage to escape. So at least it ends with a little bit of hope. But I just feel like it would have been so much better without the whole like flying through the air crap nonsense stuff that happened. Because seriously, I really did think it took away from the overall vibe of the story. The overall tone of the story was lessened because of it. Can we keep the tone consistent, please? I did find that bizarre. But I did end up giving this a 7.5 out of 10. I would have preferred this over Guillaume 100% until we got to some of the ridiculous parts of the later half of the story. Well, actually, I don't know. Like, do I prefer Guillaume over Remina? Like, I already feel like my rating system is already quite crap. So I, again, I might end up changing things later on. At the minute, my gut instinct is 7.5 out of 10. Honestly, at one point, this would have been a 9 out of 10. Um, watch a beat for me. Surely you won't land on the black one. You. You would think. Love sickness. Okay. Perfect. Now I don't have my stress and anxiety from this past weekend affecting me. I can just dive straight into this now. I am so excited. I haven't read it yet. And this is what I'm going to spend today doing. Mm, it's going to be bliss. I didn't actually realize that the first five short stories in this are actually part of one big story, lovesickness. That is the first section of the book. I should have probably guessed that from the contents page. So you have lovesickness and it has the five chapters. After that, it is the strange Hikazuri siblings, which had two chapters and then three different random short one shots. But let me tell you, I freaking loved the lovesickness story. And yeah, I did give each of the five chapters different reigns, but I think it's gonna be really hard to talk about just specific chapters because some of them were a little bit, well, not a lot happened in some of the chapters. And I just think it's probably best to just talk about it as a whole. But I will put on the screen exactly what I rated each chapter because it still kind of averages out and it does help me average out the entire volume. And yeah, there were two chapters in this that really stood out. So essentially this is set in a town that is extremely foggy and people wait at crossroads. Uh, just like a random different sections of this little town. So it can mean like a crossroad is in like alleyways, like if there's like the, the crossroads thing. I know what I'm thinking of like supernatural. I remember there was a crossroads demon. It's not exactly like that in terms of a road, 
like a crossroads and like an alleyway is the essential plot of this and young girls or anyone really can wait at a crossroads for the first stranger to pass them and the person who's waiting asks the stranger for their fortune to be told. So it's like this whole crossroads fortune telling thing craze that's happening in this town and the stranger even though they don't know who they are they just give them a fortune so like the person who's waiting can be like what's my love life going to be like and the stranger can say if you work hard enough you will find the love of your life you know like they can really say anything and it can really dictate how you go about achieving whatever it is you asked for but it's a lot more sinister than that because our main character when he was younger he had a encounter at a crossroads where a woman who was pregnant asked him for her fortune and at the time him just being a young child he was in a bad mood so even though this woman says you know i'm pregnant with a guy's child he's married but i love him what should i do will my boyfriend and i live happily ever after and he says not a chance dummy and runs away and then the next day her body is found and she has taken her own life. This volume is very heavy on suicide. Let me tell you, it gets so much worse than just that instance because there is this boy, this beautiful boy at the crossroads and it, he's on the cover as well, but I'm not gonna lie, I thought that was a woman. I thought that was a woman on the cover. Kind of looks like a woman on the cover, but actually in this story, he does look like a, a boy at the crossroads. In this boy at the crossroads, he is giving people negative fortunes and it's causing young girls who asked for the fortune to take their life. And honestly, it gets so messed up. But the person who loves the main character who gave that woman a bad fortune when he was younger, the girl who loves him, that was his aunt. So he's keeping this a secret. And there are so many great things about like parallels between this boy who is our main character and the boy at the crossroads, the beautiful boy at the crossroads, because he is now giving these bad fortunes, causing people to take their own lives when they think that they will never find love, essentially. And it's just so incredibly creepy. The first chapter I gave an 8.5 because I thought it was like an incredibly atmospheric, spooky kind of story and people can take the fortunes anyway and I think that's like such a really great concept too and I would love to see this adapted I don't know if it has been but the fact that this was five chapters I think it's about 200 pages or just over 200 pages is just absolutely incredible yeah it's like 244 pages like this could have been its own book you know, I think this is probably longer than Remina, maybe. I think this would be amazing adapted. Ryusuke, I think, is the main boy character. The girl who loves Ryusuke is called Midori, and the best friend is Suzu, I think. And Midori, yeah, she loves Ryusuke. And the best friend, she gets her fortune where she asks about her friend uh, being happy. But the beautiful boy at the crossroads says, worry about your own heart first. And this leads her to declare her love for Ryusuke. Which, honestly, it takes the life out of her. Like, she looks like she's all sunken in, like she hasn't slept. She becomes obsessed, absolutely obsessed. And he has to, like, reject her and be like, no, I, I, I don't love you. Like, stop this. This is madness. It does end up leading to her taking her own life. And it's so brutal, rather graphic as well. There are ghosts that appear of the people who have taken their lives because it's like an epidemic right now. The people who are asking for fortunes and getting bad ones from the beautiful boy at the crossroads are taking their own lives. And then their ghosts are appearing and they have these awful like slashed throats and you see it all. It's like so visceral. I don't really want to show very much of it. And I don't even think I really can. I think YouTube would probably be like, uh, absolutely not. But this is the kind of story that really did get under my skin because again, like they don't really have that much control over their bodies. Like as soon as they get this fortune, it seems like they're possessed. Even Midori at a later part of the story in one of the later chapters, she ends up becoming hate-filled because of the fortune that the beautiful boy tells her. And he tells her, you're gonna have hate for him for the rest of your life. So she ends up taking her own life so that she's like, yeah, I've hated you until the end of my life and now it's the end of my life and dies so that she can stop hating Ryusuke. And it's just so awful. You know what I mean? It's just, this is the kind of story that really does disturb me. Oh yeah, I'm not gonna show that. But also, yeah, even the ghost of the friend, Suzu, uh, she 
also is a ghost and she still says, I love you, I love you so much I could die. And these awful images of these ghosts appearing in the fog at these crossroads, you don't really know what's going on, is so great. Another great part of this story too is that the main character Ryusuke is being accused of being the beautiful boy in the darkness and it ties back to the guilt he felt when he was a child and he gave the negative fortune leading to that woman to take her life. And like there are some other things about like the person who got her pregnant ends up coming into it at some point too. And I found that just like brilliantly linked. And I just think like this is such a well-crafted, you know, it has a beginning, middle and end kind of story. I thought it was really brilliant. It's probably like my, is it my favorite? I think it's probably my favorite story so far in terms of if I just look at Love Sickness is in the five chapters and not the volume as a whole, I would probably rank it above Gyo. I mean, there are other short stories that I've preferred, like the Fault of the, you know, the, the Enigma of the Amagora Fault one and the Hanging Balloons, I probably do prefer over this, but like this would be like a solid 8.5 for just those five chapters alone, even though I gave some of the chapters like a 7.5, a 5 out of a 10. Overall, I think for me, it, it was so enjoyable. I love the fact that I had a beginning, middle and end and just so incredibly creepy with like the ghosts that appear. And you know, there are other storylines too, even like this is such a meaty story where there are other storylines. There is somebody else who asks for a fortune from the two main characters and the person who asks for the fortune ends up like kind of stalking them and badgering them and won't leave them alone. And she herself ends up killing someone. And it's just like a whole mindfuck of stuff that happens. And it's so mysterious and I just loved it all. Like, yeah, her. She, uh, she needs a fortune and she just becomes obsessed. And that's what happens. These people become obsessed. It was so gripping, honestly. I really enjoyed the first five chapters. And it's actually when, because I think chapter one and four were my favorites. It's when, like my, I think my favorite part overall, for context for my favorite part, all of these young girls at the school and even just the people who are at the crossroads, they follow Ryusuke and they think he is a beautiful boy. They're obsessed with a beautiful boy. They're like, I love you so much, I could die. You know, they are genuinely so lovesick. <laughs> they are lovesick for the beautiful boy at the crossroads. And when they realize that he isn't the beautiful boy, they're disappointed. They're like, wait, hang on, he is wearing black. And then they do end up going to the beautiful boy. Like, have you seen how many people there are? Have you seen how many young girls there are that are obsessed with the beautiful boy in the darkness? There are so many of them. So many, I think there's around 200, I think that's what they said. And then they literally say, I love you so much, I could die. And then the beautiful boy in the darkness says, then die. And then just without question, they have a box cutter with them. That's like how they've been taking their lives. And they just do it. And like, there's that much blood, the fog turns red. Whoa. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's so disgustingly disturbing that somebody could do that. It's like the infatuation with somebody, almost like a cult leader. I'm pretty sure there was, um, I can't remember the name of it, but it was an, on a true crime uh, thing that I've watched a while back about a cult leader who got all of their followers to take their lives. And I think it's kind of a, a pretty similar thing where someone has that much power over people that they abuse it. But also at this point too, we're like, who is this boy in the darkness? It's just, oh yeah, then you see all of the bodies that are dead and just like, stuff like that really unsettles me. So yeah, the main character does try and take the beautiful boy at the crossroads down. I will say one thing I'm not the biggest fan of is like the final chapter, because I think it just, it wraps up too quickly and a bit too nicely for me. The main character, I believe he died at the end of the fourth chapter. So he is now like the boy in white and he is giving people good fortunes and trying to help counterbalance the darkness that the beautiful boy is doing. And he's getting other people to do that too, which is beautiful actually. It's like a beautiful message of sharing that positivity and sharing the the light. You know, it's, it's like a joint effort almost. Ugh, and it's just, ugh, like these are what 
some of the ghosts and spirits look like and it's just bleh. like the body horror is genuinely gross and i don't fully love the gross like the really outwardly gross junji ito stories i feel like yeah that moment is great but overall sometimes the stories lack for me but this one is just it has it all it has the body horror it has the really tight plot I, it just i think it's great but yeah as i say i do think the end is let down a little bit because literally just kind of just confronts the beautiful boy and they disappear that's pretty much it i mean it's touching though it's very touching and tragic at the same time he's telling all of these girls these spirits who are saying i, I love you so much i could die he is telling them love him give him your love love him and that's when they all sort of disappear and even the beautiful boy at crossroads disappears it's almost like he needed love too maybe or like this is the the manifestation of the main character's guilt from what he did as a child. It's like there are so many different avenues you could take with it that any kind of theory would be correct. It's so good. It is so good. And it is nice every now and then to have a really uplifting ending for a Junji Ito story. I just think it happened too quickly. You know, after like four intense chapters of build-up, and horror it kind of fizzled out for me i think by chapter five but you know what i don't begrudge it i still love the story and then the next two chapters of this collection are also connected so it's the strange hikazuri siblings the first one's called narumi's boyfriend and the second one is called the seance now i did prefer the first story over the second story and again i will put the ratings for both of them up on the screen i will just talk about both of them at the same time but yeah uh there is this family they are orphaned and it's i think is it three three sisters three brothers and one of the sisters is beautiful she's called narumi the rest of her family are like not i don't want to say ugly i don't want to be judgmental but they are disturbing they are creepy looking like out of all of them narumi is definitely the one who looks the most regular i guess so there are six of them and it looks like narumi is trying to get away from her family and there's like a lot of again talk about taking their own life and manipulation there too but she is found by her family and it looks like she doesn't want to return to them like that's the whole premise of the story is that narumi has found a boyfriend who it seems like she loves and she is trying to get away from her family but they take her back they sort of kidnap her and it looks like she sets herself on fire right so the family seem devastated and they get the boyfriend to come to see her body but then they force him to lie with this corpse this burned corpse and he is yeah he's mortified by it yeah they're saying if you loved her you will do it this is the only way you'll be forgiven and then he kind of runs away he's trapped in the house he runs away and yeah it looks like he might have seen the ghost of narumi but no it turns out that narumi is alive like this is all a big prank and the boyfriend ends up dying of a heart attack it's a sick joke but it seems so intentional like they purposefully wanted him to die and narumi was in on it so that was like a good little twist i quite like that because the siblings are just so strange and peculiar the seance story itself too it does it totally change it i guess it's almost like a one shot in itself just with the same characters of the siblings again living together the oldest pretends he goes to work and he catches someone who takes photographs and she says that she takes photos of souls and spirits so he says oh do you want to come to mine we're going to do a seance because they want to talk to their parents who had died and so at the seance the second eldest son who has been abused by the eldest son he seems to be possessed by the father like he spews out what they think is ectoplasm which is again absolutely disgusting it makes me feel sick right now actually he pretends to be the father like the spirit of the father so that he can become head of the house and sort of kick the eldest brother out it's like very family drama more than like any kind of horror but yeah they do find out that it was just all a prank again so i guess yeah this one i didn't enjoy as much as the first one and i don't love the two stories together as much as love sickness because i do think this was just like about a very disturbed family that love pulling pranks they hate one another really like they just do not seem to be very 
loving at all. Like, they pretty much abuse one another too. They're messed up. They're not monsters in the literal sense. I mean, we had the beautiful boy at the crossroads in the first story. He was a monster. He was a ghosty figure. So, yeah, technically, in the literal sense of the word, a monster. Whereas they are just, like, human. You know, this family are human, which is just as sinister and scary, honestly. But again, I wasn't really that taken by it. Then we get into the mansion of Phantom Pain. And again, I really enjoyed the idea behind this one. I ended up giving this one a seven out of 10. I thought it was very good. Essentially, we have this guy who becomes a living at this house that has windows bricked up. And inside is this young boy who is constantly in pain. He has phantom pain. But the thing is though, he has all of his limbs. The phantom pain is like in the house. So he is hurting and he's like, oh, it's in the other room in the closet. And they have hired these workers, like their parents have hired these workers to help ease the pain or like scratch the air or something in this closet to get rid of the pain from this young boy and like they constantly have to do this they have to like find out where the pain is coming from like on this boy in the house and they have to find it in the house and ease the pain but the thing is though now they're bricked in and the pain seems to be affecting them too like the main character who comes in becomes very sensitive to pain whereas the workers the other workers who have been there a while they do get injuries, but they don't get treated or anything like that. So they start to die because they succumb to their injuries. But it means that there is this awful stench in the house too, and it's disgusting. It just leads to some craziness with the characters. Like they become a little bit crazy and they act irrationally because of it. Like they're trapped in this house. They can't escape it. And this whole phantom pain stuff is just odd in itself. Like the story does take a turn so much that it looks like the main character by the end of it is the one who adopts the phantom pain. And I do love the way it ends with all of that like spewing out from him. It's like, what? But I, I've never heard of a story where someone has a phantom pain that wasn't on their body or like even near their body. Like obviously, yeah, if you have a phantom pain, usually it's from people who have lost a limb and you know, they still think that they have that limb and there's like a pain there and it's just, yeah, it, it's like that, but amplified. I love the idea, it's so good. Then we get to The Rib Woman, which I think was a little bit of a missed opportunity. I didn't love this one as much as I wanted to, so I gave it a 5 out of 10. Essentially, there is this, well, the main character, she's very self-conscious of her body. She doesn't think she has, like, any curves. So there is this, like, idea of going to get some of your ribs removed from this doctor. And the main character, her brother's girlfriend, she can hear this song, this, this music that nobody else can really hear but then the main character does start hearing it. But it turns out there is like this woman who was playing a, a rib, like a harp, but that was the main character's brother's girlfriend's rib, you know, that was removed from surgery. And it's honestly so disgustingly crazy. And she does start to get painfully obsessed with the sound that's coming from this rib. So that the brother's girlfriend, she tries to find the music again. She disappears and she is found without her ribs, which disgusting and I don't understand why after all of this the main character she still goes ahead with getting her rib removed especially when she's lying there like this is so strange sometimes I love when Junji Ito explains backstory but I think it was so forced in this like the exposition was so unnatural like why would this doctor tell this patient everything like the whole exposition. You'll be the third person I performed the surgery on. I did two before you. The second that is the one before you, it was actually Ruriko whose ravaged body they found the other day. So the one without the ribs taken out. He's saying, oh yeah, I worked on her just before you. I'm just like, why are you telling her that? The surgery went extremely well, but the very first woman was difficult. She had psychological issues. I also bear responsibility. She wasn't pleased with the results. Eventually she came back asking for further surgery. She said if I took out another one on each side she would feel better and he kept doing that until she had no ribs essentially. And why would you tell this to her? Why would you tell this to the patient? It just, I know like we need it as a reader at, for exposition, but it just felt like such an unnatural way of saying this story. 
to her. I don't know, it just felt odd. She does get the surgery, but that means that she starts to hear the music that is being played from this woman with the rib that turns out to be her rib. And yeah, the rib woman has the ribs of the girl who died before. It is horrific. But all the same, I just don't think this story really got to me the way that the other stories did. I think I was kind of spoiled at the start of the book with the greatness that was Love Sickness. I thought it was so good. So I've ended up changing my rating for The Rib Woman from five out of 10 to six out of 10. Like it is messed up, but I think the idea is more scarier than the actual story was that was presented to me. Okay, the last one from this collection, it's like four pages. It's called Memories of Real Poop. And I think this is a troll. I think this is an actual troll story that I feel bad giving a one out of 10 because I think it's just Junji Ito telling this really stupid, funny story. And I think it's probably autobiographical too because he's talking about when he was still a boy and he saw at a market there was literal shit for sale and he regrets not buying this shit. He's talking about how it was a surprisingly real rubber poop. Poop at the time was generally known to be coiled, but this poop was made up of two logs. They were positioned with exquisite balance. The color was also fresh and they were set just so on this fancy tissue paper. And he wants it, but he's embarrassed to buy it so he doesn't. But then he tells his mum, mum, I wanted that poop. And she just says, buy it. <laughs> All right, I'm buying it. So he goes back, he buys the poop, and then he uses it to prank his aunt. And like, it, I feel like, yeah, okay, good times. I can relate. I'm sure I did buy fake poo when I was a child and thought it was the best thing in the world and pranked someone with it. But at the same time, you know, time and place and you did it at my birthday dinner. It felt so out of place and odd to be closing out what was a really great collection. And it does like let it down that it was there. I think if it had been further back, like if it had been as a sort of, like maybe after the about the author section, so I knew that it wasn't really part of the rest of the stories, then I probably wouldn't even include it in this but it is included in the table of contents. It's an official story in this, but it's just so, I, I don't even know what, what to say about it. It's just a boy buying fake shit in a, in a market. So unfortunately like my least favorite of the Junji, it's not even a horror story. I mean, it's probably horrific for the person who gets pranked, but it's, it, it's so out of place. So without including memories of real poop in the average, the Love Sickness collection gets a 6.56 average out of 10, which I'm really happy with. I need to spin the wheel to see what I've got next. I'm hoping for a short one. Right, let's do this. Go on to Southern Classroom, come on. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it'll look short but that could be deceiving. It's honestly odd to say that I'm having such a cozy night reading Junji Ito. I wouldn't put cozy and Junji Ito in the same sentence, never. But I'm having like the coziest time. Got some Halloween ambience on the telly. And this was like a really good collection too. And it's a little bit reminiscent of how love sickness had a recurring element to it by having the first five stories as part of a bigger narrative. In Dissolving Classroom, apart from the final two stories in this, this collection was pretty much about two of the main characters who are on the cover here. We have Yuma, who is the big brother, and Shizumi, who is the younger sister, and they are orphaned. And they go from place to place wreaking havoc and it's so interesting because I didn't read the summary of this first, so I didn't really know what to expect going into it in terms of the dynamic between the brother and the sister, but the brother is, well, what he can do. So he apologizes profusely to people and eventually their brains start to melt. 
Oh yeah, so in the first story to solve in classroom, and he does it throughout the entire story, but in the first chapter we are introduced to the idea that whenever Yuma apologizes to people, and he apologizes all the time, just non-stop, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, it's my fault, I'm so sorry. Even if he hasn't done anything right there and then, he's just apologizing, and eventually it does melt the brains of the people he's apologizing to. And in the first story, he is a new student somewhere, and there is a girl character who ends up taking pity on him and she even starts apologizing too after his little sister is like, I want your brains, I want your brains and causes a car accident for her. And she is so nice, like she even tries to help and befriend him and stop him from being bullied. But then yeah, pretty much everyone in the school, just one morning, their brains just start melting. And that girl does end up escaping barely with her life. And she does come back in a later chapter too, which I thought was really cool. But after the encounter, some of her brain has melted and she isn't quite the same. And she is struggling to speak and to move properly. So like, that was very interesting. And to see the consequences of something happening in the first chapter continuing through, that was pretty cool. But just the whole imagery of like all the students falling with all the brains coming out. But also I noticed something, these bullies, right? when they collapse, he has just put his hand on his arse. Like, as they collapse, it's just like, okay, let's copper feel as we die. So I'm just like, was there a story there? But yeah, she manages to just escape. And it's it's disgusting graphics. In fact, one of the reasons why I really enjoy this story is because I think the cover is absolutely awesome. And it does turn out that Yume, well, actually, first red flags when he was talking to the girl who escaped, when he said, oh, I used to kill small animals when I was younger, and now he just apologizes all the time. That isn't the full story, but even just hearing, oh, I killed small animals as a child, huge red flag, serial killer right there, serial killer. The Junji Ito characters are never really all that smart, to be honest, but you know, it's still endearing that the girl character in this was very, well, she reached out to him and she was a little bit protective even though he is essentially the devil. Well, he's not the devil, but whenever he apologizes, he's apologizing to the devil. And it was absolutely sick as well to say the, the skulls of his parents. Like, that is genuinely upsetting. And I thought after this, because the second story, Dissolving Beauty, was the same kind of premise, but instead it is Yume and he is given compliments instead. So the main character in this story, Mio, she meets up with her old friend Mako, but Mako is so different. Her face has changed a lot. It looks ugly. And she's like, why? Why do you look so ugly? Well, she doesn't say that outright, but she notices the change. In Yume, her boyfriend, is non-stop complimenting her, saying you're the most beautiful person, you are gorgeous, sexy, amazing. Not exactly sexy, but like he says pretty as always. And it's the compliments that make them turn ugly. And so he ends up focusing his attention on Neo and he says, your beauty is exceptional. And then they end up getting together. So Mako ends up dying. He is profusely apologizing to her. So obviously like she must have melted, her brain must have melted. But then you start to see a change in Neo. So she starts to look like this. And she doesn't even really realize it because his compliments are giving her hope that she is the most beautiful person in the world. And again, this is sort of all for the devil. Ever since he summoned the devil when he was little, he's been super busy apologizing to it and praising it. So he's actually praising the devil when that's happening and it's not actually her, she's just in the way. And it's some sort of like, what is it, like electromagnetic wave? between him and the devil, so anyone caught in the middle gets the brains melted or their face wrecked. It's honestly so odd because Shizumi, his little sister, she is the one who's like outwardly terrorizing. She is the one who's like outwardly crazy. And Yume is the one who's so polite and nice. And he is the one who is the devil, well, talking to the devil, conversing with the devil, but he is like a devil on earth by melting people's brains. And it's like, I, I don't know how to take him, like he's so annoying, like seriously annoying because it's so hard to put into words his character because he seems so apologetic, like genuinely, but he just keeps doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it and so many people are dying because of him. It's, he's just so annoying. <laughs> I really enjoyed this panel here when he's praising Neo again, but the devil is right behind her, but then bless her at the end. Ugh. Oh, that's awful. 
to solve an apartment was the third story. They just move again to an apartment building. And this one had the introduction of the parents actually. Um, so he is able to bring them back, even though they're dead, like through their skulls or the heads that he's preserved, and he gets them to come back to life and starts the process all over again of like melting them, bringing them back to life and stuff. The apartment building, the people in the apartment building, are affected by it. So essentially it's like kind of pretty much the same instance of what happened in the first two stories. They get apologised to a lot. They try to explain what's going on, but it's like so weird. And I do feel bad because, you know, they are just normal people and they want to help. And they think that the parents are abusing their children, but the parents are, are dead even though they're there. They're actually dead. I, I feel like I'm repeating myself here, but it is just odd. And it's just so desolate by the end of it too, when they all just like die. <laughs> it's it's honestly, uh, it's it's bleak. It's very bleak, but I enjoyed it. The fourth one is Shizumi in Love. And this one is a little bit different because the focus, the main focus on this one is Shizumi. And she does end up liking this random boy she meets. Like she licks his face, which is again, very grim, don't do that. But they decide to kidnap him and she wants to be his like girlfriend forever. And that is, I, I mean, at least she's tried. At least she's really tried to doll herself up for him. Like, I do feel like he should have appreciated it a bit more than he did. I mean, I know they just killed his parents and he was being held against his will, but she made some effort, you know? She made some effort. By this point, I was kind of rooting for Shizumi to get a boyfriend, settle down, and, like, stop being weird. But, uh, no, the, the boy does end up escaping, which is good. And also, the slime, the brain slime and stuff, they've got bottled up. And it can sort of talk and it kind of haunts Yuma and Shizumi from here on out, which I think was so good. It was, it was good. It was good. Interview with the Devil is the fifth and final story with those two siblings. And it has the girl from the first one who had some of her brain melted. She goes back. She can actually locate him because of the partial melting of her brain, it's almost like she now has this like connection with Yuma so she can find out where he is. So this one I enjoyed more than the previous two stories because the plot line was really ramping up. The media was getting involved and you know, there was a journalist going after him and it just felt like we were getting to a really desperate resolution for the two main characters. Like they were running scared, they didn't know what to do. Also I'd get rid of the parents' skulls too, which was great. But then they end up turning themselves in and they end up doing a press conference in front of the whole world. I'm so very, very sorry. I regret it from the bottom of my heart. And obviously everyone who's watching, they have their brains melting. And the poor girl from the first one, I was rooting for her, I was really hoping she'd survive. She's been taken there by the journalist who took her to the house in the first place. Turns out he is the devil, I think, because he like transforms into this monster. I don't know if it's partially in her mind or if he was actually the devil all along. She ends up becoming brain juice. Ugh, it's so awful. But it seems like at the end he gets his comeuppance when all of the brain juice and the, I guess the souls of the people who they've killed comes back for them. At the end, the devil always wins. And I love that bleak ending of it. So I really enjoyed that story. Very odd. It's <laughs> just the whole thing was odd. So then there are two really small stories after this. I am really talking just six pages each. And the first one is of a man who, I think it's either his wife, his girlfriend, his fiance. I don't really fully know, but she dies in hospital and she says, I'll come back to you, I will. And he is looking everywhere for her because he thinks that she's going to be reincarnated. So he's looking around. And then there is a random like meteorite and there were human remains in the meteorite. There's the engagement ring in the remains. So the idea that maybe after death, we are in meteorites in the sky, like in space, like floating in space kind of thing. Like that's where our bodies go or like our souls go. And I think that's like a really interesting concept actually. I do wish we explored that a bit more, but because it's such a short story, it's really hard to read. I gave it a five out of 10. I love the concept. I just wish we got more. A, a good idea, I think. 
The last story I think was a little better as well, uh, Children of the Earth, which I gave a 6 out of 10. This one is like a whole bunch of middle schoolers disappear on a school trip and the parents go out looking for them. They find them in this like muddy place. And when they try to take them out, their bodies sort of stretch, but they can't get them out. And then they let go and they go down the hall. And to this day, which I think is the reason why I gave it a six out of 10 and what unsettled me, yeah, the holes went deep into the earth. The children were never found again, even though they went down that hole and yet they were never found again. Like that's fucked up. That's a little bit scary. Like where does that actually go? It, again, it reminds me a little bit of the enigma of the origami fault story just very very bizarre that ending and just like how why how did this even happen you know what i mean like i'm left with so many intriguing questions but also just the imagery of these stretched bodies they look like worms almost it's like the children are now worms and they're going into the ground like how worms kind of burrow their way through do worms burrow I don't think they burrow exactly. I think that's rabbits. But they go into the ground, leaving their holes behind kind of thing. It's just... Uh, body horror. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, oh, it's it's awful. But also just awful the fact that this is all children. Like, breaks my heart. It does. It breaks my heart. So overall, the volume gets a 6.36. I think because it had quite few stories in it, that kind of helped the overall rating and puts it above are the collections that have more stories. So I do want to read another Jinji Ito book tonight. And I really do want it to be Uzumaki. I want it to be Uzumaki because I'm planning on staying up for quite some time now. And I feel ready for it. I want to read it so bad. Watch me have these really high expectations for it and be disappointed. I, I don't think that'll be the case, but my expectations are very high at this point. Spin that wheel. Ah, <gasps> shut the front door, is that Uzumaki? I can't tell. <gasps> I was never saying I really fancy this one. Like, what? That's insane. That's insane. That is, I'm so happy, but look, proof. Proof that I got Uzumaki. <sighs> I get to read Uzumaki. It's time. And you know what, I'm ready for it. I'm absolutely ready for it. I'm done. I, I finished Uzumaki this morning. Well, firstly, let me just say, I think by the halfway point, I think I was going to give this a 10 out of 10. And you know what? In some ways, I still think it is. But by the end of it, I feel like the, the second half of this didn't really captivate me all that much. I think it lost me a little bit after a certain point. So I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10, which I still think is fantastic. But I just don't want you guys to hate me because I didn't fully... 10 out of 10, love it. Oh my gosh, like so many different crazy, gory, nasty, intriguing things happened during this. And it makes me a bit sad because I genuinely wanted to give it a 10. And even when I finished it, I was still like, should I just give it a 10 anyway? Because I really adored the first half of this book. But you know, I just feel like in good conscience, I don't think I could give it that perfect score because I don't think it's quite perfect. And I know, who am I? Who am I? to say that when I am literally reading Junji Ito for the first time. Maybe upon reread, maybe in hindsight, I might end up thinking, yeah, actually this is perfect. This is the best Junji Ito book I've ever read. I think as soon as we started with the row houses, when the main female protagonist went there the first time with her family, and I think from that point onward, 
was when I started to really lose interest, which is so, like, I, I hate saying that, I really do. And I don't think I loved the ending either. And also, yeah, this Uzumaki review is gonna be all over the place, by the way. <laughs> okay, let's just talk about that ending, actually, because it does end, in my opinion, like, a bit fast, but at the same time, it, because not a whole lot is explained, which is the way of the Junji Ito, I do actually think, creepily, it does leave room in your imagination to think this is going to happen again and again and again and again. You know, that's the whole point of this book, I think. While I've just said before that I didn't really wholly love the ending, I still like the implications of the ending. I'll say that. <laughs> Actually, let's start back from the beginning. I know, like, I'm just spiralling right now. This is an actual manifestation of the spiral. And this story is bizarre. And I have heard in the past as well people saying, oh, it is about a spiral essentially. Like, it's about a pattern. It's not about a monster. It's not about this, that, and the other. It's about a pattern. A spiral. And, like, that just intrigued me to no end. My intrigue was satiated for the majority of this book. And honestly, like, the first several chapters really freaked me out. They did really get under my skin. They terrified me quite a bit, I'm not gonna lie. And it was very gross. Like, I, when I say terrified, I mean, like, maybe not, like, too scary in that sense, but it did get under my skin. It grossed me the hell out. I'll never get some of those images out of my head. I loved it. I, I did. I was loving it. I was like, okay, yeah, this is perfection. Okay, I'm definitely gonna end up getting these pronunciations wrong again. I apologize. But I do believe the main male character is called Shuichi, and the main female character is called Kiri. In Shuichi, he notices that his father is becoming obsessed with a spiral pattern, and it really does become an awful obsession and even just from the very beginning of the story you just see like the spiral design just really creeping into the landscape and the setting of the place if there's even like a little mini whirlwind just like appears out of nowhere and like just this incorporation of of spirals but in so many different ways it's not just the pattern it's like you know, like, yeah, the whirlwind and, like, twisters and hair and fingerprints. You know, there are so many spirals in the world that we don't really think about. And it honestly does start a little odd because Kiri does see Shuichi's father just looking at a sort of snail shell that's in the wall that has the, uh, the spiral shape. We just see the descent into madness almost. You know, I mean, I showed this last night as I was reading it upstairs in my bedroom and yeah, it, it just the, the spiral has taken over and it just comes out of nowhere almost. You know, when you see like how much it descends into chaos by the end of it, like it spirals out of control, this seemingly comes out of nowhere. Like why is he observing the spiral? Why has he become so obsessed with it? He wants to make it his entire life. And even just the little whirlpools in the river. Oh, oh my God, it is, oh yeah. <laughs> when the, the father can move his eyes around too, like spiral his eyes around his head in different directions, like that creeped me out. His tongue, like it's filled with so much, oh gosh, the, the tub, the tub. I don't know if I should show it. I, I'll, I'll show it. It's definitely like this image itself, I think is probably the most horrific image that I've seen in any of Edo's work so far, which, you know, I would have to go through everything again and like rank the most rankest Junja Ito panels, but this is definitely up there. Like, he's contorted, oh my god, his body into a spiral. And please look away if this grosses you out, because I know I had to look away myself as I was reading it. And to get to that point where you try to contort your own body into a spiral, I mean, he's obviously dead now, but it's just, oh god, it took such a dire turn at that point and it was like from that point on it was just like non-stop horrific thing after horrific thing and this is split into chapters and it does feel like a whole lot of these chapters to begin with I mean it is set in the same town it follows the same characters and whether or not they have a bigger hand in those chapters is another story sometimes they observe it a little bit and they're just there and other times not it reminds me a little bit of Orichi I've only read the first volume so I need to read more of that but yeah, even the ashes from his cremation, it becomes a spiral. And this is just when I was like, damn, this really is terrifying because if this happened in my town, what, what do you even do at that point? Oh God, it was so exciting. This is the thing. I feel like I was way more excited about this story at the start of it 
than I was when we got to a certain point. Oh my god. When Shuichi's mother starts to become obsessed with the spiral too, it's like she's been infected by it. Oh god, I don't even think I can show that one. I think that's maybe just a bit too graphic. When she cuts off her fingertips, oh god, like so this is the thing, it makes me wince. It makes me wince when I talk about the stuff that happened in Uzumaki. Which, again, like, I should give it a 10 out of 10 alone for that. But I kind of want the whole package. I want the story to grip me from start to finish. I still love this. I Don't get me wrong, I still love this. But I definitely think there was a bit of a peak with Uzumaki in the first segment of this story. I feel like potentially like the first 10 chapters, first 10 or 11, are possibly the best. And then it kind of just, after that, I was a little bit like, okay. Oh god, and the cochlear as well, in the ear. And he's trying so hard for his mum not to see the chart on the doctor's wall when his mum goes to hospital for this whole obsession with the spiral. And she takes it upon herself to get rid of the spiral that's in her ear. Ah! Oh my god! I mean, you don't actually see, like, the, the scissors going inside her ear or anything like that. The next thing you see, really, is just her bandaged up. So, fortunately, we were spared the graphic of it going into her head. At that point I was like, right, okay, we really need to take serious action now. This is like serious matter. And I just feel like for quite a lot of this as well, like people weren't really doing much, even though all of this like really horrific stuff was going on, like nobody was really doing anything, which I know is kind of the point for most of it. Like it's so unbelievable, like who would believe that? But even the main character, uh, Kiri, she, uh, towards the end of the book, it was while her brother was turning into a slug slash snail that she's like, okay, now I need to escape. I'm just like, now? Now? Really? Like, that was like towards the end of the story. Like, she should have been trying to escape at the start. You know, she's witnessed so much crap even by chapter two. And I feel like she definitely should have come to that conclusion in chapter three when her friend has like this moon-shaped scar on her forehead and she ends up becoming obsessed like again like this spiral that she becomes obsessed with Kiri's boyfriend Shuichi. Through her obsession yeah her scar turns into a spiral. It's just like eating away at her face and she's seeing this. She's seeing all of this happen you know like look at that. Look at that again like this is probably one of the most creepiest most disgusting thing I've ever seen. Her eyeball just like gets sucked up into the spiral. Ew. And she's seen in this all unfold, right? And even after chapter three, she still doesn't really do anything. <laughs> Again, I know she's just like a student. There's not much she really can do in the grand scheme of things. But I just feel like there should have been a little bit more urgency, you know, at least. Oh God, it just continues to eat her face. And when she also, suck somebody else in, she is just left to be herself just devoured by the spiral. And this was when I was like, okay, like how can we get any more messed up after this? And you know, there are still almost like singular stories that happen after this too. That's almost anthology-like, but you know, with that thread of being in the same place, some of the same characters, it felt like a different thing was happening in pretty much nearly each chapter. So. I was just like, okay, we can't actually get more fucked up than that, surely. <laughs> yeah, there were some like weird things happening with some of the characters and their parents. I love the ingenuity of the whole incorporation of how spirals can be injected into the story and how that can be what causes so much of this terror. Because again, like it's a pattern. How can this just, how can it do this? So it was really just extremely interesting to see it all unfold in that way. Because I did think... Junji Ido really hit the nail on the head with this one when it comes to telling that story. There was a random chapter as well of like this Romeo and Juliet type love again of like two people who fall in love but they're not allowed to be together. So they do end up like physically, like their body is like contort and in spiral and it is like messed up, it is freaky. They spiral themselves so that they are entwined with one another. It looks awful, it looks horrific, it looks like they're screaming, it looks like they're in pain, but they still do that so that they can be together. And I'm just like, how in the world? There are also people who spiral into obsession as they like wanting attention too, and I love the fact that chapter five explored that. And I was really scared for our main character, Kiri, because I thought, oh, this is when she's probably gonna die, because her hair starts to randomly become spiral-esque. 
and she can't stop it. Even when she tries to cut it, her hair chalks her and it will probably kill her if she even tries, just like it does with the hairdresser there. And I thought, okay, involving the hair too? I have hair, could this happen to me? Using that as a tool to also show the spirals, it's almost like at this point, it's inescapable. And it is inescapable. Just throughout, it's inescapable. There is no getting out of the spiral. A spiral is just continuously just going round and round and round and round and round and you can't escape it. And this is what makes this story brilliant, honestly. Like I'm starting to feel like, should I give this a 9.5? One of Kiri's friends actually becomes jealous of the attention that she gets. And she herself manages to get her hair to become spirals. But obviously like that becomes her undoing. Kiri is saved by Shuichi, and it's, again, just like absolutely horrific to even say that, that your own body can turn against you, which is something that is, again, explored, uh, is it the next chapter after this? I mean, there is a random Jack in the Box chapter two, which was fine. It works as a little one shot. But the snail, okay, the snail, that is the one. Your own body turning against you, and you have no control over that. Like when you start to see your body transform and you have no idea why it's happening, you have no idea how to stop it. And at the end of it, you turn into a snail. There's a lot of bullying going on and it feels almost like a morality lesson too for bullies with this story. But just the, the transformation process, like with the eyes bulging out of their head, becoming the snail eyes is I, I don't think I can use the word horrific enough. <laughs> and this is something that is a recurring thing later on too, of the people just randomly turn into snails. They get this sort of spiral on their back and then it just grows out until it becomes a shell and they become a snail. Vile. The lighthouse story, the lighthouse chapter was pretty good too. I quite like that one. The light comes out of it almost spiral-like, but it's so hot it can like burn. And honestly, I feel like Junji Ito doesn't mind killing off children. Like he does that a lot. And I feel like it does add to the level of horror because anybody at any moment can be affected by the spiral. You know, the spiral is merciless. And that's what Junji Ito shows in a lot of his horror is that the horrors that he depicts is merciless. There is no discrimination on who it affects. Child, woman, man, whatever. Junji Ito's horror affects them all which I feel is so effective at my feelings of being so vastly uncomfortable and appalled and horrified by Junji Ito's horror. I cannot praise this man enough. I'm in love with him. I swear to God, I'm in love with him. I, I'm in love with his brain, his mind. Even when I have some gripes with certain things, I still feel like he is just one brilliant man who deserves my devotion. Am I spiraling into obsession right now? <laughs> <laughs> Case in point on how the spiral affects us all. It really is like a very disorienting feeling, especially seeing so many of the spirals on the page. Every now and then I would feel like a little bit dizzy seeing how much of it there was. So in that way, it did come across as very interactive because I felt like it was also stimulating my brain, making me feel physically uncomfortable. Really weird umbilical cord, pregnant women with a one of those things that drills holes into people. Like that weird chapter came about too. But it was scary and creepy though, especially since we still have that iconic Junji Ito. It is a human, but they don't quite look human kind of style. Ooh, ooh, I don't wanna show that. And there's also like a bonus cut out story that happened, like a bonus chapter that does happen in the, the story, but I think Junji Ito cut it out because it didn't really quite fit. And that kind of felt a little bit like cosmic horror kind of thing. That was an okay chapter. But yeah, I think From the Storm onwards was when I was like, okay, like this is still good, but I, I'm not blown away by it. Which is very ironic considering <laughs> there's a lot of whirlwinds, a lot of storms, and it starts to become a bit post-apocalyptic, which I don't think I love that style in all honesty. It just wasn't really the style for me. But yeah, just a lot of whirlwinds. It does get a little bit into, I mean, <laughs> A lot of the times Junji Ito stories are a bit ridiculous. Like you have to take it at face value and you have to know that this is Junji Ito's intention. Sometimes the ridiculousness though can overshadow some of the horror. Like in Remina, I wasn't the biggest fan of them flying around the world, uh, for instance. 
And I mean, it doesn't exactly happen in this one, but from this moment on, when the storms start happening and starts to destroy the town, and these raw houses, these really old raw houses, start to really come into effect. It was going in a different direction, a different style. Yeah, I guess the ridiculous factor was ramped up a little bit more than it was before, which I could overlook because it still horrified me. But this is when I was like, hmm. Because a little bit later on, just like skipping through some of these stories now because I just felt like some of them weren't really wholly that relevant. It was just like adding two little bits of the the town I guess just making sure you remember that these things are still happening in these different places it's when it looks like the whole town's destroyed and if you make too much movement you can create a sort of whirlwind yourself like a hurricane you can literally go like this and a big hurricane would appear and blast someone away and some people would ride it as well and that was just when I was like okay this is getting like a little bit silly for me I'm sure this is what people would do in this situation I mean I don't 100% know but I could have really done without this whole flying around in hurricanes, making the smallest movement or talking too loudly would make this hurricane or this spiral. You know, it just, that part of it, I didn't love. I'm sorry. It definitely dropped my rating down for it. That whole post-apocalyptic feeling of, you know, humans desperately trying to still survive, which is usually great to explore, honestly. And it does lead to some horrific things towards the end when you see how messed up everybody's bodies are when they're trying to hide and they're using these raw houses because they seem to need to be the only places that are safe from the storms. Everyone is like piling into them and they're extending them and making them bigger and their bodies are all like amalgamating together and spiraling together. Yeah, that is disgusting. It's horrific. When I first saw that, I was like, wow, like that is gross. But I think at this point, because there was so much of the different direction of the story that I wasn't as horrified as I was in the early segments of this book. But I still love the imagery, especially of like the labyrinth of the raw houses like this. Incredible. Honestly, like, the artwork never lets up. It's amazing through and through. It's a 10 out of 10 for the artwork alone. And, yeah, they try to find, like, the entrance to it because it is, like, a spiral. You have to sort of, like, find the sort of beginning of it to get inside it, which I thought was brilliant, honestly. And then, you, yeah, you get to see how people are all joined in... Ugh, ugh, it is gross. I feel like by this point, though, I was like, okay, how are we going to wrap this up? There's only one chapter left after this. And the two main characters do find a spiral going down into the ground in the centre of all of this where they do find this whole town where all of the bodies of everyone is all spiraled together and even some of them are made into stone and it's just this huge almost alien-like place and it's just like kind of building itself and building itself and building itself and it's implied that every few hundred or thousands of tens of thousands of years it can reach the people above ground and all the builders are gone, maybe it's still building itself. So yeah, the spirals seem to be going up and up and up as I feel like more people are dying. Like this is when you can really interpret what's going on and this is a part of this story that I love is like how vague some of it is that you can put your own feelings onto it and your own interpretations. And it does feel like this is something that happens every now and then. And whenever it does happen, everybody who was affected by it disappears. And this is where they end up, like dead under the actual town until the spirals can reach the top again, like the surface and affect everyone who is living there again. So like this whole town is gone and dead, like everyone's dead. Even the two main characters, they decide they're gonna be together. And so they spiral and link through one another. And because I think they were the last two people to survive, that is when like everything sort of stops and the curse was over the same moment it began, the endless frozen moment I spent in Shuichi's arms. And it'll be the same moment when it ends again, when the next Kuruzucho is built amidst the ruins of the old one, when the eternal spiral awakens once more. So it does feel like, especially with the spiral, like does it ever really end? And it feels like this whole, horror that happens to this town happens over and over and over again. It is a spiral, like they can never ever escape, they can never get out of that. I love that idea of it, but it did feel like a little bit underwhelming by that point. And I feel like it was mainly just because by that point too, I was starting to feel less interested and less invested in it because I just didn't really love the whole post-apocalyptic side to it. I feel like maybe, you know, upon reread, I will probably love it even more. It's definitely one that I think I'm gonna remember forever. But I think overall, like this is probably my favorite Junji Ito book so far. Even though I've rated a couple of short horror stories above this, I feel like as a whole, Uzumaki 
what it did was brilliant. Like, I will give it that credit. It, it did it brilliantly. And I feel like maybe if it was cut quite shorter, it would have been potentially a 10 out of 10. But I think, yeah, I it just, it turned into a spiral. And I feel like it was a spiral that Junji Ito couldn't get out of at one point. And like, it, it had to end at some point, right? Okay, I have eight volumes left. Let's see what we have next. I'm really hoping it's not Tomie, because that one's huge too. I want a really small one. I want either Black Paradox, Liminal Zone, or Sensor. One of those three would be perfect. So here is the wheel. Let's spin. I don't even know what's like. Don't you dare! No! 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 <laughs> I didn't know what it was on. I couldn't see where the thing was. Why, why told me? I just said I didn't want to read that one. That's the biggest one. Oh my God. Oh. It's 750 pages. It's like hundred pages more than Uzumaki. Why, why now? Could I not have had one of the shorter ones, please? <gasps> oh my God, <laughs> there's a spiral. There's a spiral right behind me. Although it's not really a spiral, it's a spider web. Okay, totally scratch that. I'm thick. <laughs> Oh, okay guys, don't hate me. I didn't love this one. Mm. I struggled, I'm not gonna lie. I really did struggle with this one. I didn't think it was like terrible by any means or anything like that. I still appreciate the story and what it did, but there are only so many times I can see the same thing happening over and over and over again. Tomie, who we have met before actually, I did read a story that's also included in here called Painter. So I have met Tomie and I do know the character. It's like these men get this uncontrollable infatuation with Tomie without her even doing anything. Like if anything, like she is not that nice a person. Like all it is really is like very, well, it seems to be superficial, but sometimes it's not even that. It's it's so inexplainable how men react to her, which I actually think is a great commentary on how men act in general in society, like in real life. But like, I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole because I don't want to piss anyone off. So I do think there is conversation there 100% to do with like the themes of that. So I won't discredit that at all. And all of these men, I mean, not always men. I mean, sometimes it was like an older woman who wanted a daughter, for instance, but she has an influence, you know, an unspoken influence that we don't really fully understand. And this usually drives men to want to kill her. They want her, but it drives them to want to dismember her and stab her and kill her and all of this, that and the other. That was fine to begin with. But again, it was just like over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I just, I really struggled by the halfway point. I really did. I was like, I could potentially just stop. I don't care. Oh God, I hate saying that. I really do. I, I just, I just didn't care. I could already feel the backlash. I am so sorry. But I will say though, I think it started out really, really good. And this is mainly well, almost episodic, almost every chapter is it's a different scenario with different people who surround themselves with Tomie or a version of Tomie. Because yeah, whenever she is dismembered or whenever a part of her is taken off, she sort of duplicates or like regenerates even from these dismembered pieces, which honestly, it is a fascinating and really disturbing thing to happen. So I don't not like that. It's just, oh, I got bored. I got like really bored of it so quickly and I don't even think we really scratched the surface on how disgusting the regeneration could have been. Like there were certain times and certain points in this where it was a bit disgusting, but I just feel like the majority of this book is just men being infatuated with Tomie. That's like the majority of it. Like that is, I would even say like 75, 77% of this book is that men being infatuated with Tomie. And I just don't care for that that much. It comes across as a little bit of a like, a succubus kind of storyline and I've never really been that taken with succubus storylines. Succubi? So unfortunately it was like a bit of a misstep for me. But I will say I loved the first chapter, like the first ever story we get in this because we have Tomie as a girl in school and everyone in the, her class are mourning her death and they have a funeral and everything but then Tomie walks through the door the next day and everyone's like wait hang on how is how is Tomie here she died and even the teacher's like what 
And you know what, actually, there were some really interesting and creepy undertones to what could have potentially happened with this teacher too. Like really disturbing, really inappropriate shit there. And I found that so fascinating and interesting, but on a school trip with Tomie and the people from this class, Tomie ends up um, getting pushed off like a cliff by, I think it was by the teacher, and the children kind of cover it up for the teacher, and the teacher gets himself and some other boys in the class to dismember Tomie into, was it 43 pieces? 42 pieces, sorry, 42 pieces. They dismember her into 42 pieces, and each of the children get a piece each, and they have to, like, hide it. And I love that. Like, I thought that was really good. I would have loved it if we continued that, in a way, for most of the story, but... That was really a specific one shot of that situation. But so I do feel like a bit disappointed that we didn't go back to that. Whereas the next few chapters did have some of the same characters. It was about a young girl who was a photographer at school and she crosses paths with Tomie and the person she has a big crush on ends up falling in love with Tomie and it ends up being this big thing with some other boys who end up wanting to kill the main girl from those chapters. And Tommy is like encouraging them to do that, including the person who she was in love with. So all of that was so interesting. I love the part where Tommy is like coming out of the carpet almost. Like that part was really creepy and, and weird. But I think after that, I really was starting to get really bored with the repetition. Cause I, I just, I didn't think it warranted this many stories. I think some of the stories were just so, just didn't need to be there. Oh, I will say as well, I really enjoyed the hair story where a couple of girls put the hair from Tomie that they find in a box in one of the friends' father's studies. And this hair kind of takes over. Very reminiscent a little bit of Uzumaki with the hair coming alive, but not exactly in the same way. Oh, where was it? Oh, here it is. Yeah, and just the way that it changes them into being like Tomie, and it is absolutely creepy having like the hair coming out of the face like that. Like that does make me gag. Like, even the idea of a swallowing hair, I don't, I don't know why, but that makes me gag. Oh yeah, see, and then when the friend who had more of Tomie's hair on her, and it just like comes out of her face and out of her mouth, and it completely consumes her, it's so disgusting and awful and I would have loved to have seen more stuff like this rather than a guy falls in love with Tomie and ends up killing her over and over and over and over again. That happens so often and there are like different stories as well. There was one about a babysitter and Tomie is like a, a baby. <laughs> it's odd. It's so weird and that was a good little story. There was one about divers who end up seeing Tomie bodies coming out from the ground and one of them gets like eaten alive and it, it, there are some really good parts to it. I absolutely do think so. And I actually really enjoyed the last few chapters too, how some of it kind of connected. There was a guy who was injecting babies with Tommy's blood and we kind of have a, a chapter that flashes back to this person who was that guy who was injecting babies. And it turns out like he was a model who crossed paths with Tommy A and ended up losing his beauty because of her. And so he has this like vendetta against her to try and ruin her life by making these babies turn into Tommy A so that one of them can grow old and be ugly. And it's also a great exploration into jealousy and revenge and vanity, like there is so much to unpack, there really is. I think we still could have had the impact with way less chapters. So I think maybe if I had have not read it all in one sitting, I might have enjoyed it if I like spaced it out over the course of a few weeks. But unfortunately, I just, I, 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 I don't even think I could even reread this and think it's better than I initially think. Because to me, I don't think this has that much rereadability. Now that I've read it the once, I feel like that's it. <laughs> Which is such a shame because I really did think that I would really love this. I know this was serialized. I do believe Tomie, the first chapter was his first ever like successfully published work, I think. It, it, it won a prize. I think it came runner up in a prize or got an honorable mention in a, a big prize. That was Junji Ito's like big break, I think. So there is a lot of importance to this and Junji Ito's career. And I can really tell like as I go through, the artwork definitely improved. And it is very fragmented because it was serialized. So I don't hold that against it either. And it was still good to have that thread running through with 
that even though these are almost separate, isolated stories, like you can take one out and put it in a collection like they did with Painter, and it would still like make some sense. We had those themes of violence against women by men. We have the jealousy aspect of it. We have the infatuation. We have the revenge element. I just don't think I could ever read this again. So I'm gonna give this six out of 10. I think that isn't terrible, especially after I've just went on a bit of a tirade about it. It's probably like the most negative I've been in this, apart from those short stories that I gave like one, two, three, four stars. I don't think it was just out, because I feel like five is like average. I feel like it was a little bit above average for me. So I think six, a six out of 10 is a good rating to give it, but it did feel like a one and done kind of story for me. But I know this is one of his most iconic and I do from the bottom of my heart apologize for my opinion. I know it's probably a bad take. Oh, did I just say a spider? Oh my God, no, I think it was just a dust bunny, I think. Oh my god, now I'm a bit paranoid. <laughs> this is what Junji Ito's done to me. He's made me so paranoid. I just saw it like scuttle across the floor, but it could have just been a dust bunny. All right, okay, I'm just gonna quickly spin the wheel to see what I'm reading next. And then we're getting the fuck out of here. Here is the spinner. Please be like Black Paradox or something. Be a small one. Be a small one. Oh no, I don't have the sound on. Oops. What is it? What is it? What is it? Oh, Soichi. Okay, okay. That's another story collection, isn't it? I think it's one of the most recent ones too. I don't think it's actually been out that long. It was so close to being censored and that one's so short. I am glad still that this came up and I think I've got two of the biggest Junji Ito works out of the way now. So that's uh, pretty awesome. So just to check in then, these are all of the Junji Ito books I've read so far. And yeah, I have two of the biggest on there. Hey. Good progress. Oh, I still have so many short ones left too. One, two, three, four. There are four short ones, three bigger ones, and I did have to get one of the bigger ones. It's just my look, honestly. The wheel is not my favorite. Please don't go anywhere near me, please. Oh, why is it moving? Ah! No, 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 I need a wipe. I need a wipe. Oh my god. Oh, please. Oh. <laughs> it's fucking so itchy. I'm telling you, he sent the spider after me because I'm not going to give his book a great review. <laughs> Okay, I did manage to survive the spider attack from last night. Honestly, so relevant with one of the stories in this too. Suichi, I have met Suichi before, and I think it was three stories that I previously read that had Suichi in it, and his family even. There were two that were in, I think, Smashed? No, three in Smashed. It was the Mystery of the Haunted House, and then the Mystery of the Haunted House, Suichi's version, and then Suichi's beloved pet. So those are the like the first three encounters I've had with it. And the first two, yeah, the first two were Soichi as an adult. And I'm really glad I kind of read that first because the end of this volume with the final chapter is just so, like I I'm trying to connect it to the Mystery of the Haunted House stories and what Soichi becomes later on. Because I thought like the final story in this was great. And there were a couple in here that I liked, but overall, this is not my favorite volume. In fact, I think it's my least favorite volume of Junji Ito so far, because I just don't really love Soichi, which I don't know is controversial or not. I haven't seen any reviews online. I don't know what the general census is on Soichi. He is interesting, don't get me wrong, but I just don't really care a whole lot for a misfit teenager who <laughs> demands his own way and calls himself Lord. I mean, it can be funny. And honestly, I do appreciate the fact that we have a lighter Junji Ito novel. <laughs> I mean, I say lighter, it's still got some horrific moments in it, but the humor, you know, it is rather humorous and I do appreciate that. It's just not my favorite type of horror. And this entire volume is dedicated to Soichi. And yeah, overall, I gave it a 4.70. 
out of 10. It is the lowest rated volume and the stories mainly get between a 3 and a 6 out of 10 inside it. And like what I did with Tomie, I just revealed the entire thing. I don't think I'm going to do that with Suichi because I do think there was some stories better than others in this. And it is a whole lot shorter than Tomie too. So even though like the, all of this is connected, yeah, I do want to go it like chapter by chapter like I have been doing with other things. So firstly, we have a happy summer vacation. We have a couple of cousins going to visit Suichi and his family. And Suichi really does not like Machina, Makina. I mean, one thing I will say about Suichi is that at times I actually felt a little bit sorry for him. He does seem to be left out a lot and, you know, he does crave attention. But at the same time, you can say the other side of that is in he curses people for not inviting him, but loves people for not inviting him at the same time kind of thing. Like, it's very hard to predict Suichi's emotions, which I think is something that is really good to his character. The whole nails thing in his mouth still creeps me out. And you just never know what he's going to do. And it tours the line as well between is what he does supernatural, paranormal, or is it just pranks? Half the time you see him, like a later story, there are wires and things to pretend there is some kind of phantom or poltergeist. So obviously like that is fake, but then there are other times when Soichi does something to curse someone and it comes true. So I love the fact that we tore that line between both of those angles, like is it real, is it fake? I do really enjoy that. And it's not really too much about the first story, honestly. It's really about Soichi trying to get revenge on Makina because she, well, he just doesn't like her. I liked the moment when he had the nails in his mouth and Makina slaps him and the nails like protrude out of his face. That is a really terrifying visual. And just for that alone, I kind of gave it like a 4.5 out of 10. <laughs> it is still like the weakest start of a story collection, I think. Usually they start off with like an eight out of 10 for the first stories in a collection. The second story, A Happy Winter Vacation, I liked the setting of it and I liked the idea that there was this blizzard that was making things so isolating. I really enjoyed that. We have this girl who ends up running into Suichi and he points her to the wrong direction and she falls into a freezing river, leading to her finally being saved and taken to his house where he just continues to sort of prank her. You think he's taken her blood, but it turns out that he hasn't been. And he does have, like, it is weird. Like, this is the thing. I think this Soichi volume itself is just a bit weird. I don't think it's horrifying. I don't think it's too scary. I think it's entertaining still. Like, it, it's still entertaining, but it's not really what I read Junji Ito for. The amount that I've read so far now, I've realized what my preference to a Junji Ito story is. And that usually is the focus on the horror aspect of it. And this felt, you know, like in Goosebumps, I do love Goosebumps, but I don't like the prank books, which happen all the time. You think it's scary, but it's actually not. It's just pranks. And this is kind of what this, this book is. Like, this is my Goosebumps. <laughs> this would be the worst of the Goosebumps books for me personally. I like the real scary Goosebumps books, not the fake outs, not the pranks. I don't care for any of that. But at least Soichi himself is enough of an interesting character that it didn't make me write this off at all. I mean, yes, it's still my least favorite out of all of the things I've read so far, but it's still, I, I still enjoyed it. But yeah, I gave the second story a four out of 10. It was good. I liked the, the visuals of the blizzard and stuff. And it did seem like Suichi was, you know, taking her blood, even though it did turn out to be just strawberry syrup. I liked the idea behind it. Uh, the third story is called Suichi's Happy Diary, and I again give this one a 4 out of 10. It goes back to Makina, Makina going back to her cousin's house where Suichi lives and her brother too. We get that visual again of the nails coming out of his face. And she is, well, she's very apologetic about it. And I like this, like even though this again turns out to be fake, I like that Soichi is so intent on making her life hell. And I do like his little side bits where he's like, I'm going to curse you, I'm going to curse you. Lord Soichi is going to rule all of the world and things like that. Like, I do really enjoy his thought process a lot of the time. I did feel for Makina. And she ends up coming across his diary, which I thought was so fascinating, especially when she realizes that sometimes Soichi can seemingly predict 
a terrible event that happens later on. And like, obviously when you're in this kind of situation, you wouldn't expect this young boy to be the one who's able to actually curse someone. You try to rationalize it. And this is the thing, I'm trying to rationalize Soichi myself and is this supernatural, is it not? Is my rational thought process winning out over what could potentially be happening in terms of the supernatural. I think being able to read Suichi's diary and the, the whole straw doll curses that he does really lends into that. And again, like there are moments when Suichi's just watching his family and it does make me feel bad for him, even though he does reject them and he isn't the nicest at all. He is a little shit. If he was my little brother, I swear. I mean, my little brother was a little bit like Soichi, I'm not gonna lie. Probably not to this extent, but he did push me in front of a car once. And on another occasion, he was supposed to be a lookout while we were rollerblading, and I went down a hill and he said it, the course was clear, except when I went down the hill, there was a car coming straight at me, and I had to swerve, hit my head off the ground, had a concussion, and had to stay in a hospital overnight. So maybe my little brother is a little bit like Soichi. Hmm. Interesting. So maybe one of the reasons why I think this is one of my least favorites is because I can relate to it in a little way, like obviously not to this extent. I think any of us who have like an annoying younger sibling can really relate to this. But yeah, the Terry one was fine. I like the mosquito with the switchy face visual, that was good. Then we have Suichi's home visit. And this one was honestly weird. I gave it a 4.5 still because I, actually why did I give it a 4.5? So Soichi's home visit is about a teacher who actually tries with Soichi, tries to get him to focus on his future and you know he notices Soichi's behavior and wants to help him improve. There was a really touching moment in this when Soichi's teacher was talking to, I think it was Makina, about how he used to be a delinquent when he was younger and all it took was one teacher to notice him and give him attention and help him, that really changed his life around. And Suichi is the kind of person who needs that. He needs the, the guidance. But I do think maybe Suichi is a little bit too far gone. I think he is a little devil child. So obviously that doesn't really quite work. I did find it so odd that his teacher would come around and be like, I'm gonna take you home with me, teach you from home kind of thing. I think that's so weird. And his parents are just like absolutely fine with that. Literally, he's just met the mother. If it's not an inconvenience, I'd like to have Suichi stay with me for a while. If a teacher just came round to, you know, the parent's house and said, I wanna have your child stay with me, that's like the oddest thing about this whole story. But I do appreciate the fact that he really tries with Suichi. And it was really interesting to see the deterioration of the teacher. Makina, she read in his diary that he likes this girl in class. And oh, like the teacher gets her to come round and you know, like bless Soichi. Like he actually does kind of try a little bit. He's like, well, whoops, my hair's all messed up. And then he actually like tries to fix his hair in front of her. Like it's so sweet. It's so sweet. Like I couldn't help but feel so much sympathy for him when he's just like rejected by this girl outright in front of him and called weird and all of this. Like I do feel, oh, they, oh, I, it does some messed up shit, he does. And I can't explain half of the things he does rationally. And I still, I still extend sympathy towards him. I normally never come say someone as creepy as you, like that's so mean. And you can just say like how crushed he is. And like he really does fall back on his creepy ways when his feelings are really hurt. And his feelings are so delicate and sensitive. So I can, oh, I can, I can, I, I do feel bad for him. Well, yeah, there was a creepy ending to this chapter as well, which actually, yeah, definitely 4.5. Like he's got this like doll, like cloth doll of the teacher made and the teacher goes up and like he sees it and Soichi looks really terrifying as well, like really creepy. Like what in the Damien's going on here? He's got candles on his head and he's, it's just so dark and weird. And then when the teacher seemingly comes back out, he's got nails in his, in his mouth, just like Soichi. So he's obviously been replaced by that cloth doll thing. So I really thought that part was really good. I don't know why I debated that rating. 
And then we get to a teacher of cloth. I think this is my joint favorite story of the collection. I really like the, well, almost like a body snatchers kind of idea behind it with Soichi replacing some of the teachers and he tries to replace one of his fellow classmates with these cloth dolls that move so weirdly. Like they do look really odd. Like it doesn't look right. You know, it's that uncanny valley thing where from a distance, it looks a little bit fine. But then when you get up close and you see the stitching and the way that his, he just doesn't line up exactly. It's really off-putting and weird. And it does play into that fear that teachers and students or whoever can be easily replaced with an imposter and they can cause havoc in your place and they could mess everything up. Like that is quite scary. Like if you can't trust the the teacher before you when you don't know it's them or not that is really really scary and i just like the overall pacing of this story too and it was mainly set at the school which i thought was a good setting for suichi because we never really got to see him in any other location but when he's an adult in the haunted house and then his family home in a lot of these stories so the setting of the school was really good he has some people in his class trying to get to the bottom of what's happening with the teachers even this teacher who was replaced she looks even worse than the first one. You know, at least the first teacher looked a little bit believable from a distance. She does not. She does not. Like, this was a rush job. But I liked how they were trying to combat Soichi at his game, like his friends. They go to his house, they go inside his attic. All of that I thought was really good. And it had an ending that wrapped things up quite well. I feel like this really does work as a chapter on its own, which a lot of them kind of do in a way. But I think this one, the most out of this volume, works as a standalone chapter. We have a good ending to it too, because a part of me was wondering, like, are the teachers dead? Like, the ones who are replaced, are they dead? But no, Mr. Yanagida and Miss Soga were both rescued that same day. Miss Soga had collapsed in her apartment, while Mr. Yanagida was found absently sitting by a bonfire in the park. So, like, everyone was fine by the end of it. And this is the thing with the Soichi stories. Everyone's usually still fine by the end of it. There's usually some kind of lesson, which I don't mind. It's nice to have a bit of a change from Junji Ito's usual. Again, not exactly my cup of tea, but still pretty good. And so I gave Teacher of Cloth a six out of 10. Definitely my joint favorite of the volume. So then we get into Suichi's birthday. And this one, again, I do feel quite bad for him. It is Makina's birthday and it's also Suichi's birthday. But it honestly seems like the family forgot that. If my parents forgot my birthday, I would be rather devastated. You know, it's like, these parents are not great. They do let Soichi get away with so much. Like they need to put a firmer handle on this child. Even when his siblings are saying, hey dad, like you need to do something, he's being awful. He still is allowed to be let away with so much badness. And the parents are just way too lenient. But yeah, Soichi is like on the ceiling and he's looking down. Even the mother's like, yes, actually it is Suichi's birthday. Okay, come down then Suichi, it can be your party too. Like, I mean, if I was Suichi, I would want to curse everyone in that room. <laughs> Not gonna lie. In this story, I'm kind of on Suichi's side a little bit. I gave this one a 5.5 out of 10 because of that, but also the backstory, like there is like a, an almost like a ghost story kind of element to it too, because we talk about the, the grandma and how Soichi had a twin brother, but when Soichi was born, it was just him, and the grandma was always making these like false predictions or saying these false omens that seemingly seemed false. And there is like this photograph of the grandma holding something that isn't even there in the photo, and Soichi in his stroller. And the twin brother is apparently called Soji. So Soji and Soichi, and Soji and the grandma just wandered away one day and never came back. She said, I'm gonna take Soji for a walk and then just never appeared again. It's odd because yeah, it looks like she's holding no one's hand. So you're left with this story that baffles your brain because nobody can see and nobody believes. But then when Makina is looking for Soichi and he's in the closet, she also finds the grandma on the other side, just sitting there. And she even talks to her too. Even though she disappears, there is a moment, like it, for me personally, like it isn't explained at all, but for me, it seems like the grandma and Soji, the, the twin brother, they reappear on his birthday every year. I don't know if it's a manifestation of Suichi's imagination. I don't know if it can be because the grandma and Soji do attack Makina. I can't explain exactly what happens here, 
but they do disappear after Soichi sees a cake that's left by Makina saying happy birthday from Makina and Soichi's like I don't know I feel like you might have a moment of appreciation or thankfulness potentially which is huge development if you ask me because then the grandma and Soji disappear so I don't know if maybe Soichi ended up saving her because she left a cake and even though he's saying what a terrible cake disgusting he's still eating it and you've got those like sounds that he's enjoying it it was almost my joint favorite of the whole volume two then we get to Suichi's petty curses love this double page spread by the way i think it's awesome so in this one we are back at school for a lot of it too Suichi is just like cursing his classmates he puts a doll in the ground that is meant to be Kuroda. the actual Kuroda is later found in the ground he's still alive but you know that was one of Suichi's kind of curses and then he ends up taking it upon himself to curse people for other people like he observes his classmates and he's like oh he doesn't really like him so I'm going to tell him that I'm going to curse him for him and it seems like he wants payment for it which is so odd but yeah this is when we get to the spider stuff which last night when I was on the toilet well I wasn't exactly attacked by a spider but it was there and it was moving and it was scary and I was like really right after I've read this I did manage to escape I don't know where the spider is now I literally just finished washed my hands closed the bathroom door I went back in this morning and it was gone so I don't know where it went which is oh, oh. but yeah we do have like this whole spider part of it too where he tries to scare his sister but then at least seems like so which he's scared of it himself you know he looks a little bit terrified and he runs away. So again, we do have those humanizing moments for Soichi, which I think is so prominent through a lot of these stories. And then he does curse one of his other classmates, which is terrifying. There is this huge uh, like spider with massive legs coming over the side of the bathroom stall. One of my worst nightmares. And it does look like it was just a kind of prank because he's just covered in toilet roll. So I don't know what it is. Again, like is Soichi manipulating people's minds like is it all an illusion you just don't quite grasp what it is that he's doing and I did like the ending of it too because there are these woods near him that is owned by this man who almost tries to kill Soichi like he's got this axe and he throws it at him and he thinks Soichi is the one who's been ruining his grove or whatever it was he's what what did he call it cedars whatever they are and it was like such a touch of moment when his older brother, Soichi's older brother, comes to save him and he actually manipulates the guy who is about to throw axes at Soichi. Like, he actually manipulates him and is like, hey, I hear setting traps is dangerous and illegal, so there's no way you can go to the police about it. It was a good moment between these brothers and I gave it a 5 out of 10. The next one is Foliad Room, and I think this is my least favourite of the stories, even though I did quite like the design of the builder who comes. I'll show you. It is scary when someone comes to do work in your house and they weren't ever actually sent there. Like, that is a, whew, a, a spine-chilling moment. But this guy, he comes to the house because Soichi's older brother needs to study, and Soichi's causing too much noise that they're gonna soundproof his room and they end up making it a foliage room, which means that the room itself is absolutely tiny. Absolutely tiny. So this turns out to be the room, it is foliage, but like, that, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And it is just a way for Soichi to terrorize his brother even further by going into the walls and stuff. So there was this like chase through the maze-like foliage room, which I thought was pretty good. I did like that. But that's pretty much all it is. Again, it's just like pulling one big prank on his brother. But we are left with that question of, so who was that man who came to do the soundproofing? Because he wasn't sent there by the person the parents originally asked for. So who was that? So I gave it three out of five because that was the only thing that I really took from that story. So then we get to Coffin, which was a good story. It follows the life of the family after the death of the grandpa. So we did see the grandpa every now and then in the previous chapters. And it does feel a bit sad that we had a sort of background recurring character pass away. And he made his own coffin before he died. And Soichi asks him to make him a coffin that's like the European coffins. 
like Dracula and like vampires sleeping in coffins. Like he wants his grandpa to make him a coffin like that. But the grandpa dies before he can like, really finish a, a coffin for Soichi that Soichi likes. Because Soichi keeps saying, that's bad. Like, that's not what I want. Do it again. And again, like, this is one of his, like, least likable stories where he does come across as just a, a self-entitled brat. And the way he cries next to the body, too, when the grandpa is laid down. I don't think this is a funeral. I think this is prior to the funeral. And he just won't stop crying until he gets his coffin made. And Makina is there again. Like, she is a pretty good recurring character, so I do need to remember how to pronounce her name. But she goes to the basement where she hears banging, and the grandpa, the spirit of the grandpa, is there trying to make this, this coffin for Soichi. So I love this panel there. It is so... Oh! He's supposed to be dead, but he's there trying to make this coffin for Soichi. And it's also a bit heartbreaking to see him try and do that when he should be resting. But again, at the same time, like, is it actually him? That is a bit of a scary visual too. I like that. We end the story, I think, just after the funeral and the cremation. And it's weird because the grandpa is just walking behind a procession. And he is dead. He's saying, coffin, coffin. And everyone runs away screaming. And he continues. And everyone's looking at him. So can they say that? So he must be real, right? Suichi, how's it look this time? No good, do it again. Once he gets the okay from Suichi, then he really will die, apparently. The storage room is full of coffins. So like, he must actually really be there and everyone else can see him too. Oh, so we should just let him freaking rest, you know? Give it a 4.5 out of 10. It was, it was pretty decent. The final story, Rumours. I really enjoyed this one, but mainly so because we had the return of that really scary model from the stories from, was it Shiver? There was a previous story collection with that model who really does get under my skin. And her picture is put on a chalkboard in the school, which creeps everybody out. And so she begins rumors that the model is in town and there is like this mud swamp thing that she bathes in to make herself beautiful. And not just that, but Soichi is actually spreading rumours about himself that are really positive, that he helped an old lady cross the street, or he saved someone from dying. And it seems like there is some like great positivity towards Soichi for the very first time. And then his lies are revealed, you know, he isn't related to this famous person who he said he was. And it is just that idea of like spreading those rumours and like anyone can really believe them. But yeah, the model, the model, like, she really is, like, one of my most scariest Junji Ito monsters, I think. Because there's just something about her that's just so unsettling. So I love seeing her again. I don't know if it ties into the Mystery of the Haunted House stories, because at the very end of those stories, you had that really tall woman appear, and she looked a bit like her, right? Is that her older? Like, is it the same person? Is the model, like, Soichi's future wife? Because wasn't she like, if you leave me again, Suichi, I will kill you? Or something like that? And they have a child together? That's honestly so disturbing. Is that the same person? Like, am I connecting the dots right? Or have I just totally made it up? But yeah, we have this girl who likes one of the guys in her class. And she notices that her classmate, who has also shown interest in him, is getting more beautiful. So she thinks that she's going to this swamp place. So she tries to bathe in it. Suichi's there to take photographs of her. And, like, she is obviously embarrassed and upset about it all. But then, then you see something rise from the swamp. And it's her. It's her. The, the model, she is just lying underneath it. And she's huge. And she just comes up like a monster from the black depths of hell. You know? And that slow rise. And then she's massive. She's tall. She's even sweet. She's, like, quaking in his boots. And she's looking down at him. Say, boy, you there, who gave you permission to take my photo? Which publisher sent you? I'm a professional model, you know. Do you know what happens when you take unauthorized pictures of me? Well, let me tell you. And it looks like she might eat him, kill him. Like, he's met his match in this model. Like, he looks terrified of her. And I love that ending so much. I feel like if we didn't get... Soichi in the future with the Mystery of the Haunted House stories, unless I'm totally reading it wrong, it's not actually him, but I do think it is him. Does he end up marrying her? And I mean, he's a little bit too young right now. Like, that's really odd and creepy, especially to start a relationship from that age. Like so many wrongs, so many no's. So do they end up 
getting together, conceiving children, well, a child, and force his family to be part of their haunted house thing. I like that ending because it means that we have a potential of where it goes from there. So that was so cool. I really enjoyed that. And I gave that story a six out of 10 too. I think like other than the whole model stuff, it was an okay story, but then yeah, the model stuff happened and it elevated it. Joint favorite story out of the volume with the teacher cloth one or the, yeah, you know the one. I didn't fancy doing a review last night. I think it was about midnight by the time I finished Suichi. So I just spun the wheel. I do have a screen recording of it so you can see what came up. And the winner of that one was Sensor. Oh my God, this always happens. I forget I've made a coffee when I'm doing these chatty sections and it ends up going to waste. Okay, Sensor. I had a good time reading this one and I still don't think it's one of my favorites really. I think I'm gonna give this one a 6.5 out of 10. I do think I might have preferred it over Tomie. I think Tomie went on a little bit too long for my liking. Whereas I think the length of this one was a lot more perfect and it didn't outstay its welcome in a way. I, I don't know, again, please don't hate me for for saying that. <laughs> so in this one, we have a girl called Kyoko. She finds this village that's at the base of a mountain and there is some kind of like volcanic hair that's, you know, floating through the air, except it's not quite volcanic hair because it doesn't quite line up with the properties of it. So Kyoko herself theorizes that it is angel hair. Yeah, angel hair. But the nature of angel hair is still a mystery. And I honestly do love the visuals of this. Like it's very bright. One thing I really enjoy about this story is just how bright it is. It's still very dark in terms of its subject matter, but there is so much brightness from it too. Like I've never seen so much white space in a Junji Ito story so far, I think. And I think it just emphasizes even better the horrors that do end up happening. And even though this isn't filled with the horrific visuals or the horror that really does permeate a lot of Junji Ito stories, when it happens, it's made that more impactful because it's almost like you're lulled into a false sense of security because nothing really that bad has happened in a while. So it's almost like you're calm and you're brought back down and then you turn a page and bam, there is something quite horrific on the page. And with that being minimized, I think it just enhances those moments even more. What I would have loved actually, this is but in the chapters, it is pretty much the same character throughout and there is a journalist who comes into it in chapter two who pursues Kyoko and like how she's changed. Like there is that running thread, but just with like say Tomie, the chapters do change locations, they change like other side characters, they change the kind of plot that's happening in that chapter. So it is still very episodic, which makes sense because I do believe a lot of Junji Ito stories are serialized in magazines. So you do have that episodic format. And I like that format because I grew up on 90s iconic television shows like Charmed and Buffy, and they would have an episodic format too. Speaking of, I do have a live show tonight with my patrons, if you'd like to join my Patreon. We are doing a Charmed Witch Along, which we started a few weeks ago. So we're just watching three episodes of Charmed every Thursday, and it's like my favorite show ever. So it's so nice to rewatch it with everyone. Anyway, you know what I mean? Like it's quite episodic, but still there is a, a connection, a thread that's running through it. But what I would have loved is, we have Kyoko come to this town, like this village, where everyone seems to be affected by this hair because whenever somebody is attached to this hair, they have a connection with a mysterious power. And they sort of seem to transcend time and space with this weird hair that's floating through the air. And it almost feels rather cult like and it seems like it has some kind of commentary on Christianity too. I feel like I'm not smart enough to really talk about any of this. But yeah, long ago during the Edo era when Christianity was prohibited, the people of this village sheltered the foreign missionary Miguel from persecution. Along with the villagers who had protected him, he was thrown into the mouth of Mount Sangoku, but the shogunate eventually captured Miguel and sentenced him to death. Amagami has danced down from the volcano ever since. This village is the only place where it stays on the ground. So it seems like this Christian missionary was killed in this volcano and ever since this mysterious hairs come out of it. And this hair does seem to have strange, bizarre effects on people. So it kind of touches into that idea of cosmic horror, but not so much to the obviousness of Remina, because this felt a lot more subtle in a way. Like it felt more human 
You know, it's kind of like how we as humans can transcend by using our senses. The five senses we have in our bodies, these senses, they exist not because they are necessary to live, but because they are necessary to feel the universe. So it felt more of a human kind of story attached to the cosmic horror, like the, the vastness of space and time and our connection to it, which again, makes me feel like so insignificant. <laughs> but the way that these villagers kind of worship the Amagami, it almost feels very cult-like, which I really would have loved to have spent more time exploring. But yeah, it, I, again, I can't fault Junji Ito's artistry in this, just absolutely breathtaking. And the idea of Lord Miguel being this really nasty looking creature. I mean, they don't think it's Lord Miguel, but like, what is it? It's like some kind of alien type disgusting horror. We don't really see it a lot. There's a volcanic eruption, the village it perishes. And I think it's like 60 years later or something. And Kyoko comes out of this kind of shell of hair that melts and her hair is just beautiful and amazing. It reminds me a little bit of that Tomie story of hair that changed the person who had it. But yeah, the hair that's on her, the the angel hair, I guess, changes her so completely. And yeah, there is a journalist who's brought into it. He follows her to a village where there is this sort of, well, weird cloud brain thing above everything and this Illuminati looking tent with a cult. And they're trying to get to a higher level through Kyoko. This also reminded me a little bit of Revenant when she was put up on the cross, when she was gonna be sacrificed to stop what was happening. And I love that idea of the connection to it. And see, moments like this don't happen often. Where it's just so bizarre that when you do turn the page, it, it comes out of nowhere almost. And it, it hits you. And it hits you harder because it doesn't happen every other page. Like sometimes it does in Junji Ito's shorter stories. So like there's so much appreciation that I have for this story. Oh, and I think probably one of the most disgusting parts of this, there's probably like two that really stand out to me. There is a doctor that's trying to like help Kyoko in a way. So he's trying to also connect on a human but sensory level that will help him transcend. But when he thinks about her, like when he's trying to, uh, like he, he relaxes his body, he's trying to sleep in his body, he's hypnotizing himself as another doctor theorizes. And he just suddenly, uh, I, I can't even explain this. This is the thing in this one. I just, I'm so baffled by the horror that happens and how it unfolds. It's so grotesque. Black hole, I feel her. The dark shaped nebula, I feel her. Ay, 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 I don't know. I think one of the chapters that I loved the most was chapter four, where there is this cliff and Kyoko comes, she's standing at this cliff, and there is a coffee house nearby where these two people work, this man and woman, and they usually take people from that cliffside and they offer them a listening ear, you know, they listen to their problems because a lot of people who come to the cliff plan on taking their lives. And I don't know if this chapter like ties back into that whole Christianity theme where I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong because I don't really know a whole lot about religion, but is it in Christianity that taking your own life is a sin? And there is like this whole thing that's explored in here to do with that, that I think ties in with these really disgusting looking bugs these S bugs. I don't really want to say that. I think I've said the word out loud so many times. I think YouTube's going to demonetize me. And they purposefully want you to stand on them and they go under your feet so that you will stand on them. The girl character from the cafe who helps Kyoko, she talks about her ex-boyfriend who passed away because he jumped in front of a train. And this visual of it happening there is so horrifying. I can't imagine like how many times I can actually say that in this sort of update. There were so many horrifying things. And then she accidentally stands on one of the bugs and she sees a face in it. Like it looks almost human. There's a human in it. And it turns out that the face and the screams that come from it are her ex-boyfriend. And it seems like hell, you know, for him. It seems like that idea that taking your own life is a sin and you will not go to heaven for it. I don't know if this is some kind of commentary on that, that they've become these 
bugs that have to be tormented by what happened to them. What drove them to take their own life? Like he says that she was cheating on him, which was dramatic AF. I was like, I was not expecting that from her. She seemed like such a nice person. But yeah, it seems like that's what drove him to take his life. So like, is he reliving his pain as this bug, this really disgusting bug over and over and over again because he took his life? You know, like, does it connect to that? Is it a commentary on doing that to yourself means you won't get to heaven? Is that what it's talking about? I don't know. Like, I, again, like, I feel like my brain isn't, you know, analytical enough for me to really say that. But I, I think on a surface level, that's maybe what it's kind of saying. But just the bugs in general are so disgusting. But probably one of my favourite parts of this story. One of the reasons why I enjoyed it so much. There is a random chapter, chapter five, the journalist he had a stalker and she honestly does look terrifying like her eyes the way her hair is i'm not criticizing anyone who has hair like her by the way but just the way she looks the way she stalks him is so unnerving this like this right there if you saw that in one of those traffic mirror things oh no no absolutely not and it's your stalker too definitely not the cult person from earlier as well he apparently survived when he tried to use Kyoko. And he is a pretty scary looking dude. Oh, and then uh, uh, his stalker with the hair coming out of her eyes and her face. Again, Tomie, the hair story, disgusting. This that really got under my skin too at the end when all of these people are tied up to crosses and they're gonna be kicked into the volcano. I thought that was really scary. Oh, <laughs> again, like I love the fact that he keeps it for a page turn so that you don't see this coming when you turn the page and then it just like hits you out of nowhere. Absolutely disgusting. I can't even really explain the ending, to be honest. It does just leave so many things open-ended and there is that whole circular kind of motion to the story too that these things will be repeated and keep happening and there's nothing more horrifying than that, is there? So yeah, I gave this one 6.5. There was so much I enjoyed about it. Not one of my favorites still. I don't think it's one of my favorites, but it was a good time nonetheless. I have five Junji Ito books to go. Let's see what we have next. I'm waiting for a delivery and it says parcel was handed to resident, but I haven't received a delivery. Oh, God. Horror happening every single day. What the hell? 12.54, that was like 10 minutes ago, what? There was no knock at the door. 10 minutes ago, apparently a parcel was delivered to me, handed to the resident. It's a big box too, I know it is. Okay, let's spin the wheel. Let's see what we have next. Ooh, the liminal zone. This one looks very similar to Sensor in the fact of just the production of it with the slipcover and the feel of it. It feels very, it feels very good. I feel like the title of this collection is rather misleading. I was expecting some kind of exploration into liminal spaces and liminal spaces do creep me out, especially with the whole like backroom stuff. And I was expecting like stories that would revolve around that. But unless I miss some kind of deeper meaning in these stories, I just don't think any of them were about liminal spaces and the fear and anxiety from you know, encountering liminal spaces. But I did really enjoy this one, actually. There were a couple of stories in this that I think are up there as some of the best Junji Ito stories I've read so far in this video. And then maybe the latter two, not so much. So it is like such a short volume, there's only four stories in it. And I don't think any of them really explored liminal spaces or like the liminal zone, like what is that? Usually the collection is named after maybe one of the stories or just like the general theme of the, all the stories put together, but this one, I, I just don't understand why it's called The Liminal Zone. At one point, it looked like it would have been one of the highest rated story collections. But then I do think the latter half of the stories didn't quite hold up to the first two, in my opinion. So the first story is called Weeping Woman Way. And this one is just a bizarre kind of story of a couple who are passing through this little town and there is a funeral going on and there is this woman who's crying really loudly. And there is a custom that has gone out of fashion where people would hire 
women to weep at funerals. So from that we had the sort of like weeping woman legend. Although it does turn out that the people who were running the funeral, <laughs> if that's the right word, who were organising the funeral said they didn't hire a weeping woman when the couple go back because the main girl character, she begins to cry just so sporadically until it becomes such a problem that she just can't stop crying and she doesn't really know why. So even though, yeah, she goes home, the tears just do not stop and it's so weird when one day they wake up in the same bed and the bed is just totally drenched in her tears. Like how bizarre, did the weeping woman do something to her? Did it affect her somehow? Like what? So they do end up going back to that town and this town does have some scary visuals in the sky. It seems like there are some like, kind of spirits, but I love the whole weeping woman way village because all of the women in the village are like constantly crying they can't stop crying and it's because they have to help the dead move on essentially it really helps the spirits so like they are just constantly crying and crying and crying so Mako she is the one who's constantly crying when she sees the original weeping woman yeah there's just like tears everywhere it is it's not scary in that sense. It's just so deeply unsettling. And she's told that she might be Orui reincarnated, like a kind of weeping woman who lived 200 years before, who replenished the land essentially with her tears. Like she is the ultimate icon in the weeping woman world. But yeah, we do see her body. And even in death, she is still like kind of crying. And on the sides of her face, which is so, ugh, on the sides of her face is this sort of like canal where all of the tears have been coming out. And it's made this sort of canal coming out from her face, which again, is just, I never would have thought of anything like this. It's just, well, all that crime would have had some kind of effect, right? And it's this moment here with Mako when she just cries so powerfully, it looks like her eyes are just nothing but water coming out of her face. Loved seeing all of the tears coming out from the corpse too. And the way that the corpse just kind of explodes from the tears. You know what, actually, there's probably like more things with eyes and things coming out of the eyes, like whether it's tears or blood from this collection, more so than any other, well, I guess from the first two stories. I feel like the first two stories probably go hand in hand in that sense with, you know, the tears coming from the eyes or whether it's actual tears or blood. I feel like those two really go well together, which is why I'm so confused by the last two and how random they feel compared to the first two. And yeah, I gave it an eight out of 10 because I love the setting. I love the legend. I love a good, almost kind of ghost story in a way. I mean, it's not, like, it's very hard to describe. Like, it's not really a ghost story. It is a bit of an urban legend of these women who weep at people's funerals and they need to help the dead sort of move on. I can only imagine hearing this constantly, all of the crying. It's a very loud story with all of this screaming, the crying, and probably the loudest Junji Ito story I've read so far. So the next story, Madonna, I gave this one quite a high rating actually. I gave it an 8.5 out of 10. And the reason is, is because I am very unsettled by people who kind of abuse religion and like how scary that can be. So this is set in a boarding school where there's a really creepy principal who is extremely, extremely inappropriate. And his wife, he did have a previous wife who was murdered by him and his wife current wife. Uh, but yeah, it's a missionary girls boarding school. And this woman here, the, the wife, she is also called a witch, the angry witch woman. And she thinks she's the Blessed Virgin Mary. She makes him call her Madonna. Like I'm not bashing religion or anything like that, but there are people who really twist and warp it for their own agendas. And that in itself is very scary when people feel justified in what they do, any of the bigotry or violence that they have for other people, when they justify it through religion, that can be extremely scary because they think that they are God. They think that they are a reincarnation of Jesus Christ, for instance, or the Virgin Mary, and it allows them the freedom to do what they want. And there is like another kind of legend about the whole like salt and salt statues and that ties into the Bible, but to be honest, I don't really understand a whole lot of those references because I, I never studied the Bible. I've never read it. Although I'm sure it is like a famous story from the Bible just with the whole salt stuff, but it's just not really something that I, I'm very used to. I loved the religious imagery. I loved the crying blood from the Virgin Mary statue, which actually turns out to have the body of the first wife inside, which 
oh my god. The church setting, the darkness of it, and the terror as well in the youth, in the youth that is there, and how brainwashed they can even be from this. Oh, but the principal is such a creepy little shitbag, and can be said to be like one of the creepiest in Vilas, especially when you associate it to like real world things that happen. Yes, in the Bible, Lot's wife is turned into a pillar of salt for turning her back on God's words. So there is like this whole idea of salt being used. And even Madonna, his current wife, she has the power to turn people into salt. But panels like this, oh, just some of my favorite. And also nuns kind of scare me a little bit too. So when she's in this get up, she kind of looks like a terrifying nun who's about to like kill someone. And then this as well, like how creepy is that? You know, somebody who looks to have been crucified with all of these bodies that have turned into salt. You know what, I really enjoyed the ending of this. Madonna becomes even more unhinged and ugly. She wants to be the Virgin Mary so badly that it's kind of turned her into this monster. And she knows she can't actually be her because she doesn't have all of the patient traits or anything like that. Really satisfying moment there when the principal gets turned into salt. But yeah, having the crucified body on the cross kill her it was great, honestly. It was just a very exciting story. I don't know how I can really explain what I really think of it because it just played into my fear of extreme religion. Not religion, but extreme religion. So then we get into the spirit flow of Okigahara. I think that is the Suide forest. I haven't really looked up a great deal into it, but I really, you know, actually there was a part in this of a YouTuber in the forest and I just felt like that was some kind of, I mean, it might not have been, it might have happened after this was written. I imagine, I don't know, it felt like maybe a sly dig at Logan Paul who went to the forest and was extremely disrespectful and uploaded a video to YouTube with a dead body present in it. And so there was like this whole like random weird YouTuber moment in it, but I did kind of appreciate that if it was a nod to Logan Paul, cause I mean, if it was, but I don't know when this was written. So yeah, there is a couple who go into the forest wanting to take their own lives, but they come across this like cave with a spirit flow that comes out of it. And there's only so many times I can see spirits in general in such a big mass in Jinji Ito's works that I'm kind of dull to it now. It's kind of a bit like the uh, the tunnel one where there were like loads of spirits. There's been loads of other stories with just a massive spirits and scary faces of them. So yeah, the whole massive spirits thing doesn't really do anything for me anymore, but it does like flow out of this cave mouth and the guy in it, he jumps into it but he survives, but it kind of changes him over time. He keeps jumping into it. There is another guy who they meet who starts jumping into it too. And their bodies change into like these kinds of slick, streamlined, as they say, kind of bodies. And it almost becomes homoerotic <laughs> at points of it too. Like when they're tickling each other and they're naked and it's like they've turned into twinks. And the poor girl, she is watching all of this unfold and she doesn't know what to do. <laughs> I'm sorry, but like, this is a rather bizarre. They look a bit alien-esque, just the way their eyes have started to transform and their bodies are just so slender and sleek. But yeah, the girl then does end up jumping into it. So I gave it a four out of 10. I did like the setting of it. I thought we could have really explored a good story there because that forest does fascinate me for a multitude of reasons. And it would have been great to have like really explored that, but I just, the whole spirit flow thing, it reminds me a little bit of Raw, the one of like the illusion of the flood and I guess the spirit tunnel a little bit, just with the whole massive spirit stuff, I don't know. And then finally we have Slumber, and I did think this one was a bit better than the previous one. I mean, I love the premise. I'm not 100% sure I love the execution of it, but we do have this guy, when he wakes up, he seems to have dreamt of murdering someone, and the murder is revealed on the news. So it does seem that during his slumber, he is going out and murdering a person. And he wears like a specific clothing and he gets a knife and stuff. And you know, that kind of thing is horrific. And it does, it even has a sort of reference to it too, of like Jack the Ripper. Like this is nasty, this is nasty. And he doesn't know what's going on because he's like, did I actually kill those people? He remembers, like, it's like in his mind he did because he can see it unfolding in his mind and he remembers them 
but he never sort of realizes that he's leaving the place. It's like a bit of a mindfuck for him and it continues to happen. He does see a random man watching him too. And it turns out that, it, well, it's seen, actually, I don't know by the end of it. It kind of has a twist and then has another twist that I don't really fully understand. But yeah, he is very aware of what's kind of happening to him to the point where it turns out that there is this guy who lives under him, who turns out to be the one who is killing the people. Like, or like, he's connected himself to the guy upstairs, aka our main character who thinks he's murdering people, as a confidant. Because he wants to wake up after he's killed someone and not feel that guilt. Because when you first wake up in the morning, before you realise that you're awake, there is that small moment where you don't know what's going on, and it's like a blissful kind of moment before reality sets in. And this guy kind of wants to reclaim that. So he makes the guy upstairs think of the murders and it makes him believe that he's the one committing them. But then that guy dies and the main character, the killer's life flashes before his eyes. And then at the end, he meets his friend who was attacked. And I actually think like the main character might be possessed by the guy who got killed who was the actual serial killer. It says, I'm totally over it now too, but it was hard that morning. Blindfolded, rope biting into my neck, the spine popping away from the skull, the skin on his neck pulling away. It almost seems like that memory of the guy who got executed for killing those people has like infected him so much that he's turned into him almost. But I got to share the pain of my confidant so it was okay. And like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? Does this mean that you're now going to go killing people or... Yeah, yeah, it is terrifying to have this kind of other person's traits and life be seeped into you that you do end up taking them on. And when it changes you in such a drastic way, that is scary. So I ended up giving that a six out of 10. I don't know, I just, I didn't think it was as good as the very first two stories, which I really did enjoy, I enjoyed so much. So overall, the average of this volume is a 6.63. I feel like having only four stories was a huge advantage for this volume having such a high average, because I think if it had have added more stories, then there could have been potential of stories that got lower ratings to drag it down, like it has done with some of the other books. So it might be a little bit of an unfair rating, but I really, really did enjoy the first two stories. So at least I have those. Let's see what I'm reading next. Hey, Fragments of Horror. Okay. This seems like another pretty short one. So that's great. I'll be able to read this before my live show tonight. Hopefully check back in before then too. And let's see if we have another winner on our hands. Oh, God, I've just opened it to a random page. <laughs> no idea the context, but that kind of creeped me out a little bit. <laughs> you would think the amount of manga I've read now, I should be able to hold it up the right way. One thing I will say about this collection is that I really do love the artwork of the cover. I love the fact that it's reminiscent of the, I think it's called the Scream, the painting. So I'm really obsessed with this cover actually. It's probably one of my favorites. And yeah, inside this collection are some really good stories. Firstly, we have Futon. Futon, Futon. Oh my gosh. This isn't exactly a word I used. Futon is extremely short. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think it's like eight pages, right? This guy, he's called Tomio. And I think he comes back in a, a later story, actually. They have the same name. And I think it might be the same person, but I'm not 100% sure. He's always under there. He won't come out. He's scared of like the spirits and the things that his girlfriend can't actually see. Or wife, actually, I think they eloped. But to see an adult, a grown ass man, hiding under the covers is really trippy for me because when I was a kid, that's what I would do. So to see an adult do that, to try and hide from the terrors that are outside the duvet is so strange and bizarre. And especially since there are things there that his wife, I think his wife, can't exactly see. But then she seemingly wakes up and sees this, which is a great spread and honestly, really great detailed, bizarro spread that I really love. Leading her to run away because it was like a witch who cursed 
Tomio. She comes back like a month later and he's still under the duvet, but she tries to pry the duvet off him. And there's this sort of weird spongy thing that's encasing him. And it looks odd. Like imagine hiding under the duvet for over a month. Like what that would actually do to you and do to your body. Like that is grim. But it was extremely short, so I probably would only just give it like a six out of ten because I did like the whole an adult hiding under the duvet instead of it being a child. Even though it did seem like he was regressing into like childlike qualities of his wife treating him like a child and her being sort of like a mother to him instead of a wife. So I do find that so interesting. It just shows you that sometimes being under the duvet isn't the best protection. Then we get to Wooden Spirit and this one's a really weird one again. Like I feel like this might be one of the weirdest ones because we have this woman and she comes across this house where two people live and it's been in their family for generations. They absolutely love it. And yeah, she comes and knocks. She wants to be like a tenant there, just randomly. She's only just met them. She wants to be a tenant. She think it's like architecturally incredible because she wants to study it. But instead of studying it, I think she starts having sex with it. I think she does. It's odd. Like she does end up marrying the, the guy there. It's like a father and his daughter who live there. She ends up like marrying him. And it seems like all she wants is to be closer to this house. Have you ever seen that weird program where a guy has sex with his car? I don't even know if I'm really allowed to show this, but she is butt ass naked, rubbing herself against this house. I mean, I don't want to kink shame or anything, but ah. <laughs> but then the house kind of changes itself. It becomes this really awful looking, disgusting eye thing. And there are eyes everywhere inside this house and they now have to leave it. And even she, she's still like straddling one of the wooden beams and it looks like she's turned to wood. Like she's become part of the house. Like she is one with the house now. That is so honestly so strange. But I probably would only give it like a five out of 10 because really, really it is just essentially about a woman who wants to have sex with the house. She even calls the house sexy at one point. She calls the house sexy. She's like, wow, what a sexy house you have. I'm just like, <laughs> I don't think mine's that sexy, to be honest. I, I wouldn't have sex with it. The next one, Tomio Red Turtleneck. I think this one is up there with one of my favorite stories. I'm telling you. So this one actually made me viscerally react. And as I was reading this, I was squealing. I was, it's the most I've really moved around reading one of Junji Ito's books. Usually I do just pull a face if it's gross. But this is one of the very few that made me actually move my body to try and get away from the book. So Tomio, he's got the same name as the person in Futon, so it might be the same person. But he goes to his ex-girlfriend's house, like she left him because he cheated on her. He is just holding his head, it looks like he's crying. He's wearing a red turtleneck. I don't think I'm ever gonna wear a turtleneck again, just saying. Yeah, she left him because he left her for a fortune teller. And this fortune teller, she's in love with his head, so she wants his head. She takes off a strand of her hair, wraps it around his neck. He gets away from it, but she puts a turtleneck on him, which has a strand of her hair inside it, it manages to decapitate him after she shows him her head collection. Like this is, oh, one of the worst ways I think to die, like I would never want this to happen to me, is decapitation. Like I just do not, like that just, oh, it grosses me out and I, I just don't ever want that to happen. And this turtleneck has a strand of her hair inside. So you see his turtleneck going from white to red as it's slowly decapitating him and he has to hold onto his head to keep it on because if he does any kind of movement, he'll die. But when it talks about like nerves and arteries and vertebrae, I'm just, oh, like anything to do with inside the body, again, I hate, I despise. It makes me, as I said, I usually do faint if I get blood taken, but I, I can't handle this. Like, why am I even reading this? I can't handle it. It's so gross, but the fact that he is trying to keep his head on, like, and he's still alive, like, it makes you want to go like this, reading this story, it really does. Oh, and it even comes off for a second too, oh god, it's just, it really makes me 
physically want to throw up. Oh, and then when she ends up coming, like, so he asks for help from his ex-girlfriend. So he is in her apartment. The fortune teller comes and she gets a card, right? She gets a card and she just slides it into his neck. Oh, and she's just like putting it in and taking it out and it's like full of blood and oh. and then she gets a cockroach as well and puts it into his neck. Oh, oh yeah, this is definitely one of the grossest Junjiro stories I've ever, ever read. Oh, just absolutely vile. Even after defeating the fortune teller woman, she tries to keep her ex-boyfriend's head on and she manages to do it. His head is attached. The memory of the terror keeps his hands in place even now. Like if something like that happened to me and I survived it, that's all I would think about all day, every day for the rest of my life. Like that is trauma. That's trauma for life. So I'm giving this a nine out of 10 because I genuinely thought like that story itself, I feel like anyone could have a favorite, a different favorite Junji Ito book for different reasons. And I would understand why it's a favorite. I would. Everyone has so many different tastes. What I love about Junji Ito is he taps into so many different fears. Some that you might not even realize you had such a reaction to until you actually read it. I feel like, yes, I, I never want to be decapitated. <laughs> Weird thing to say, but like this, it kind of amplified that fear to the point now where I, I don't even want to go down that rabbit hole, okay? Reading Junji Ito is such an experience. <laughs> Next we have A Gentle Goodbye. This one I think is more sad and tragic than it is like scary or anything. And I did end up giving this a 7.5 because I think the storytelling of it was really nice and beautiful. And it did have, well, like a couple of twists, but essentially in this family, when someone dies, they can make an after image of someone who's died. They're not exactly a ghost, like you can see them, but they do become more and more transparent over time so that you can say goodbye to them for a longer period of time instead of like, well, you know, if someone dies unexpectedly, you don't really have a chance to say goodbye. But this is a way of them being able to say goodbye over like 20 years or something. Like they can live gradually without them and they eventually do disappear after so long. And I think it really tackled grief very well, trying to hold on to the memory of loved ones who have gone. I thought that was like really beautifully done in this. So the main character is a young woman. She's married to the guy whose family managed to manifest these after images thing. Well, her husband's sister, she died 10 years before, but she didn't realize, like she didn't know that. And she is starting to fade. And not just that though, at the end there was a twist where it turned out that the main character herself is an after image and she didn't realize that herself. I'm not gonna go into the potential plot holes of that or anything, but it ended really sweetly with her going to visit her dad. It's sad, it's so melancholy. She spent this entire story worrying about her dad dying when actually by the end of it, she's the one who is dead. She's already dead, she died 10 years ago and she has another 10 years until she disappears. Yeah, 10 years ago, right before we got married, the day before the engagement ceremony. Like, how did she not realize like, everyone was aging but her. There are different random things that Junji Ito doesn't really touch on because I don't think explaining things is something that is supposed to be important in his work. You just have to take the horror of it yourself. Next we have Dissection Chan. And this one is definitely rather messed up. I would love to see a fuller length version of this or at least having more of that kind of dissection angle because I think a short story does it a bit of a disservice. And I know I'm a bit all over the place because sometimes I'm like, oh, that's too long. Oh, that one's too short. You know, like, is there ever a right amount? <laughs> I do seem to prefer the shorter stories over like the longer stories myself personally. Just overall, I think I like the short and snappiness of the horror. But this is one that I think has potential that could have been explored a bit more and had more of the dissection stuff. So yeah, there is this woman, she is, well, she wants to be dissected essentially. She sneaks into this medical school where they are cutting up cadavers and yeah, they're like, oh wait, she seems like quite young. She still seems fresh, you know? And she even smiles when they touch her and they realize that, yeah, she is still alive. And she's like, hurry up and dissect me, please. And she wants to be dissected. And it's so odd. And even the guy, the main character, he knew her as a kid. She wanted to dissect frogs and then develop into trying to dissect dogs and cats. And she just has this real fascination with being dissected or dissecting other things. And it is so disgusting, again, because it's just anything to do with 
invading the body. But I feel like we could have explored more of it because we only really get one really graphic image at the end of her being dissected. It's like years and years later, her body actually comes onto the table. And I mean, is she dead? Is she not dead? You, you don't really know 100%, but you do see this has been inside of her. And that is genuinely, oh my God, like Junji Ito, come on, man. How did you think of this? This was, like, there's a bat in there, there's a frog, a rat. It makes you want to be sick. But she does seemingly smile at the end. So is she actually dead? You know, it's, I mean, she should be dead with all of that inside her. And because of that, I gave it an eight out of 10. I think it's so good. <laughs> but I would have loved to have seen way more way more of that one. It left me wanting more, which is a sign of a really good story. Then we have Blackbird, which, oh God, again, this one's gross too. This one's filled with so many gross stories. And you know, like sometimes I joke on with my friends about baby birding them, you know, like taking food, putting it in your mouth, chewing it, and then putting it in their mouth. Like as a joke, I would never do that. But as a way to like gross out my friends. I would joke about doing that. This is the literal manifestation of that grossness. There are some things I love about it and there's something that is a bit odd. But yeah, there is a guy who he has been in the woods for about a month. He survived somehow a month in this um, forest by himself and he's found by a guy and in the hospital the person who was found asked the guy to stay the night. So the guy, Shiro, he is the one who was found in the woods and he's the one who was hospitalized. Shiro, during the night, is visited by, I thought it was fucking Kylie Jenner. This weird woman with these huge lips and she is just sitting on Shiro and she, well, I thought she was kissing him. But as you go further on, you realize that she's baby birding him. Is that what you call it, baby birding? Just when you like chew someone else's food and give it to them via your mouth, like birds do? But she honestly is weird, even though I thought it was Kylie Jenner. Ugh. And yeah, so she's been feeding him raw meat through her mouth. <laughs> it's just vile. It is just absolutely vile. So that's how he survived. She was giving him this meat and blood as well. Like she, whenever he was thirsty, she would give him blood from her mouth. But she is actually like some kind of blackbird creature thing. So Shiro gets better, he goes away and like leaves his friend in that town. He just wants to get away from the blackbird. And then a few years later, his body's found in the summit of Mount Fuji. It turns out that the DNA from his body goes back to the DNA that was in the raw meat that was being fed to him years before when, you know, the whole horror started. So like he was being fed his own flesh and blood. Ugh. The whole time travel thing, I, I don't understand. I, I don't understand and I don't want to understand because it's just vile. It's just vile. Imagine being fed your own flesh, but not just fed it, baby birded it. Get, how did Judge Edo think of this? <laughs> it's honestly odd. It's gross, it's nasty, I don't like it. Well, I do like it, I gave it a seven out of 10. But I had a lot of fun with it, even though she looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get to Megami Nanukse. I don't actually know how to pronounce this next story. Well, either way, it was my least favorite story by a landslide in this collection. I only gave it a two out of 10. It genuinely did nothing for me whatsoever. So essentially this young woman, she's obsessed with this author. She's obsessed with her. And honestly, sometimes I can relate to that. Yeah, she is obsessed with her. And she ends up sending a fan letter to her and the author replies and says, oh, come over, come to my isolated house. And so she does, but I guess the whole influence when it's your idol and it's somebody you idolize and they invite you to their house. I mean, what do you do in that situation? Of course you're gonna go. But yeah, the author is actually a man and she didn't realize that. And there's something about ticks. Like the author just shouts at her and she's like, I knew you were talentless, you're a tick faker. And she says she fakes having ticks or something. So what she ends up doing, she puts her in a dungeon where there are other people who have ticks and like she's trying so hard not to have a tick. A while later, the author comes down to find her standing so still and she won't move. And then now she looks like this. 
which is a disgusting image, don't get me wrong, that is awful, but I just didn't find the flaw with this story. I think this was supposed to be more of a comedic story than an actual horror story. What is it even about? I probably need to try and understand it better, but I just don't understand what it's supposed to even be. So there's that. Then the final story in this collection is Whispering Woman, and I did like this one so much better than the previous one. Not one of my favourites from this collection, but I still gave it a 6 out of 10. And we have this girl who, she needs every single decision made for her. She can barely think or do anything without someone telling her what to do. She's like, right, left, which way should I go? What should I do here over there? Should I walk? Can I blink? Is it okay to stand? Should I run? Is it okay to breathe? What should I wear today? Should I be awake? What should I do after this? You know, that there are so many questions that she has and she can't make a decision without someone telling her to do it. So we have this young girl here, Mitsu, and she becomes the person who sort of looks after her. She's the one who whispers in her ear what to do to help her make those decisions. I feel like because I've seen this kind of story before-ish, not exactly like this, but me too, she begins to deteriorate herself. And we've seen that before, like say the teacher with Soichi, and I'm sure we have seen it again before that too, where you just see someone just deteriorate. The guy she lives with abuses her and she, you know, she comes to a job every single day, just looking worse and worse. And yeah, she's looking like this now. And she's just continuously whispering in this young girl's ear. But she seems to be doing so much better. And they're really happy about it. But then Mitsu is killed by the guy who she was living with. But the girl who she was helping, she seems to still hear her. Like she's still whispering in her ear as if she's like a ghost almost. And the dad, he finds the girl stabbing the ground. And she's like, like this, or more like this. And it's apparent by the end of it that Mitsu has trained the young girl to kill the guy who killed Mitsu. Which I think was like a really good ending to that, actually. I mean, it's tragic. I mean, I'm glad he got his comeuppance. But it's still, it's tragic, the fact that this girl was influenced by her and she can still hear her as a like sort of whispering woman long after she's died. It's creepy the fact that somebody can control someone like that and the young girl doesn't even question what she's done she doesn't even question it she seems proud almost very good story to end on overall with all of these stories averaged out the collection comes to a 6.31 average out of 10 tomio red turtleneck that one mm. Mm. right now i've got three left i'm hoping for either frankenstein or deserter i kind of want to have a, a bit of a bigger one now because the last few have been the small ones and let's spin the wheel Oh, it's the small one. Okay. <laughs> ah, okay. So yeah, I think this is the fourth short one in a row. Like, why didn't this come up sooner? Mm, I think this was maybe a bit of a missed opportunity. I feel like we started off with a totally different story to what we ended up with. I love the way that it was set up. I love the initial story of it, but then it kind of just went off in a direction that I'm like, <laughs> it's it's not really what I was expecting going into it. Usually that's not really a bad thing, but I think for this, I just, I didn't care for the story we ended up getting, which is so unfortunate because it had so much promise. But we do have these four characters. This one is Maruso, I think she's a nurse. Then, then we have Taburo. Again, so sorry for the pronunciations. Pitan, who is an engineer, and Barachi, who is hiding a birthmark on her face. And the four of them meet up at the very start of the story. I love how they did this. They were like, oh, I'm so glad we all wore black so that we knew uh, that it was us. And I'm just like, do you know how many people wear black? <laughs> <laughs> like, could you imagine, like, that's the only defining trait about these four people who have met up on a forum. It's a forum or, like, a website where people want to take their own lives. So even though they've never met before, they do decide to meet up. And yeah, they're like, oh my god, it's like, good job all wearing black. Like, could you imagine if somebody just strolled by wearing black too? And they were like, oh, they're part of our little thing. So in the first chapter, we do find out about the backstories of these characters, is in, like, what's driving them to want to end their lives. And I will say in praise of this book, I feel like this is the most 
developed, I think, that the characters have felt in any of Junji Ito's works, even including his longer ones. I feel like a lot of those ones are so driven by the plot that you don't really get a sense of character or really... I mean, every now and then I do feel sorry for the characters, of course. But I feel like in this one, because we start off with such character-heavy moments and it's a character-driven storyline at the start of this, that you really do get a look at, like, the three dimensions of these characters. So I really liked that. So they get in the car, they plan to drive off, take their own lives uh, in a remote place through different means, whether it's, you know, petrol or, like, the fumes or something, and, like, sleeping pills. There's, like, a whole multitude of things. So I genuinely thought that we were going to get some kind of, like, Groundhog Day type story of them just continuously trying to end their own lives but failing or at least like maybe succeeding but coming back to have to do it all again and there were some things in the first chapter that I thought maybe that would be the case. There's even like a doppelganger who is introduced which was really interesting. There was like this whole idea of Barachi looking into a mirror and the mirror person telling her to die and there were just so many different avenues that we could have gone down. Now the avenue that we ended up choosing by the end of this was probably like my least favourite outcome of anything that could have potentially happened from the storylines and the beats that were set up in the first chapter. I do feel like what we ended up getting wasn't even set up in the first chapter to be honest. So it did really feel quite random. But yeah, even this guy, uh, Pitan, he has this sort of robot doppelganger kind of thing because the lab he works in has made it and he feels inferior to it. So that's like another reason why he's being driven to um, end his life. And Maruso kind of sees the future a little bit. She has this anxiety that weighs on her and she knows that there's just gonna be disaster after disaster that's coming and she doesn't wanna be around to see it happen. But yeah, they do have a field attempt thing, which it was a really great first chapter because we didn't really know who the real people were and I thought that was really interesting. I would have loved if we explored more of the doppelganger side of, of this, but honestly, it never really is explored again, which is such a shame. Yeah, they try a second time to end their lives, and that's when Pitan, he dies, but he comes back and he throws up, or like vomits, this ball, this energy ball that has like souls inside it and it's like a new mineral. What do they call it again? Paradinite. They think it's come from paradise and a sort of doorway has opened up in his stomach kind of thing and then it becomes like this get rich quick scheme selling these things, these, these new minerals and a doctor comes into it who's trying to exploit them to open the doorways and like each of them have their own kind of doorway like the birthmark on her face that oh my god that's actually a really disgusting visual that starts to spew out oh the balls the minerals so like this is definitely like probably the grossest visual in this whole thing so i really did like that but i really did not want to explore the idea of them getting rich quick kind of storyline selling these minerals I, I i didn't care for any of that i was sitting reading this just like oh this is the route we're going down really there were so many things at the start of this that could have helped lead the story so the initial premise of this is a little misleading i wouldn't say it was just about four people who don't know each other wanting to take their lives together it becomes a get rich quick scheme <laughs> <laughs> essentially that, that's what it boils down to i mean obviously like there's more nuance to that but the story overall i genuinely do think it was just a missed opportunity so it, it is a bit good i don't e this is the thing i don't even have that much to say about it even though it's a, a full story on its own i mean there is another bonus story at the end which I'll, which I'll talk about in a second so i'm probably gonna give this like a four out of ten the couple of gross visuals the couple of page turning moments don't make up for the randomness of the direction this took. Like, this is probably like the most disappointed I've been in a Junji Ito book which is so sad like it's so sad but I mean four is still fine it's just like below average for me. So yeah there is a bonus story at the end called Strange Pavilion. It is only four pages so this is like really hard to read too. It's literally just about people at an amusement park just waiting to enter this comorant. Com Camoran tent, where inside there is this bird-like creature, which is vile and disgusting. And I also love the fact that this is all colour. This little bird creature eats people and then spits them out. And, like, it's on display. It's not even, like, behind bars or anything like that. It's, like, literally with everyone. And it swallows the people, spits them out, and they, like, melt. <laughs> 
a little bit dissolving classroom vibes to the, the melting. But yeah, there's not really anything to say about it for me personally. It might have some kind of commentary to the idea of us keeping creatures trapped in zoos and having these animals on display for humans to gawk at. So maybe it's like a good little commentary on that, but it is just a little, a little bit too short for me to really have an opinion on. So I might just give that like a, a three out of 10. I feel like it would be unfair to rate this volume with both of those stories. Like there have been volumes in the past that I've not included the story that's like two pages long, like the memories of the real poop one. I haven't included that in the average of the volume that was in. So what I might do is I might exclude the bonus story for the overall rating for Black Paradox and just say this got a four out of 10 and is unfortunately like my least favorite bound volume of a Junji Ito story so far, which is so, it's so unfortunate. Like I was hoping we would like get back on track and zoom, but it feels like I've probably read nearly all of Junji Ito's best works already, which I, I hope not. I do still have two more to go. So I'm ready to dive into the final two books. I've got a stack here because this is all I've read so far and I just keep adding to it. And this is just incredible to me. I love that. Like it, it's, I can't believe I've read all of that in the past like two weeks. So I do have two left. I have Deserter and Frankenstein left to read. And I do have another live show later. So I'm hoping to at least finish one of them before then. Maybe both, like that would be amazing. But let's spin the wheel one final time, see what order I'm reading the last two books and which book I will be reading next is. Deserter. Okay, so Deserter is next, and then I will be ending this video with Frankenstein. Very excited. I'm so excited. These are definitely going to be better than Black Paradox. I think Black Paradox was probably the, like, bottom of the barrel for me, and then the only way is up. Fingers crossed. <laughs> This one is a little bit of a chunky boy. There are so many stories in this and I didn't even fully realize exactly how many until I started reading it. And it's definitely varying in quality and even length of the stories too. There are some that seem to drag on forever and some that just happen so quickly. I was like, oh, but I wanted more of that. So all in all, not too bad of a volume, but I think overall too, it might be one of my least favorites too. I didn't want to end this vlog with negativity, I really don't. But there are some positives in this and I'm ready to talk about them. The first story is called Biohouse. I gave it an, a higher rating when I first read it, but when I looked back at all the ratings, I lowered it a little bit. So I gave it a five out of 10, not too bad at all, but it is an odd one. It's about a young woman who goes to this man's house and he has this really weird buffet laid out for her and it's really weird food like crickets and dissected frogs and stuff like that. And she's like, I'm into this kind of thing. And almost like nothing can repulse me. And this man, I, I would love to know what exactly brought her here. Like, how did they meet? What was the initial conversation? Like, oh, I have this buffet of weird food come over sometime and you can have as much as you want. Like what was it that inspired this conversation? I'm just, <laughs> I, I have no idea. Coincidentally as well, I think the main girl in this, she looks a little bit like Tomie when she was younger. A little bit anyway. I mean, I know I'm not gonna try and connect any like characters because they look alike because a lot of the times characters do just look alike. But I do find that very interesting. I wonder if there's some kind of like conspiracy that connects this with Tomie. Who knows? But yeah, this man ends up making her drink blood and it turns out to be his blood and she is repulsed by it. She can't drink it. She likes snake blood apparently, but she cannot drink his blood. It repulses her, even though it's like fresh from his veins. And he is like chasing after, oh my God. Like he stabs himself in the neck and gets all of this blood to squirt out and like it's going everywhere. And his servants, his maids, they are like licking the blood up and they're like in ecstasy over this blood. It's so grim. And the maids are almost vampiric as well. They seem to be obsessed with this blood. So she runs away, she goes into this room with loads of weird creatures and stuff. And she manages to sort of kill him and walk away from it. I, I do like how bizarre it was. It just, it happens out of nowhere. You know, they just have this buffet of really weird food and then it, descends into this. And she's somebody who likes 
gross food anyway. And again, I, I just have so many questions. And the visual of him stabbing himself in the neck and the blood squirting everywhere and him dousing people in it, oh, it makes me want to protect my neck again. Like that red turtle neck story where I'm just like, ugh, please like leave my neck alone. The next story is Face Thief, and I like the idea behind this. I don't know if I fully love the entire story though, so I gave it a 4.5, which still, it's, it's an okay rating. But yeah, there is this girl who is seemingly obsessed with this other girl in her class, and she can, it will essentially look like other people if she spends enough time with them. And it's that whole commentary on changing your personality or your appearance based on somebody else. And I like the exploration of that, especially in a school setting when that is so rampant. A lot of people are influenced by each other, you know, whether it's popularity and they just think they're cool or they just love their appearance. You know, whatever it is, a lot of people do mold themselves to be like other people, which I find fascinating. And this girl, she can literally change her appearance and she can look like the people she spends time with. And you can see her starting to change. And that is a really interesting concept. But I just don't know if I fully love the entire story though. I don't think it was all that interesting other than just the premise itself. But I do love how the entire classroom and even the teacher managed to stop her by putting on these really ugly masks and they surround her and they get her to change. And that is like really freaky. So even though this, I feel like this whole volume itself lacks a little in the gross department, there are definitely times when it comes through and it's very effective. So I really did like the ending of this story, but yeah, 4.5. Then we get to Where the Sandman Lives, and this is a story that I did like, but mainly because of one concept, and I gave it a 6.5 out of 10 for that alone. There is something about this that really does creep me out, and because of that, that's why I'm giving it such a high rating. I feel like there are some things about that's reminiscent to the story where the guy dreams and he sees what the other guy is doing who's killing people and he starts to believe that he is doing that himself but it's kind of like that but like reversed a little bit which you'll understand in a second what i mean so this guy gets this girl to make sure he doesn't fall asleep and when he does oh he explains it himself there is somebody who comes to life like from his dreams essentially and his body then becomes like, you know when you turn a, a, a sweater inside out or something and you pull it through and it's like on the other side? I'm explaining that so badly. But can you say his arm is like caving in and coming out of his mouth? It's like he is literally reversing himself. You know, like when you reverse a dust jacket on a book and it's like the other side. Or yeah, you, you have the sweater and you're putting it inside out and you're pulling it through. That's essentially what's happening to his body. It's so disgusting. And he's trying to like push it through. Like, oh, oh, it's, oh, it's vile. Like he's pushing it through, getting it so that his arm is coming back through there. The dream world me, his true form is the reverse side of my body. He's been dreaming inside of me, but now he knows about the outside. So like it's, it's really scary when something inside of you is trying to get out and something that can potentially really hurt you and other people. I feel like that is balanced so well with the really gross visual of him and his own body being like a, a reversible jacket, a reversible sweater. You'll be completely turned inside out like, ugh. Vile. It was really scary actually when she, like the girl who's trying to help him, gets pulled into him and she never really manages to come back out. She's forever inside. Oh, it... Like, how do you even come up with that kind of thing? She's gone on a trip to my dream world. It ends on such a, a, a sad note really for her when she was just trying to help him. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. The next story is The Devil's Logic, and I really enjoyed this one. I wasn't sure at first because I was like, mm, I don't really know where this is going, because a lot of Junji Ito stories seem to focus heavily on taking your own life. And this is another one where a girl just randomly does that. She jumps off the side of a building for no reason, essentially, that anyone can fathom because she was so happy an hour ago. 
but there is like this tape thing that she had with her and it seems like she's taped what happened before all of this happened and a boy who sees it picks it up and listens to it and on the tape he hears a, a woman like for some reason like this really uh, large woman who's like taller than her and she has no idea who she is approaches this girl and talks about dying but don't you feel like dying i was hoping you would die now stop right there and listen i'm serious and she tells her about the logic of death for like a good 20 minutes or something and this guy is listening to what happened to her before she took her life and he assumes that she is the god of death but through listening to this tape he himself then starts to feel like he wants to die. So he goes to the same place where she jumped and ends with him falling. And it's that idea of this, almost like a cursed tape, a bit like The Ring, where you watch it and you die seven days later. It's almost like that in a way that this person heard the conversation between the girl who died and the person who approached her. And he feels the same way of how she ended up feeling through that. So like, will more people listen to this tape? Will people find it? Will it cause them to, you know, want to die? You know, it's just the implications of that are so vast that I gave this one a 7 out of 10. I just thought it was so good and, again, could work as a, a larger story. This story, The Long Hair in the Attic, is probably my favourite story out of all of them because it is this dread and horror that came up inside me as I was reading this. So essentially there was this girl, she's in a relationship, and the guy tells her, you should grow your hair out. And she's like, okay. So she grows her hair out. And I mean, there has been like this recurring theme with Junji Ito. There have been a few stories now where hair has been involved. And again, anything to do with the human body, anything that everybody has that could potentially kill them is such an interesting thing to explore because it's such a human and almost mundane thing to explore. But yeah, she goes her hair out. One day she wakes up and there's a rat entangled in her hair and it's so odd. And then randomly one day she's found without her head in her bedroom and obviously her family are freaking out like, what the hell's happened? What's happened? And her, her head's gone. And then I think some time has passed after this. I mean, there are some things about the story that isn't really delved into or explored properly. Like the whole connection with the boyfriend, I don't think really made any kind of sense by the end of it. So I felt like that was a little underdeveloped. But anyway, some time has passed and her sister and her father end up going into the attic. I don't know why they didn't do this earlier or why the police didn't, for example, but they go into the attic and they see her head and the hair is wrapped around everything in the attic. And it seems to have a, a life of its own. And the just this whole sequence was just so blood draining. I, I felt the blood drain from me seeing this. And just the way her eyes are, the way that the hair is kind of pulling her head and making it move. And it's almost like it has legs like a spider. Uh, yeah, and it, and it just goes away. It just, it runs away. It's, it does have a life of its own. And the unexplainable way that this came about made me like it the most out of this collection. The head moving on its own with the hair, just, oh, really, really got under my skin and I really enjoyed it. The next story is Scripted Love. And this one was another unique premise. I enjoyed too. I gave this one a 7 out of 10. And it's about this girl and this guy. This guy, he is a heartbreaker. He gets with women and he usually dumps them. He gives them a videotape and he's like, if you ever feel lonely and you need me, watch this videotape. It's like six hours long or whatever. And her, in a fit of rage, like stabs him and she thinks he's dead. And it goes back in time a little bit to a flashback on how they met. He is a script writer, sort of like filmmaker kind of person, I think. And he ends up wanting to break up with her. And that's when she does like stab him. But then she finally watches the tape and it's of him talking to her. And he's even written a script that she has to reply to this videotape with. And she ends up like really becoming attached to this 
video version of the person, the, the boyfriend she's just had that she's just stabbed. So yeah, all she has to do is say her lines from it and it's almost like she is conversing with this version of her boyfriend. And it turns out that he isn't actually dead. Like she didn't actually kill him. And she has a chance now. She has a chance to actually save him or kill him. And she chooses to kill him because she's fallen in love with the video version of him. Like she even says, after all, the Takahashi I love is over there. And he's like, what, but like, that's just a video. You'll get bored of it soon. She's like, I will not with this wonderful script. And then she gets a, I think that's just a, a bottle or something and smashes him over the head with it. And it's implied that she killed him for real. And she has fallen in love with the videotaped version of him, which is just so bizarro. It's so bizarro, but really, really good. And just so different to a lot of other Junji Ito stories, which at the minute, because I've read so many of them, I do really want to reward that creativity and the uniqueness to the concepts. And that was definitely a unique concept, especially since someone's falling in love with a scripted version of the person they should have loved in real life. It's a bit of a mindfuck. <laughs> And then we get into the Reanimator Sword, and this one is probably my least favourite of this collection. I gave it a 3 out of 10. It's essentially about this guy who has this sword that can put like hundreds of years worth of souls into someone and bring them back from the dead. And like someone's grandpa dies, he brings them back from the dead. I really just did not care for this one. I didn't care for it. He brings them to life like this, like still great visuals, like amazing, amazing artwork. But I just wasn't intrigued by it at all. This boy does confront him and it's revealed that he apparently died and he had to be brought back to life, same as his mother and brother, I think, too, like some of his family. And if the boy kills him, then they will also die. Like everyone who he's brought back will die, including him. But he, he kills them anyway. And the main character boy is sort of taking over as the reanimator. And again, like I just, I didn't really care for it all that much. I don't have a lot to say about it. The next story, Father's Love, went on way too long for me. I was flicking through it just like, okay, when is this actually gonna end? Okay, yeah, I feel like it's the longest story in here and it just wouldn't stop. <laughs> it wouldn't stop. Essentially, it is about a father to these children and he is able to go inside their minds and control them almost and he ends up killing two of his children. And the main part of this story is him trying to control his daughter. And I do think it's a good commentary on like the power that fathers have on their children and the expectations they have because as soon as they stray from his vision, that's when he decides to take matters into his own hands. So that is quite scary in itself. Like the whole theme of it is a scary thought, but I, I, I just honestly, again, did not care for this one. There weren't really any great visuals in it. There wasn't anything that really stood out from it. It was just essentially a dad obsessed with his children and wanting to control them. And yeah, I, I just, even just flicking through again right now, just nothing, absolutely nothing stands out from it. But still, I gave it a four out of 10 because I appreciate the expiration of a father who wants control and the implications of what it means to try and stray from your father's vision. I may lower that at the very end or when I do a ranking of all of the stories put together in a different video. But for now, four out of 10, a bit below average for me. The next story is Unendurable Labyrinth. Again, for like the, a good chunk of this, I wasn't really taken by it. I did love the visuals of being in this forest, There's, like shrines. There are these kind of monks that are walking through the forest and these two kids are lost and they come across their sort of temple and their place of worship, the place where they train and, and stuff like that. And they want to go home and things, but these monks don't really like let them. They will be lost if they do try to escape. All of that was like fine in theory, but I just, I wasn't invested. But then we get to them actually trying to leave. That's when it kind of gets a bit better. They find a, a door behind this big statue and they walk into it. And it's almost like an Egyptian tomb. And that can be really terrifying. There are these like mummified monks and they're just like lining the corridors. And then this was when I was like, okay, yeah, I'm really enjoying this now. 
and that feeling of claustrophobia, being unable to escape, brilliantly depicted through the, the corridor. I think that's just so brilliant. And then I just absolutely love the ending as well, when one of them says, I can feel the mummy's gazes. Don't be silly, how can mummies be looking? It's all in your head. And then she says, see, take a look. And then you turn the page, oh, and they are looking. They are staring at them. Oh, God, like, I got a really big chill through my spine. Before this, I probably would have given it a 4 out of 10, but I'm, I'm giving it a 5 out of 10. But that's mainly just for the last few pages. As soon as the end of that corridor, perfect. The next story is Village of the Siren. And again, I think this is another one where, I, I mean, I gave it a six out of 10, so I did like it. I need to stop saying stuff like this, but like, I felt like I could have gotten more out of it, but I just don't think it focused entirely on the right things for the, a good chunk of it. Essentially, there is a guy who moved away from home and he ends up going back to his childhood village and things are different, things are weird. There is like this siren that plays on the nighttime and the people of the village seem to be getting controlled by people, including the main character's mother. And there are reports of child abductions. So there is this really awful moment regarding that, which I will not speak out loud, but you can probably get the gist. And there are like all these sacrifices being made to hopefully like raising the devil. So I did love like being in the village. I loved the weirdness of it, like the siren itself, just emitting this awful sound in controlling people is a fabulous idea, honestly. And the not being able to control yourself when you're doing these things to bring this awful creature back. And it had a good ending too, you know, a lot of hell broke loose during it and it's a lot of chaos, which I love. I love stories where a lot of chaos happens and it got a little bit unpredictable by the end and it leaves a lot to be interpreted at the end too. It's just so interesting and I really enjoyed that. I think overall though, I just didn't love all of the execution of it, but I still really enjoyed my time with it. Then we have Bullied and I'm a little bit torn on this one because I think like the ending itself is perfect and amazing. But the, again, like the main chunk of this story, it does lead to the ending to be fair. Like it does help build it up and stuff. So like I can't fault it for that. But I just think my own interest, it didn't carry all the way through. But essentially we have this young girl, she plays in a playground and this mother comes up to her with her child and she's like, hey, are you by yourself, young lady? Like, can you look after him? Like, can you play with him? Nobody else plays with him. And she does, she hangs out with him, they play together and stuff. But then she really wants him to leave her alone, so she starts to bully him. And she bullies him, like, really badly, to the point where he does end up getting hurt. And she seems to carry that guilt with her in life. So we see her a bit older, and telling um, her boyfriend at the time what happened when she was younger and the guilt she feels. But then she says she does meet up with the, the guy who she bullied. Like he surprises her one day after all these years, they fall in love, they get married, they have a child. And then the guy who was bullied leaves her and the child looks exactly like him when he was a kid. And so the mother, and this is like really sinister, the mother, she decides then to bully her child. And she does actually see this young boy as the boy she bullied when she was a kid. And so she really changes and it's a really scary transformation. Like she goes back to her being the bully when she was a child. So she dresses up how she used to. And like that is genuinely terrifying when it's your own mother. And she's even leading her child to the playground in the middle of the night so that she can terrorize him. Mothers who abuse their children, which is what she's about to do, it's genuinely upsetting. Like I was so upset during this. And even just the, like the theme of bullying itself is something that I take to heart. So it's a very heavy and sad story really with the elements of the creepy with the bully. So I do really appreciate that. I still only give it like a six out of 10 because I, I just don't think it's one of my favorites, but still really decent. And then finally for this volume and what the volume is named after is Deserter. And for the longest time in this one, I was like, I'm a little bit lost, but it is explained that during the war, somebody, this guy here, he deserted the war and he is a deserter and he's hiding out in this family home. And because of him, one of the, the daughters there gets killed. Like it's just the children, like, it's like the oldest um, boy and then his siblings. And one of the siblings gets killed um, by an American plane 
1945 and it's blamed on the deserter like by the family so they decide while this deserter is hiding to pretend that it's still you know also the the time of the war even though the war's already ended they haven't told the deserter that so they're like terrorizing him with it so like he comes down to eat and that's about it he goes back to his room and they have somebody come pretending to be an officer and you know it's shouting oh we spot the deserter where is the deserter and it looks like they're still looking for him after all this time so the deserter thinks the war's still going on there's a lot of excess fat to this story that potentially could have been cut but you know I, i'm not the author this is all john Gito's work so yeah they end up deciding like when the fireworks are happening to pretend it's an air raid so they go into the storeroom where the deserter pretty much lives and they find him hanging but he is dead and he's been dead since 1945 so during like i think it's been like eight years since this for the last like eight years it seems like his ghost has been the one that's been conversing with the family and coming down for the meals so for the entire eight years like he's been dead he's been dead like and they're like wait how what what have we just witnessed like what have we been seeing for the past eight years and that is like such a really great twist ending for me i think it's a really good one even though the ending does carry on a little bit after that that i think just like dragged it out a little bit too much like it could have been more impactful if it just ended after that so i'm giving this one a 5.5 like that story a 5.5 really love the idea of that and the exploration of of the uh war and the effects it had on people too in deserters in general i thought that was really interesting so overall deserter the collection averages out at a 5.63 out of 10 definitely not one of my favorites i think it had some strong ones in here but a lot of mid to weak stories too but don't worry i'm still loving my junji ito okay i'm obsessed with him i cannot wait to read more of his stuff even though it seems like i've just been negative 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 the past couple of stories but not all of them are going to be winners for me but that means we are now on to the final collection frankenstein and i'm holding out hope we will end on a high i'm done i did it i can't believe i actually finished reading all of jinji Ito. this is incredible i mean yes there is still no longer human that i need to read which i won't be reading in this video i mentioned this a few days ago as well on another video and i got a lot of support for that in the comments and i do need to find a time when i will be mentally prepared to read no longer human and don't worry i will and then i will do like a complete junji ito ranking of every single story he's done that's available in english at some point on my channel so do stick around for that but let's talk about frankenstein so let me tell you frankenstein by mary shelley is one of my favorite gothic classics of all time and i think that junji ito did such a great job at adapting it but also making it his own by the end of it too like there were enough differences in this for me to see this as a different work and i loved seeing artistry behind how he depicts these scenes there are so many scenes in the actual frankenstein story that really do stick with me like especially with the creation of frankenstein's monster and just the roaming of graveyards and the finding of bodies by Victor Frankenstein himself and the awakening of Frankenstein's monster. I love the design of him too. Like he looks almost human, but in a really grotesque and grim way. And it really does add to the message and theme behind Frankenstein itself on acting like God and people who think they are powerful enough to act like God. And by bringing a creation to life, that's exactly what Victor Frankenstein does and the consequences of his actions. I haven't read Frankenstein in such a long time that I do wonder if there are a lot of changes that I initially forgot oh maybe i'm conflating it with the 1994 adaptation film adaptation of frankenstein when frankenstein's monster kills elizabeth and then victor frankenstein has to like bring her back to life as the companion to the monster so i don't know if maybe like as soon as justine dies that's when this kind of diverges from the path so as soon as he like he asks for a companion which you know like the theme of loneliness is so apparent in both versions of this story that i again think junji ito did such a good job at and you know what as well having the old style is in having this set in like the 1700s i don't think another junji ito story that i've read so far was set 
that far back in the past. So it's really great to see the style of it and how that really fits in with the time period. I think it's fantastic. I really do need more Junji Ito stories set long, long, long ago, 300, 400 years ago. I really need to say more of that. So yeah, when Frankenstein's monster asks for a companion and Frankenstein and his friend Henry seeks to do that, he brings Justine's head for the head of the female body that he's about to bring to life. And yeah, that really surprised me. I was like, that didn't happen in the original, did it? Like, I don't think it did. I can't, I can't recall if it did. I'm a fake fan if that actually did happen. But I enjoyed the ending too, with Justine coming back to life and being scared of Frankenstein's monster. So I did really enjoy this. I thought it was its own thing by the end of it. And even so, like if Junji Ito wanted to adapt the entire novel faithfully in a huge <laughs> bind up like the no longer human one, I would honestly eat that up. I really would. I wish he would do Anne Radcliffe, the gothic writer from the 1700s. But Frankenstein, I, I can take this. I, I think this is like such a great adaptation of it with its own Junji Ito kind of twist. So I gave this one an eight out of 10. I think it was like a really good story. And honestly, it could have worked as its own novel because I think it's, it's bigger than Black Paradox, I'm sure. Maybe even bigger than Remina. Then the next six stories are all based around a guy called Oshikiri. And Oshikiri, he lives in this pretty big house. His parents are away. And it seems like there is another like dimension in his house. So the first story out of all of these is called Next Spectre. Yeah, he kills his friend because he was, well, he himself, Oshikiri, is short. And he was jealous of his friend being tall and felt he was being teased. So he kills his friend, his best friend, and buries him in the backyard. And then when he kind of digs him up a little bit, his neck has elongated. And we don't know why. Like, why has that happened? But also, why would you kill your friend because of that? There are many different weird things that come from these six stories that I'm not 100% sure how to solidly say what actually happened. Because there are different versions of him that comes up in later stories where there is like the alternate uh, parallel universes that seem to come through at this house. This house does seem pretty important for that to happen. So yeah, the first story of that I gave a seven out of 10 because it did have some really great visuals in the elongated neck, which was very unnerving. Seeing all of the necks just rise up and how wrong that looks, ugh, shivers. The next one, Bog of Living Spirits, I thought was really unique. At first I didn't even realise it was the same character, to be honest, because again, I like, sometimes Junji Ito just has characters that look alike. In Ashikiri, he has a friend, is again, <laughs> he shouldn't really have any friends after he just killed one of them. But then I don't know if that was like a, some kind of person from another universe that kind of just came through and pretended to be the main character for that chapter. I don't know, like this, I, I don't know. But yeah, Ashikiri does have a, a friend who is so popular in school, everybody loves him. And like these girls just like constantly follow him. They will not leave him alone. And as part of a committee, they go to this bog where they have to clean it. And it looks like Oshikiri's friend falls into the water and dies because he doesn't resurface. And everyone's like shocked because, you know, it's just happened before their eyes. It's awful. But it turns out that Oshikiri and his friend planned it so that his friend could try and escape and fake his death so he can get away from these girls. And these girls are intense. They're weird. There's something definitely wrong with them. And it isn't really 100% explained. So I gave that one a six out of 10. And it's left to interpretation whether or not his friend did get away alive. And I don't know which way I'm swinging with that one. Please let me know down below if you know. But yeah, maybe he didn't escape from the bog and he drowned. Like, we just don't know. It's like so left open to interpretation. Then we get to Pen Pal. And uh, this one was a really interesting story. Uh, it's a bit of a mindfuck, these Oshikiri saga chapters. He meets a friend, right? And she has these letters and she says she has these three friends who she writes letters to all the time. But he catches the address on one of the letters is her address. So it seems like she's just sending the letters to herself. But then she is saying like, oh, the letters are saying that they're gonna kill her, they're gonna kill her. So she ends up stabbing herself in front of him. And I just don't know what to think here because does this mean like she has maybe different personalities and she's writing these letters to herself, but like her other personalities that are, are doing this? Is it the 
alternate universe people who she's communicating with who have managed to come into this well you know I just don't know I don't know it's it's so good though the fact that I'm confused but still so thoroughly entertained with it um, but then we end the chapter with Oshikiri finding a letter and it says that he is the murderer he's the one who stabbed the girl but then he realizes that it's his handwriting so is he writing letters to himself now you know what I mean it's like I don't know I don't know that was like so interesting I was like oh Oh, okay, like, that was, like, a little bit of a subtle twist that just it floored me, because I was like, what? So I gave that one a 7.5, just because of the sheer mindfuckedness of it. Then we have Intruder, and this one has a Shakiri. He makes some friends in a library. They end up coming around to his, and they see an alternate version of Oshikiri burying the friends that he's made in the library, like an alternate version of the friends he made in the library. So they're watching it and he's like burying them. And it's so weird. Again, it's a, another weird one. I only give this one five out of 10 though, because I feel like, yeah, just watching an alternate version bury his friends, while that is upsetting, it's not really the scariest. And it didn't really have like what I thought was any good twists or anything. It was just like, all right, that's a fine story compared to the other ones. In saying the bodies of themselves buried and decomposed is again like traumatic. I would hate to ever discover my body decomposed. I'd never want to say that. And obviously I'd never be able to say that, but odd. <laughs> the word of this vlog is odd. And then we get to the strange tale of Oshikiri. And honestly, the whole bloody thing's been the strange tale of Oshikiri, I tell you. This one I gave a 5.5. He keeps getting these sort of images or visions or these random things from an alternate universe that looks like the people he knows from his school. And they sort of just like melt in front of his eyes and die. And it's the same with a, a friend of his who is a girl. Like she becomes this like blob thing. And then he does seem to stumble into the alternate universe, like the the uh, other world, and finds his friend tied up with him, the alternate him, like about to inject her. So there is like a fight between both Oshikiris. And what I love about it is this panel here, after, I think this one's the fake Oshikiri. Again, like I'm not 100% sure on anything. And him looking like that was just so disgusting to me. So yeah, I gave that one 5.5 out of 10. It was okay to me, but it was the visuals that really elevated the story. And then we get to the strange tale of Oshikiri, The Walls. This is the last story in here about Oshikiri. I don't know if maybe Junji Ito wrote more stories about him, but I will say it, his journey is extremely interesting. I gave it 5.5 too. I thought it was just like pretty much on par with the previous story, but there is a body in the wall that he finds and then his parents come home, but then he realizes those aren't actually his parents. So that is really terrifying. Can you imagine being home, you know, your parents are there and, you know, everything's fine. But then you get a phone call and it's from your parents saying that they're going to be on their way home, like, next week or something. And you're just like, wait, hang on. Then who's in the house? That is messed up. And it's so odd as well when the fake parents get taken into the wall, like, sucked into the wall. Like, that is disgusting. Oh, and then ending it on this. This is why I also gave it, like, a 5.5. I love the look of the house because it's like, how many dead bodies are actually hiding in this wall? And you say pretty much that. There are so many dead bodies hiding in the walls. It's so messed up. It's so good though. So finally we do get out of the Oshikiri chapters and we have like really, really short stories now. Like I'm talking just five or six pages. So the first one is The Hell of the Doll Funeral, which Oh, it's so chilling. I gave it a 7 out of 10, despite its shortness, but apparently there are signs of dollification throughout this town, and a lot of people's children become dolls. It's a slow progress, but they do become dolls, and they're trying to, like, salvage their daughter. Then she just ends up looking like this, and they realise that they do actually have to burn their daughter. And it is sad, like imagine watching someone, which it does happen in real life, you know, like people who do have diseases and their loved ones have to watch them deteriorate over time. It's so upsetting and awful. And seeing a child, you know, turning into this, I can't imagine a worse horror for a parent. That was a really good, creepy little story. Like I'm talking very small story. <laughs> and dolls do freak me out anyway, so I think that's a win. 
Then we get face firmly in place and this one really does play into your fear of being at a potentially dentist or going to the doctors and there's a sort of final destination-esque kind of vibe to this one but this woman she does go to the doctors and is left in this chair where her head is like put firmly in place by these things that go in her ear but then the doctor he goes out for a minute and he falls down the stairs and he goes to the hospital but no one realizes that she's there and she doesn't get rescued till the next day but like the fear of being stuck somewhere because she can't move her head she's trapped in this chair with this device on her head and she can't move that is seriously messed up and that's a fear of anyone who goes to like the dentist or the doctors like in case anything like that goes wrong I mean not everyone's fear is that but you know sometimes I've thought of that too so I ended up giving that one a 6.5 out of 10 the woman does survive but she won't let anyone see her ears and I would love to have seen what her ears looked like after that And then the final two stories, I'm not going to count these into the overall average because I believe they are just following Junji Ito's dog, I think from 1998, in just like what a bad dog she is, essentially. <laughs> like she bites him and she's getting washed. The boss sleeps with her minion. She also snores. Like there's just not really anything to the story that I can really talk about. So I gave it a two out of 10. It's a bit like the uh, mystery of the poop one you know it's just a really random odd fun chapter from the author just to get it out there and then the final one hide and seek with boss non non that is also something i gave two out of ten i feel like these should have been put at the very end end like after an author note once you realize that hey this is like not like his other stories so don't really put it in with this collection it's just like a fun little bonus thing but it is put with all the other stories as if it is normal horror stories mixed in with frankenstein and all of that but this one is sad because it does let you know that non non did die on march 5th 1998 at 10:20 p.m which is so sad like the loss of a pet oh it does it hurts me so much i've lost three pets in my lifetime and it just it hurts so i totally get it but again it's just like not really the stories that i wanted to read in a junji ito collection you know but overall i think this was a really strong collection mainly because of my love for frankenstein but also the oshikiri chapters were also very very interesting so overall this gets an average of 6.44 out of 10. A very good rating to end this vlog on considering a few of the previous ones have been not the best. And this is all of them that I've read from the one I read first all the way up to the ones I've read recently. So now I'm going to rank them. I'm going to go through the averages of what I gave the overall books. And then in a separate video, as I mentioned, I will rank all of the stories on their own and not just the collection as a whole. Remember, these are just my opinions, and if you disagree with any of this, that's absolutely fine. Do let me know down below. Keep it respectful. Amazing. So, in its 17th and my least favorite Junji Ito collection itself, not exactly story, but collection, is Black Paradox with an average of 4.00. In at number 16 is Soichi with an average of 4.70. In at number 15 is Venus in the Blind Spot with an average of 5.55. In at number 14 is Deserter with an average of 5.63. In at number 13 is Smashed with an average of 5.85. In at number 12 is Tomie with an average of 6.00. In at number 11 is Tombs with an average of 6.06. .06. In number 10 is Fragments of Horror with an average of 6.31. In number 9 is Dissolving Classroom with an average of 6.36. In number 8 is Frankenstein with an average of 6.44. In number 7 is Sensei with an average of 6.50. In number 6 is Love Sickness with an average of 6.56. In number 5 is The Liminal Zone with an average of 6.63 and I must stress that this average is higher because there's only four stories. In number 4 is Shiver with an average of 7.20. In number Number three is Remina with an average of 7.50. And at number two is Gyo with an average of 8.00. And finally, at number one, and my favorite Junji Ito story that I read in this vlog is Uzumaki with an average of 9.00. So there we have it, that's my best to worst 
Junji Ito collections that I read in this video. Okay, that's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to leave this video a like if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave all your comments down below. Let me know your favorite Junji Ito stories, your least favorite Junji Ito stories. Let me know everything. I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons and my One Piece channel members for supporting my channel. If you'd like to join my Patreon or my One Piece channel membership, then all the links are down in the description box. But yeah, I hope I will see you in the next video. Bye.